my distance from here. Can you hear me okay? Okay, good morning. Um, welcome. Uh, thank you for being here in person and thank you to all of you logging in online. Um, welcome to the 10th annual Santa Barbara Botanic Garden Conservation Symposium. And thank you, thank you to the Nakashima Rennie family for their sponsorship today. Um, so I'm Denise Knapp, I'm the Director of Conservation and Research at the Botanic Garden, and I'll just be giving an introduction today to the garden uh, briefly and to the islands of the California, so just kind of a love letter to the islands. At the Botanic Garden, our mission is to conserve California native plants for the health and well-being of people and the planet. And I wanted to take just a minute to tell you a little bit about what we do in the Conservation and Research Department. We think of the work that we do kind of like the layers of a cake. So the first layer, the foundation, is to understand the nature and evolution of California's plant diversity. Um, this is so important because um, we need to know what the plants are, um, how different they are from one another, where they're found, what's rare, what's common, um, and what communities that they form before we can do really anything to conserve them. When we know what things are rare, especially the things that are rare because of uh, human actions, we work to protect and recover our region's rarest plants. So we do this in a variety of ways. Um, one is just an insurance policy against extinction by um, adding seed to our conservation seed bank. Uh, we do a lot of surveys and monitoring and research to understand what the threats are to these species. And then, of course, we act to recover them, growing them, planting them. And the more recent layer of the cake that we added is to restore central coast habitats and food webs. And this work can be research, trying to understand the threats and the best way to restore these habitats. Uh, we work to understand the plant-animal interaction so we can really restore the whole food webs and not just garden with plants. Um, and then, of course, just getting the plants in the ground. And the icing on the whole cake is really to advocate for biodiversity and uh, native plants. Uh, and that's what we're doing here today. So the garden has been working on the islands for a long time. Um, they've been compared to the Galapagos for their amazing biodiversity and uh, evolutionary stories. Um, and I'm excited to announce this section on our website with Channel Islands resources here. Um, it includes links to all kinds of things like publications on the flora, the vegetation, and the conservation on the islands. Um, some links to reports on the trends and gaps of our species knowledge. And maybe most excitedly, uh, exciting is links to all of the papers in the California Islands Symposia, the first of which was held in 1965 at the Botanic Garden. The next California Islands Symposium is November 6th through 10th, and that will cover all the new research out there. So I hope that, that you'll sign up for that after this day too. So the islands that I'm talking about today are primarily eight islands off the coast of Southern California and another eight off the coast of Baja, California. And as you can see, they range quite a bit in size. So just to tour so through some of these islands, they all have their own unique character and beauty. Santa Barbara Island in this picture is the smallest of the California Channel Islands, and its volcanic cliffs have great nooks and crannies for seabirds. This is Isla Todos Santos near Ensenada, and it's similarly small, volcanic, and rich in seabirds. Now in contrast, Santa Rosa Island is one of the larger islands off the California coast and has predominantly sedimentary geology. And you can see the beautiful sandstone layers here, which create some really cool formations like these in Lobo Canyon. Catalina Island is one of the larger islands with some of the most rugged topography, and it has a varied geology, including plenty of metamorphic rocks, some volcanic, and some sedimentary as well. Now this parent material, these rocks, um, derive different soil types that um, support different kinds of plant life on the island. So this is Santa Cruz Island, the largest of the California Channel Islands. Um, and for example, the schist on the south side of the island supports chaparral and island woodland, while the volcanics on the north side support coastal bluffs, uh, scrub, and lots of different rare species. This is Isla uh, San Benito, and you can see a more desert landscape with species of cactus and agave. 
The California Channel Islands uh, collectively have 110 miles of coastline with many coves, large and small. Some of the more secret caves have been favorites of rum runners and smugglers over the years. This is Isla San Benito again, showing kids from the fishing village there enjoying the calm waters. So wind and fog are frequent features on the islands, especially San Miguel and Santa Rosa Island, which are farther north and more exposed. The winds can be up to 100 miles an hour and heavy fog is common. But this provides really important moisture, especially in the dry summer months. Um, and that supports spectacular arrays of lichens, those fascinating organisms that are a combination of fungi and algae. Millennia of sea level changes have created some really distinct marine terraces, which are especially well developed on San Clemente Island. Painted Cave is found on the northwest coastline of Santa Cruz Island. It is one of the largest and deepest sea caves in the world. Um, named because of its colorful rock types and the algae and lichens, um, Painted Cave is nearly a quarter mile long. Between the different currents that merge in the California, in the Santa Barbara Channel and the Coriolis effect, there's an upwelling of nutrient rich water that comes from the ocean floor, and those nutrients support really abundant sea life including species like giant kelp on the right here off of Anacapa Island, which can grow up to 18 inches per day. Like trees in a forest, these giant algae provide food and shelter for many other organisms. Like these fish. Which support many pinnipeds. This shows how dense the pinnipeds can get on San Nicolas Island, and even more dense is Point Bennett on San Miguel Island, which can get over 30,000 pinnipeds that haul out at certain times of year. While Lupe fur seals look more like sea lions with long flippers and external ear flaps, the Guadalupe fur seal was nearly hunted to extinction in the 1880s. So those abundant marine resources also support many, also support many seabirds, as seen here on Sutil Islet off of Santa Barbara Island. And it can get kind of intense. This is Point Bennett on San Miguel Island. And you can hear the wind in these, in these uh, videos. So the abundant marine life also supported a thriving population of native people. Estuaries like this one supported shellfish like clams and oysters. So in their own words, this is from the, um, the website of the San Inez Band of Chumash Indians, the Chumash people once numbered in the tens of thousands and lived along the coasts of California. Through centuries of hardship and abuse, the tribe has overcome all odds in order to thrive on the land of our Chumash ancestors once more. This one canyon on Catalina Island can supply food, medicine, and fiber. So the fruits of California wild rose can be eaten and the petals used for stomach pain. Indian rush in the middle there provides basketry material and yerba buena provides relief from fever. So the Chumash who lived on the Northern California Channel Islands and the Tongva who lived on the Southern ones had some of the most complex early cultures found worldwide with trade of commodities like soapstone shown on the left and production of art like the sculptures shown on the right. So the Channel Islands are home to the most well-preserved archeological sites on the Pacific coast and Santa Rosa Island is home to the oldest dated human remains in North America at 13,000 years before present. Research in the past decade has shown the importance of bulb producing plants like these blue dicks shown here um, as a source of important year round carbohydrates. Dense fields of blue dicks like this were not seen until the non-native animals were removed. There's a, over 100 plant species not found on the mainland that you can find on the Channel Islands. Um, clockways from the upper left, lots of different kinds of lotus, oak, buckwheat, manzanita, live forever, and loco weed, for just for example. So the island ironwood is an example of a whole genus that's unique to the islands. Um, ironwoods were once found on the mainland, um, but now they're restricted to the cooler, moister slopes on the larger islands. 
These lovely trees also support unique moths, like the two shown here. This is island oak, lovely large uh, arborescent oak that thrives in the fog zone on Santa Rosa Island. These are tall trees with big leaves and deep veins. This tall tree is actually called island scrub oak, but it gets taller than any scrub oak that I know from the mainland. It has much smaller leaves than the island oak, though. This is the tori pine. It's one of the rarest trees in the world, and this subspecies is only found on Santa Rosa Island. This is the Guadalupe Island palm, only found on Guadalupe Island, and it thrives in the abundant fog on that island. These are manzanitas, which are quite diversified on the islands. Shown here are different species found only on Catalina on the left, only on Santa Rosa on the, in the middle, and only on Santa Cruz on the right. The Santa Rosa one has a special moth that's associated with it, too. Now, dandelions are to the California islands as finches are to the Galapagos. So these uh, show that they have evidence of forming different species once they got out to the islands. So these kinds of species are called neoendemics. There's also a bunch of different lotus plants in the genus Acmospawn, all of them really lovely, but I chose this one to show from Santa Cruz Island because it's one of my favorites. It was quite rare until the animals were removed on that island. There are several types of bush mallow as well. The one on the left is found only on Santa Cruz Island, and the one on the right is found only on San Clemente Island. And there are some longhorn bees that only use mallow flowers, so it takes all kinds to pollinate. And then there's these beauties in the genus Malva. The one on the left is from the California Channel Islands and the one on the right from the Baja California Islands. Our botanists have recently determined that there are actually three subspecies of Malva on the California Channel Islands. Then these are the live forevers in the genus Dudleya. It's a group that's gone crazy on the islands with a ton of diversity. And this is Green's live forever. Then this one is San Quintin, live forever, found on Isla San Martin and the adjacent Baja California mainland. And then there's this rare beauty, only found on Cedros Island in the fog zone. Lastly, this even tinier one, Blockman's live forever, that's on Santa Rosa Island. These different Dudleyas uh, support plenty of pollinators, like the bee on the left and the flower fly on the right. Some bees on San Clemente Island have this super cool rufous color or kind of rusty color. And then there's the island foxes, which are the smallest North American canids and occur only on the California Channel Islands with a unique subspecies on each of the six largest islands. The average weight for an adult is only five to six pounds about the size of a house cat. And this is an example of island dwarfism. They are so cute, I needed to show another picture. <laughs> uh, and it doesn't look like it, but the foxes are actually the apex predator on the California Channel Islands. Um, they're an omnivore, so they eat a lot of things, and they're super key in the ecosystem. For example, they keep the deer mice from getting too abundant. The island spotted skunk is also cute, endemic to the two largest California Channel Islands, Santa Cruz and Santa Rosa. And as the only two terrestrial carnivores on the islands, um, these two, the skunks and the foxes, are natural competitors. Um, when the skunks are threatened, they raise their entire lower body in the air by standing on their front paws. <laughs> this is the Santa Catalina Island ground squirrel, or beachy ground squirrel. It's only found on Catalina, and it's the largest native herbivore. Uh, Catalina is the only island with a burrowing rodent, and this is important because with less ground disturbance on the island, archaeological resources are exceptionally well preserved on the islands. And then there's the island scrub jay, the only fully uh, endemic species at the species level in North America. It's darker blue and it's larger than the mainland species, and it's an example of island gigantism. It's also a really cool evolutionary story since recent research has shown that the species um, has evolved divergently within a single population. So um, scientists have shown that jays in the pines have longer, shallower bills than jays in the oaks, which, help, which helps them to access, access and utilize these different food resources. 
Each of the Channel Islands is home to an endemic subspecies of deer mouse that's found nowhere else on Earth. In some cases, island deer mice are the only terrestrial mammal occurring on the island. And we can't forget the bugs, although they're way more poorly known than other animals. The Santa Cruz Island flightless katydid is an example of a species that has lost its mobility, which happens recurrently on these islands. Why would anyone want to leave? <laughs> so perennial water sources uh, are scarce on the islands, but the bigger islands have more fresh water like this stream on Catalina. These water sources in turn support different kinds of plants and animals, like the Catalina Island shrew, which depends on these riparian habitats. It's one of the most distinct and endangered subspecies of ornate shrew in Southern California and Baja California, Mexico. The islands support all of these species because of all the different environments that support them, different rock and soil types, different slopes and aspects, different amount of moisture. The more complex islands, like Santa Rosa shown here, support more different habitat types, like oak woodland, chaparral, coastal sage scrub, and grassland, all found in this picture. On Cedros Island, the fog belt up high supports dense stands of Monterey pine, while drier slopes support drought-tolerant taxa like agaves and cacti. Dry Isla Natividad has a lot of cactus scrub with the super well-defended Coast Choya in the foreground, and the trident-style cactus is the Mexican giant cardon. This is San Clemente Island, which has the most cactus scrub of the California islands, undoubtedly because it's the hottest and the driest. This plant assemblage is thought to have expanded during the most recent xerothermic period after about 11,000 years ago, so hotter and drier time. We're gonna need species like this to adapt to a hotter, drier future. So related to the mallow bees that I showed you earlier, using uh, the bush mallow are these cactus bees Longhorn bees that specialize on plants in the cactus family. You can see that they're the perfect size to get covered in pollen with those long, beautiful brushes of hairs on their legs to carry it. In the foreground of this picture is coastal scrub dominated by the endemic Santa Cruz Island buckwheat, Areogonum arborescens. Members of this community often have drought tolerant characteristics like going somewhat dormant in the summer months when they need to. This coastal scrub occupying sandy habitat on Santa Rosa Island is dominated by silver bush lupin. And this coastal scrub on Anacapa Island is dominated by giant Coreopsis leptocyne gigantea. It's distributed all along the Southern California coast, but in few places can you see it in such abundance as you can on the Channel Islands. Now, kind of succulent-y plants with brittle stems like the giant Coreopsis don't stand a chance against introduced animals. In fact, many endemic plants on the islands, like the felt leaf cyanothus on the left and the uh, bush poppy on the right, have larger leaves than their sister plants on the mainland that have lost their defenses against most herbivores. These are like baby salad mix to introduced animals. So now just a few stories that illustrate both the fascinating human history on the islands, but also the abuses that they have withstood over the years. In 1863, George Knightever paid $1,800 to rent about half of San Miguel Island and its livestock. He came to California with the Walker Party in 1834, which was the first party to cross the Sierra Nevada into California. And he built an adobe house in what is now called Knightever Canyon. And then he set about running the sheep ranching establishment with his two sons. From his uh, logs, he says, from my original stock of 45 sheep, 17 cattle, two hogs, and seven horses I had in 1862, I now had 6,000 sheep, 200 cattle, 100 hogs, and 32 horses. Some sources say at one time he had 15,000. Keep in mind this is a 10,000 uh, acre island, um, and so that's, uh, maybe more than one per acre, and that's not counting the acres that aren't habitable. Not surprisingly, in the drought of 1863 to 1864, he lost 5,000 sheep, 180 cattle, a few hogs, and 30 horses. About 85% of his sheep. 
So Night Ever was carrying about two times the load that the island flora could sustain, and animals tore out the plants to their roots. What was once described as lush vegetation was devoid of trees and shrubs, and then without the plants to hold the soil together, the sand blew across the island, forming the pointy sand spit that you can see in the photo on the left. Night Ever and his sons then sold their interest to the island, and in 1878, he relates that he's heard the island is almost covered in sand. By the 1880s, the Adobe Ranch House was abandoned and buried. So these caliche forests are the remains of the roots and the lower trunks of trees from several hundred years ago. What happens to form these is that the roots decompose and then the molds of the roots fill with sand and then calcium carbonate from the dissolved shells cements these sand uh, filled molds. So this caliche forest of San Miguel Island was created when strong winds blew away the uncemented sand um, surrounding those caliche casts and the root sheaths. And what you're seeing is essentially a landscape turned inside out. The roots now stand as forests. So take a minute to let that sink in, how much of that sand was, was lost and the plants. Another island now, San, Santa Barbara Island. Um, in 1916, Alvin and Annie Hyder moved to Santa Barbara Island with their two children. They took all the household goods that they would need to build an island life, including lumber, to construct a house. They started their existence there in a two-room uh, structure above Landing Cove, constructed the year before by Alvin and two of his brothers. They actually had to anchor it to the ground by cables to prevent it from blowing off the cliff. So you can just barely see that in the photo there. The hiders devised a wooden sled and a track for hauling supplies. So their determination and work ethic were really admirable. Um, the hauling power was supplied by their horse, old Dan, and then the sled tracks were attached to the rock by metal spikes that were set in hand drilled holes in the rock that were filled with cement. They cultivated potatoes and barley hay and they had heartbreaking failures. They also had trouble with water. It kept getting fouled by the seabirds on the island, and they had to bring much of it from the mainland. They raised sheep, goats, pigs, geese, turkey, and chickens on this tiny island, the smallest of the California Channel Islands, um, only about a square mile in size. And on their arrival, they found cats and mice, the only animals to be present in enough numbers to be pests. Those had probably been introduced by fishermen and wrecked ships. And they also introduced Belgian hares uh, loose to forage with the intention of creating a local food source. And you all know how rabbits reproduce. They can be very invasive species. So this is Anacapa Island's fisherman hermit, Frenchy Ledreau. I think I would like him to be my uncle. Um, he's one of the island's many cast of characters. Um, his wife died in the Spanish flu epidemic in 1918, and then he sank into a life of drinking and fishing. He sold fish to the passing boats, and his friends brought him food and supplies. He'd entertain them by discussing literature and singing in his tenor voice, and they all told sea stories. He lived in several huts above what is now called Frenchie's Cove with a colony of semi-wild cats. So bookmark that for a second. This is Anacapa, um, where frequent frog and increasing boat traffic from the gold rush um, resulted in more and more shipwrecks. Um, so in the late 1920s, funds were allocated for what would be the last major light station to be built on the west coast. And the Anacapa Lighthouse was opened in 1932. So at the top of the tower, in the picture in the middle, flashed a Fresnel lens, one of the most advanced lighthouse beacons in the world. So there's over 100 shipwrecks in Channel Islands National Park. One of them, the wreck of the Winfield Scott from 1853, is believed to have been the source of those feral cats, uh, which became Frenchie's friends. In 1939, the US Coast Guard replaced the lighthouse service. The facility was then darkened during World War II and adapted as a coastal lookout station to keep an eye out for enemies. Boats were hooked up to a cable and hoisted out of the water and up the side of the cliff by a boom derrick and then placed on a custom-made cradle on a rock ledge. 
this photo my husband John found from National Geographic in the 1960s, and it says, a blanket of ice plant keeps down the dust, and it does. <laughs> so that leads to a scene like this, where you see very little diversity in the landscape. And that's because biological invasions are one of the biggest threats to biological diversity, second only to habitat loss. Due to the increase of human commerce and travel, invasive plants disperse about a thousand times more rapidly than they would under natural conditions. Introduced without their natural enemies um, that would keep them in check, and then they have these weedy characteristics like high reproduction rates, uh, tolerance to disturbance, fast growth, easy dispersal, they thrive and they push out native species. So we finally get to our awardees who have tackled this threat on the islands of the Californias, opening the door to recovery and securing a future for the island's unique plants and animals. This work takes a village, but there could only be three awardees. Usually there's only one, but we, we stretched it to three this time. And uh, I tried to make a list to, to honor all the people that are, you know, have been involved in this kind of work, but it was really just sort of impossible to do this. Uh, to list everyone who played a role. So I'll present some examples of these roles and some of the people, and I'll ask forgiveness from those who aren't highlighted here. Starting with the botanists, who really raised the early alarm about both the, the beauty and diversity of these islands, but also the threat of these, these non-native animals. So Reed Moran uh, wrote The Flora of Guadalupe Island, Mexico, um, and he says that plants on an oceanic island like Guadalupe have evolved in the absence of herbivores like goats. They've developed no natural defenses against them and they're particularly vulnerable to them. He says in parts of the island most visited by goats, such as near the spring, no shrub within reach could withstand them. Hence shrubs survive only when they're out of reach on cliffs. Robert Thorne worked extensively on Catalina Island and he wrote this paper where he says, man's really horrendous impact on Catalina came about through his deliberate introduction of sheep, goats, pigs, and deer onto the island. Of 45 indigenous plants reported at one time or another from the island but now seemingly absent from Catalina, I estimate that man's feral beasts have destroyed 32 of them. Last botanist I'll call out is Peter Raven. Uh, who wrote A Flora of San Clemente Island, California. And he says, uh, yeah. similarly, that the, the, the large areas have been mostly destroyed by animals and that the flora that they observed had already, by that time, been profoundly altered. So I also want to call out one of the early trailblazers for this work uh, that we're talking about today, and that's Jan Larson from the US Navy. Um, this article from uh, the San Diego Reader talks about how um, this work was begun to really protect the plants and animals of San Clemente Island. And, uh, and he says, um, in, in this article, it says, a major effort was underway to protect the island's fragile environment, and some reporters covered the story as if the Navy were using the animals for target practice. The public outroar, up, uproar astonished the Navy and frustrated Jan Larson. It was like I couldn't go to work every day without every, everybody in the country looking over my shoulder to see what I was doing. Just pointing out the, the difficulty of, of this work. So the trackers, the trappers, the hunters are often those uh, who are also the, the biologists, organizations such as Island Conservation and Institute for Wildlife Studies. Um, they were also often the biologists that were studying and documenting the efforts Trackers by day, statisticians, and report writers by night. People like Miguel Angel, Peter Schuyler, uh, Rob Klinger, and Dave Garcelon. It's a remarkable range of skills when you think about it. There's the officials, the educators, and the communicators. Those biologists have bosses and colleagues who also take the hit when things get controversial. People like Russell Gallipo of the Park Service, Lotus Vermeer of the Nature Conservancy, and Deb Jensen of the Catalina Island Conservancy. And then there are the scientists. So this work is tricky, and no one wants to reinvent the wheel. So learning from other scientists what they worked and what didn't and what they learned helps others to improve. 
There's the scientists writing about the big picture, and, and more than just the technical and logistical aspects, a lot of financial, political communications and legal preparation to be done, and then teaching others through their papers. And then, of course, documenting the recovery, which we'll hear a lot more about today. So finally, congratulations to our 2023 John C. Pritzloff Conservation Awardees, Peter Schuyler, Grupo de Ecología y Conservación de Islas, and Kate Faulkner. So we got together to celebrate last night for a speaker dinner, and we presented them these vases inscribed with uh, the award, um, with some native plants in them. So congratulations again. And that is the end of that presentation. <laughs> um, now I will show you this video that we made for them. This work definitely takes a village, but we chose these three entities this year because each of them was responsible for removing multiple introduced animals on multiple islands, and it paid off. Lots of recovery, lots of species showing up that hadn't been seen in a long time, things that were presumed extinct, new species that we didn't know were on the islands all popping up. Few people would be able to, to make an impact like they did. The first time I went to Guadalupe Island was in 1979, and there were 30,000 goats on the island, and there were vast areas of barren land with no vegetation whatsoever. Hesse's number one accomplishment on Guadalupe Island, in my mind, is getting rid of the, the feral goats on Guadalupe. My name is Israel Popoca. I work in the Comisión Nacional de Áreas Naturales Protegidas. Eh, ahorita estamos en la Reserva de la Biosfera Isla Guadalupe, donde hemos realizado trabajos. De, de conservación de islas y erradicación junto con GESI. En Isla Guadalupe es un ejemplo de erradicación de, de especies invasoras, de especies exóticas, como por ejemplo la cabra, ¿no? donde había miles y miles de cabras que fueron erradicadas hasta el 2007. I started working with them about 20 years ago, just when they were starting to get going as a separate organization. And just in the last two decades, the amount of conservation that they've gotten done in Mexico across the islands, not only on the Baja California islands, but really across Mexico and the Gulf of California and other islands across Mexico is truly remarkable. They've come up with really ingenious ways to deal with feral animals in a really rugged landscape. And now there are fern thickets where it's, um, you know, I'm, I'm six foot eight. And so these things are almost as tall as me and it's ferns and it's just a thicket of ferns and that vegetation recovers. And it's like something nobody's ever seen before because nobody has seen it since this, the animals were there. Y pues un reconocimiento a Jesse por todos estos esfuerzos en las islas de, de México para erradicación de especies y sobre todo en Isla Guadalupe. I have been working with Kate for about 24 years. I met her uh, in 1992 when I came out to the park for uh, an interview and we flew out to all of the park islands in one day on a helicopter, which was quite a trip for me having been a graduate student with no money to do that kind of stuff. We talked about the condition of the islands, what kinds of research would need to be done to help understand what's going on. But also we talked a lot about the management implications of removing animals. And I remember thinking about what an enormous task that was going to be, but she pulled it off. One of Kate's fantastic qualities is, is taking the long view and also persevering with extremely complex projects. All, a lot of these um, efforts to remove ungulates, non-native animals from the islands require endless amount of time and energy um, navigating complex permitting issues. The logistics alone of, of executing these things on islands is something that requires immense effort and, and the ability to adapt. A lot of folks were not fond of some of these efforts and you also have to be able to liaison it and 
educate the public in terms of why this is important. You know, why is removing animals sometimes lethally really required? And, and Kate, um, you know, definitely utilized data and, and information and also um, really was able to um, push and garner support under, you know, many times adverse situations. None of this recovery work that we're doing now, the restoration projects that we're working on now were possible while the animals were here. And so really, she set the stage to move forward in the next few decades with the restoration projects on the islands. It was really her level of commitment that got us to where we are today. And I think it gives me motivation to continue to try and carry on that legacy. Peter has done amazing work on Santa Cruz Island. There are no roads on the north side of Santa Cruz Island. He was able to hike up there every day and not only work on getting rid of the feral animals, but also documenting the rare plants and other important resources that he was seeing as he was hunting. Peter came to uh, the Conservancy as the Director of Ecological Restoration between the goats and the boar they were destroying our native plants. And we were very thankful that Peter came to us at a time when we were trying to figure out how best to combat that and how to bring Catalina back to what it once was. Everybody that kind of goes to Catalina or has been a part of Catalina feels that, that Catalina is them and we, we get that. And so yes, he had the major challenges that probably other people in charge of science on the other islands did not have to deal with. We had the local people who had many of them grown up with the goats and they're cute. Then you had the animal rights activists and uh, other groups that call themselves environmentalists and they are but in a totally different way than what we were trying to do. Peter was strong enough to withstand all of that and to help us stay the course as we went along. Living amongst a community that doesn't want you to do the conservation work that you're doing, that takes courage. And to know that the fruits of that labor might come 20, 30 years after the work you've done, that says something about his dedication and his understanding of how the ecosystems work and the, the partnerships that it takes to, to carry out that work. Peter has a great combination of being down to earth, being passionate about the world, and also having the scientific background and the scientific know-how to justify what he's doing and to explain it to others. All of these individuals and entities just really knows how important this work is and how special these ecosystems are. It's not easy to picture just how hard this work is and how kind of controversial that it is in the moment and just how strong these people need to be to continue on. Now we can clap. <laughs> so congratulations to our awardees. Um, we have five minutes before we're scheduled to give the first talk. So if you want to get some coffee real quick and head back to your seat, we'll get started. We want to keep on schedule for the people logging in.
Okay, here we go. So Kate Faulkner was the Chief of Natural Resources Division for Channel Islands National Park from 1990 to 2016. I've been a fan of Kate since I started working on the islands. She is a strong and pragmatic leader and has accomplished really big things during her time at Channel Islands National Park. She'll speak about the complex rat, deer, and elk eradications that she led on Anacapa and Santa Rosa Island, including the difficulties of making that happen, the importance of collaborations and supporters, and the impressive bird and plant recovery that followed. So welcome, Kate. Thank you so much, Denise. It's so great to see so many people that I worked with during my time at the Channel Islands. Um, as Denise said, it does take a village. And what I really wanted to highlight was with this talk was was some of the some of the issues that came up during the undertaking of complex projects that were sometimes controversial, and sometimes the surprising um, people that helped move our projects forward, so kept us from being stopped in our tracks. So specifically, I work for Channel Islands National Park, and the park are the uh, northern five Channel Islands, shown here. And I want to give a, a nod to some of the work that was done before I got to the park. And that was the establishment of a robust ecological monitoring and research program and um, I'm going to talk more about people and sort of controversies in my talk, but what I want to emphasize is that really the science does come first. So you really do have to understand your ecosystems, the ecological relationships, and what is going to happen if you start trying to interfere with the system. So that deep understanding requires that you have the biology correct. And that was due to a robust group of scientists that worked for the park and for our collaborating um, agencies. And then I also um, feel it was super important, the, the work that was done, the laws that were passed during the 1970s and 1980s, when you think of the, sort of the Earth Movement, which in part was um, sort of uh, a genesis of the, the awful Santa Barbara oil spill. So people realized we were having a big impact on the environment. And we actually lost or nearly lost some species. So for, for instance, the, um, the elephant seal completely extirpated from the islands. And it's only because of the work of the Mexican government, specifically at Isla Guadalupe, that was where the last of the elephant seals persisted in the wild. So due to legislation that was passed. We had the outlawing of DDT, for instance, which had we, the bald eagles were extirpated, peregrine falcons were gone. So that was outlawed in the 1970s, the Marine Mammal Protection Act. We started to see the, the seals and sea lions coming back, um, and then the Endangered Species Act. And that listing of a number of plant and animal species on the islands was really important for giving us that legal framework for, for needing to take conservation actions. And then we don't often sort of laud the National Environmental Policy Act. It forces us to write environmental impact statements, but it is important because it requires the hard look on the part of the government about the projects that we're about to undertake and it also requires public involvement. And that is really important to, that the public has trust in the government and that they understand why and what we're planning to do. So the first of three projects that I'm going to sort of run through um, and use as a description of you know, how people and collaborations were really important um, to the conservation of the Channel Islands. So the Anacapa Island, it is the smallest or the second smallest of the Channel Islands. And that island had rats, specifically um, the ratus ratus, the uh, black or ship rat, um, rat. And we're not exactly sure when they were introduced, but it was either with a shipwreck in the late 1800s or maybe with the construction of the lighthouse. The problem caused by the, the black rats was that they were 
eating the eggs of the ground nesting seabirds. So Anacapa Island is, does not have any um, large predators. There's no island foxes on that island. And it's completely surrounded by very steep cliffs with lots of nooks and crannies. Critically important places for these rare ground nesting seabirds. But the seabirds could not nest successfully because of the presence of the black rats. And the Scripps's murlet, in particular, a rare seabird, and really relies primarily on Anacapa and Santa Barbara Island as the only two places in the United States with large nesting colonies. So the Park Service was trying to control rats, but they, we did not have sort of the knowledge um, of how we could er eliminate black rats. And, and part of it was because of those very steep terrain, a very, very rugged island. And it wasn't until 1994, I happened to fortuitously meet Bernie Tershey, who was the, one of the founders of Island Conservation. And Bernie was very connected internationally. And so this, working with other organizations that have an international conservation focus was really important for moving us forward on the Channel Islands. And Bernie was aware of work successfully done in New Zealand to eliminate rats from an island called Breaksea. And Breaksea, you can kind of tell from this picture, it's also a rugged island like Anacapa. And so because of our collaboration with island conservation, we were able to um, bring in the people like Greg Howald, who is who has continued his career as a rat eradication expert on islands around the world. And we also were able to attract funding um, that resulted from an oil spill, the American Trader um, oil spill. But it was this collaboration of expertise that allowed us to put together a complex plan. It took about four years of research to really understand the island ecosystem, even the surrounding marine water ecosystem how the rats were negatively affecting that, that ecosystem and how could we approach eliminating the rats. So we prepared an environmental impact statement. It was very detailed, very well thought out. Nonetheless, um, everyone did not support what we were planning to do. And the, um, as usual, sometimes it can be very hard to, to sort of fight these battle, battles in the press or to have maybe the details or subtleties of the needs for the biological conservation. So we weren't, we, uh, in the press, you know, there was a lot of um, back and forth on whether or not we should eradicate rats from Anacapa Island. And it was controversial, but we felt that we had a very solid plan. Nonetheless, we were sued. And um, so, the, and this was my first time going, you know, having a court case. And, being in court was not where I wanted to be because you have one individual who can tank a project that you've already put you know, millions of dollars into and has got a lot of collaborators that are, who are ready to move forward. But the judge ruled in our favor. And so what I learned is um, in, in the court and with judges, you're dealing with facts and, and that can actually work in your favor if you have done your homework. So, and fortuitously, what the, what the judge said was that we had a very well-written EIS. She said she wished all the EISs were this well-written. So, the, and the important thing about this is because we knew we were the first rat eradication that was going to happen on an island in the United States. So we had to get it correct because if we failed, that meant it would make it that much harder for other islands to follow suit. So it, we had the, the go ahead to move forward. We were allowed to move forward. The rats were eradicated. And um, as a result, we have seen the return of the Scripps' Merlet nesting on Anacapa Island. We were getting about 15% per year increase in Merlet numbers um, successfully nesting. And we've also seen the return of two other rare seabirds, the Ashley Storm Petrel and Cassin's Auklet. To, to nest on Anacapa Island. Yeah. <laughs> okay, 
So now I'm going to move to Santa Cruz Island, much, much bigger island than Anacapa. It's actually the largest of all the, all the islands off of the coast of California. And uh, Santa Cruz Island is, three quarters of it is owned by the, Na the Nature Conservancy and the um, eastern one quarter of the island is owned by the National Park Service. And this was a really excellent collaboration between two organizations that really have very similar conservation goals. And I would say that each organization has its own strengths. And so I'm not, I don't think the Park Service could have done it on its own. Perhaps the Nature Conservancy could have, but it was really, um, I think, a great partnership that allowed, allowed us to take on a really large project. Specifically, we had feral pigs island-wide. And our goal was to manage the island as one ecosystem, irregardless of the boundary um, dividing the two landowners. So as I, feral pigs were island-wide. Everyone knows feral pigs can, they can breed, their populations go way up, and then you have a big crash after they've eaten themselves out of house and home. And they don't just affect uh, flora and fauna, but they also affect and impact the, the um, archaeological resources, of which, which are very, very important on um, Santa Cruz Island. But the pigs were causing even more problems than we originally um, realized. So it's kind of a complex story. I'm sure most of you have heard about this. But we knew that the pigs were directly impacting the soils, you know, water quality, um, vegetation. But the pigs were also sort of the central reason for the decline in island, island foxes that occurred on Santa Cruz Island, Santa Rosa Island, and on San Miguel. It was all because of those pigs on Santa Cruz Island. So it was sort of a complex story. What, what happened was um, bald eagles um, used to be on um, Santa Cruz Island. We would have you know, probably 10 or 12 nests at, in territories on that island. Um, they had been extirpated due to the DDT. Um, golden eagles were able to move on to that island in part because they didn't have the competition with the bald eagles, but also because the mainstay of their diet was the feral pig, the piglets. And so, but while they were feeding on piglets, they were also um, hit, pre preying on the island foxes. And the island fox numbers plummeted on, on those three northern islands. So it was a fairly complex story, um, but it all came down to knowing that we needed to eliminate the feral pigs if we were to restore island foxes as well as the rare plants on the island. But once again, everyone did not agree that we needed to eliminate the feral pigs. And so what you would often hear was, you know, the, it's not the pigs' fault that they're out there and the pigs have their right to exist. But that wasn't really the issue, but, but, but still, you know, we, there were just a, a lot of different points of view. And um, we actually had a, a public meeting, which is required by the environmental impact um, by NEPA um, at, at Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. And it was a fairly raucous affair. And um, <laughs> so, but what happened, so we had a lot of people at the meeting, uh, Fleischmann Auditorium, which many of you know was, was packed, and um, it wasn't going well. And, um, but what happened was one woman stood up. Some of you might know Dr. Karen Blumenschein. She is a veterinarian in Santa Barbara County. And uh, Dr. Blumenschein stood up and she said, Many of you know that I have not always agreed with what the Nature Conservancy and the Park Service do. <laughs> However, in this case, they are correct. And then she went on, and she had so much more credibility with that audience than what we as sort of government officials did. And by Karen standing up, she changed the tenor of the entire meeting. And now other individuals who had been quiet in the, in the audience stood up. And many of these people had been volunteers and knew the islands intensely. They were with um, what we call the Naturalist Corps. And so they worked, um, it was like organized by the National Marine Sanctuary. 
and the National <coughs> Park. So these people ha also had credibility because they were, they were just normal people. They didn't have an agenda. They just knew, understood the islands, and they had seen the damage caused by the pigs. So um, we were sued once again on this project. And um, you know, like I said, these are, these are complex stories, and so it is hard to battle these in, in the court. Um, and the court case was assigned on a Friday to a judge to Vrizian in, uh, in Los Angeles. And uh, fortuitously, <laughs> Judge Trevisan, on that Friday, when he got home, he happened to turn on the local, the KCET, the, the public station down in, in uh, Los Angeles, and he learned the story of Santa Cruz Island, of the feral pigs being fed on by the Golden Eagles, but that the Golden Eagles were then driving the, the island foxes to near extinction. So he learned this from a TV show, but, but as a result of that, he felt like he understood the need to eliminate the feral pigs from Santa Cruz Island, and as a result, he denied the plaintiff's request for a temporary restraining order. So, you know, you don't always realize when you're trying to work with the media how important it is you know, to, to get your story out there. It really, people need to understand, when they understand what you're trying to do, you know, assuming that you've, you've got all your ducks in a row, um, you're actually gonna get a surprising amount of support. So I mentioned, one of the, one of the plaintiffs in that case is a local businessman here in uh, Santa Barbara, Richard Feldman. And, um, you know, he'd opposed the project. But part of why he opposed the project was he really didn't think that it would be possible to eliminate pigs from an island so big and so rugged. But, but we were successful. We eliminated the pigs. And about uh, two years after the project, he actually called our superintendent, um, Russell Gallipo, and he said, you guys did what you said you were gonna do. You did the right thing. I was wrong, you were right. So I think, yeah, and he's, he is a person who is very involved in the community here. I mean, I think he's a great guy. And uh, so I, I respect him both for, you know, calling us out when he didn't think that we could do the job, but then, you know, telling us, you know, thank you for doing the job that you set out to do. And I think at that point, too, people were, were really starting to see the recovery on the islands. Okay, so the last um, island project that I'll talk about is um, Santa Rosa Island. And Santa Rosa Island was in initially a sheep ranch in the uh, late 1800s, and then in the 1900s it became a cattle ranch. And um, the, the cattle and the sheep had really converted the island vegetation from what would have been more of a chaparral, coastal sage scrub, and woodlands like Torrey Pine and Oak Woodlands to mostly non-native grasslands. So the, the island was, the island vegetation was great, greatly, greatly altered. And besides the, uh, the cattle, we also had deer and elk that had been introduced to that island. So they were both non-native species and there was a commercial sort of trophy hunting operation on Santa Rosa Island. And, um, so the task for the Park Service was when we purchased the island was that the, the cattle, deer, and elk were all supposed to be phased out within a few years. But that didn't happen, and there was opposition from the former landowners who they did not want to remove the cattle, deer, deer or elk. And uh, so once again, um, we were sued, but, but once again, we did prevail in the, the request for the restraining order to stop the removal of the cattle was denied by the courts. So um, I certainly learned that being in court while you, it is scary and, and you do have sort of the fate of your projects is in the hands of one individual, um, you can prevail. So, that's, so we were allowed to move forward with the removal of the cattle but the deer and elk persisted on Santa Rosa for a longer period of time. 
and so the islands are known for endemic species. <laughs> so of course, most of you know about the island scrub jay and the Channel Islands fox, but you might not have heard of the Channel Islands weasel. And uh, so the, the, this is from the Ventura Star. And um, the, so what happened was Santa Rosa became very political. And um, political, that's, a, that's tough, especially when your agency is funded you know, by Congress. You know? So when you start to run afoul of, of politicians, you start to see you know, some of the higher up administrators start to pull back and say, mm, maybe, we shouldn't, maybe we shouldn't move so fast on this. But um, so what, what actually happened was this representative from San Diego, um, Duncan Hunter, actually got slipped legislation in at the last minute um, of a defense spending bill to actually essentially remove the island, Santa Rosa Island, from the control of the National Park Service and to require that deer and elk stay out there and that they would be al allowed to be used as like a hunting grounds for, for the military. Fortunately, the uh, Congress changed hands or leadership almost immediately after this legislation and within two months, um, the new Congress reversed that and the, the islands came back to the National Park Service and we were able to move forward with uh, elimination of the deer and elk. Um, so, so this is the legislation. So it, um, it allowed the National Park Service to continue to administer Santa Rosa Island. So as a result, we were able to move, remove the cattle, we were able to remove the deer and the elk, and this, which was sort of a typical uh, view on Santa Rosa Island, this is a water course. Here's the same area just four years after we removed the cattle, and you can just see how the riparian vegetation has moved back in all on its own, natural recovery, just from removing the non-native animals. The same with Arlington Canyon. Um, you can see on the slopes above how it's, it's just non-native grasses. All that green is non-native grass, um, and you can even see the slumping of the soil, the soil, soil erosion. And that riparian area has no vegetation at all. So by removing the non-native animals, what we see is you can, up on the uplands, you can see the coastal sage scrub coming in. And then all, you can see the tremendous amount of vegetation that has come in on the riparian zone, all on its own. However, these islands were altered quite a bit. And in many places, um, actual a active restoration is required to bring back our native flora. And we'll be hearing a lot more about that today. You know, I want to point out Catherine McEachern, the, the Botanic Garden, Cal State, Channel Islands, you know, USGS. So there's a lot of partners that are, um, have identified the areas that need that, that new, in, that, that actual input of, of work in order to recover vegetation. This is, this is on the upper slopes of um, Santa Rosa Island in an area that should be an island oak forest. So the, the, the islands have just a myriad of unique plants, animals, wilderness resources, recreational opportunities. I mean, they really are gems here in Southern California. Um, many of the the parts that we have out on the islands, it is due to the work of people that were, you know, decades in advance of us trying to conserve the islands and their activities. And during my time at the park, um, I and many, many people in this room were part of sort of the, the efforts to um, ensure that we, as you said, open the door to allow for the continuing work of restoration on the Channel Islands. So there's still Plenty to do, but I think we've got a pretty good start. So, thank you. <laughs> do we have time for questions? Let's see. We have until 11 10, so not quite. Nope. Um, let's okay. take one. Okay. Yeah. 
one hot burning question <laughs> for, for Kate. Uh, I should hold this. Yeah. Kate, uh, thank you for your uh, incredible devotion and continuation of this project in spite of everything. But um, it, the science is hard enough. Can you go into a little bit more about uh, did you have a team of folks that were just battling the PR? How are you, uh, you know, was that just something you stumbled into or was it a conscious design effect? Uh, it seems like that's what this roommate knows the least about. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, so just to repeat the question for those online, um, Steve's wondering if there was a team of folks handling the PR for this project. Well, so at the park, we just had one person, Yvonne Menard, who was our chief of interpretation, so she had a lot of duties. She, she did the media outreach for the park. Um, so this was an example, I think, of, of how our collaboration, specifically with the Nature Conservancy, really upped our game in terms of outreach with media. They, they have um, a, contacts with many professionals who are very, very good at, at outreach and actually even trained us somewhat in you know, how, how we can best present these projects you know, to the public and engage the public. So uh, I th each project was a little bit different in terms of who we were partnering with and you know, what types of expertise we had. But I would say for me, it was a major learning experience through my 25 years at the park, um, how to engage you know, with the general public. Um, I, have a, I have a lot of stories, but I won't go into my stories. <laughs> But uh, of things that I did really wrong in the beginning, and I definitely learned as I went along. <laughs> okay, thank you. So I hope that folks are collecting questions for later. We'll have the panel discussion. So we gave a few three by five cards out, and folks are entering them in the online chat, and we will get to them. Later. So it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker. Uh, speaker, <laughs> speeder. <laughs> Peter Schuyler was the Nature Conservancy Santa Cruz Island Preserve Director from 1980 to 1989, where he led sheep eradication and cattle removal, and the Catalina Island Conservancy's Director of Ecological Restoration from 1997 to 2004, where he achieved goat and pig eradication on the most populous Channel Island. Peter is a guy who can do just about anything. He can build a steel fence on a 45 degree slope, he can sail across the globe, he can write management plans, court donors, or recite whole Monty Python skits. I'm not doing that today. <laughs> That's later. He'll tell us about the complexities of his conservation efforts and the subsequent recovery. Welcome, Peter. Thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's an honor to be receiving the Pritzloff Award. Thank you, Botanic Garden. It's also an honor to be receiving it with Luciana and Federico and Kate, so that's, that's also very welcome. Thank you. What I'd like to do today is talk about a few more programs, echoing many of the themes that Kate said, but talking about the removal of animals from Catalina Island and Santa Cruz Island, and some of the lessons we learned. This title was done a little bit before the talk was done, so I'm also gonna add in some of the lessons learned, how we actually did it, as well as some of the opportunities that came up. So back in 1949, Otto Leopold said to keep every cog and wheel as the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. That's morphed a little bit into the first rule of intelligent tinkering is to keep all the pieces. And I think, you know, when you look at a, nat a, nat a natural area with land management as um, needs, you want to save all the native species. I think we can also make a corollary, though, that when you're removing a species from a native ecosystem, you want to do it intelligently also. So the first rule of intelligent subtraction is to reduce the unintended consequences through thoughtful and deliberate actions. And then you also want to open up those opportunities for continued ecosystem restoration. You try to think ahead and think, okay, what can I do after this, and what's first and what's second? I'm going to talk about the removal of feral sheep from Santa Cruz Island. And this is only from 90% of the island because at that time the Park Service did not have ownership of the eastern 10%, so we just worked on the, the western 90%. Removal of cattle 
from Santa Cruz Island, again from the 90%, and this was a mostly domestic herd, although there was a, a small contingent of feral animals in one of the canyons. And then also removal of feral goats and feral pigs from Santa Catalina Island. As others, Denise and Kate and everybody has said, it's important to remember that we stand on the shoulders of the earlier leaders and the land managers. We're not in this alone. We've learned a lot from them, and we owe it to them and the future conservationists and the general public to explain why we're doing all of this work, that we pass the lessons on that we learned. We're all in this together. It's a small group of people when you look at it sort of in the big scheme of things that actually do, does this kind of work. The resources are not widely available sometimes. And it's also tough work. It's not easy work. And, and so we keeping the data and the results under wraps doesn't serve anybody. So it's, it's really important that we get the word out there. I think we've done a fairly good job, both in terms of the lessons that we learned, how we did things, then also some of the results of the programs that occurred, you know, both in terms of the results on individual rare species or vegetation communities on animal species. But it is, as I said, really important to get that word out there. The results also need to be viewed through the lens of time. You know, as much as I hate to admit it, people and things and experiences do change. <laughs> so. And the knowledge and the experience that was available in the past can be very different than what we know now. And so we have to learn from the past, both the success, successes and the failures. And it's also, I think, interesting to look at the technology and the restoration practices that were often very rudimentary back in, quote, the old days and compare them to today's resources. And so even as we learn from the past, we have to be open to new opportunities. So it's kind of, you know, how do you find that balance of, okay, take the lessons from the past, but don't think they're necessarily set in concrete, but adapt them and, and move forward. So removal from, of, share, of feral sheep from Santa Cruz, when the Conservancy assumes the management opportunities or management responsibilities back in the late 1970s, one of their first questions was, you know, what cha challenge should they really focus on? And it quickly became pretty clear, particularly with the help for a lot of people in this, office, you know, in this audience and on Zoom today, that the feral sheep was what was really needed to be addressed first if there was going to be a road to recovery for Santa Cruz. The problems of the feral pigs or the, the problems that some of the invasive non-native plants posed sort of pale in contrast to the effects of the sheep. And it wasn't just a few sheep. We were talking about tens of thousands of sheep. They ranged from sea level, you could find them down on the beach eating what looked like the kelp, <laughs> to the top of the mountain. So they were everywhere on the island. Harold Heady, who was a re well-respected rangeland professor, said that the island had some of the worst overgrazing in Western North America. If you look at these pictures, I don't think you can say that that's not true. <laughs> There's not much growing there that was in, within reach of a sheep's mouth. And then a report from the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden summed it up fairly succinctly and just said, you know, the sheep have to be eliminated now to ensure the survival of rare plants and habitats. The, the island was at a turning point. You know, if, if you left it for too long, you could not do anything into the future. So that was the first challenge the Conservancy faced. So the removal of the sheep would open up new opportunities to, for future restoration projects, and it would also allow the monitoring of, you know, the species and processes that were kind of hidden from view when the sheep were there. And they, you know, the overwhelming impact of the sheep almost you know, obscured what else was going on. So once the sheep were removed, you could actually figure out what were the next restoration projects. And it was also premature to consider some of those projects while the sheep were still there. So the size and the scale of this project of removing sheep from Santa Cruz was one of the largest to date. It's obviously a rugged island. It goes from zero to 24, over 2,400 feet, 85 square miles, none of it flat, or virtually none of it flat. So the first thing to do, of course, is to make a plan. So you haul out your tr trusty typewriter and crank out a, a two-page outline of how do you get rid of sheep on Santa Cruz Island. So that's what this is. It was a whole two-page outline of all the things that needed to be done before you could take the program into effect. First thing, of course, was documentation. So we looked at the sheep, the status of the sheep. Dirk Van Vuren from UC Davis did a really thorough report of where they were, what they ate, densities, and some management alternatives. We also looked at the impacts of the sheep on rare species, on vegetation communities, on also on the vertebrates of the island. Linda Lauren, who's the reserve manager for UC, um, UCSB out there, did a study for us. We also looked at some of the other processes. You know, what effect were the sheep having on the soils, on erosion, because that, well, that was a considerable um, impact. It turns out this was really fortuitous. I don't think we had quite as many lawsuits as Kate had, but um, 
1984, a lawsuit requesting a restraining order to halt the removal, removal program was filed. What's a little bit interesting is this wasn't objecting to the fact that we were removing the animals. It was filed because we were ruining the finest recreational sport hunting in North America. <laughs> so it was filed by a wildlife federation. Um, it turns out that the studies that we had done were instrumental in having the case dismissed before it went even to court because the judge looked at it and said, you know, if halting the program would cause extensive and irreversible damage, and so the court never, I mean, the case never even made it to court. So it really pays to be prepared to do your homework first. And also, these studies also gave us a chance to sort of give us a glimpse into the future, you know, and highlight areas of potential concern and opportunities that might follow the removal of feral sheep. You know, we expected that maybe the pig population would increase in size, that fire might become an issue on the island when the vegetation came back, and also problems with invasive plants might spread once these were gone. So it just gave us a little glimpse and the opportunity to start thinking about some of these things, and you'll hear about where those projects have gone from other folks later today. It was a different era in terms of technology and resources, and I think it's just kind of interesting to see where we've come over the years. The accommodations we have, you know, were simple yet functional. There was no GPS. We used hand maps and a compass in the field. <laughs> there were no desktop computers. Nature Conservancy office didn't even have a computer in it when we started working there. No field things, no field, um, you know, laptops or anything you could take into the field. So all the information, you know, location information had to be entered by hand at big, large-scale maps at night. Handwritten notes, typewriters in the office. Even the handheld radios in the beginning of this program were, were kind of uh, obsolete. We used CB radios that were big and bulky and they worked. And you, as long as you had line of sight, you couldn't really um, talk to the mainland with them, but with, due to a quirk of the atmospheric radio waves, it was really interesting. We could often hear truckers in Georgia and Alabama talking about the speed traps that the police had set up down the road. <laughs> well, we couldn't talk to somebody across the canyon. <laughs> so. By the end, we did get a good system of radios and then you know, adapted and moved on with that. We did have infrequent, irregular mainland communication. So basically, when we were on the island, we were on our own. It was direct line of sight by radios and you, you know, somebody had to be on the other end to receive the radio, mission, um, radio transmission and you had to either be on the coast or up in the top of the mountains. There was no internet, widespread internet at the time. So that was both a blessing and a curse. Um, you can't get information as readily as you can today, but at the same time, you don't become a social media story. And I think a good example of that was, you know, we've been doing the program for four years, and then in August of 1984, we hit the big national news. So we had helicopters flying all over the island, trying to take pictures and everything else. It was not on the internet, because there was none. And then a week later, the 1984 Olympics opened in Los Angeles, and we became an old story. So really lucky on that one. But, in you know, looking at programs since that time in Hawaii, other places around here, once you hit the social media, that story stays out there forever, so. So the lesson that we've sort of learned from the technology and resources is use what you have. You know, and don't wait for every last piece to fall into place, because if you wait for everything to say, well, we need this or we need that, you're never gonna get started. So just go ahead and start, be deliberate, be thoughtful, know what your shortcomings are, but, but go ahead and move. And then when opportunities come, you know, adapt and take advantage of them. One of the things we really wanted to do was document the results that happened after we removed the sheep. And so we wanted to make it both, you know, the specific studies where you look at a rare plant and say, okay, this population has come back and this one is, you know, doing really well in terms of communities. But we also wanted to have a, a much sort of broader look at it. So we set up a series of photo points which are the red dots on this map of the island where we actually took photos before we even removed a single animal. And then it followed them through the years. For a while it was every quarter and then it was every couple years. Now we do it every five years. We actually have a date set up, thanks to John, uh, to go out um, later this spring and, and redo all the photo points there. But what we also wanted to do was make it easy for that program to continue throughout changes in staff, throughout changes in technology. So each photo point had a, a, its own separate sheet where we would say what, where it was, how to refine it, what we were shooting, what the purpose was, how many pictures were taken, and things like that. And, you know, technology has changed. We started out with slides, and we went to digital. You know, and pretty soon, hopefully, you just point an iPhone or an iPad at it, and it'll figure out all the, everything for you right there. 
This program has been going since 1981 through the present, so it's a nice long history. And what it does show you is some of the results. You know, from the period of 1978, which is when the study started, to 1989, over 36,000 sheep were removed. And if you look at some of these pictures, you can go from the, the ones on the top, uh, right, no, left. <laughs> um, it was bare rock, no soil, and it's a thriving pine forest came back. You know, far exceeded anything we could possibly have imagined. The bottom left is uh, coastal sage. If you look at that little fence post in the corner and then sort of in the middle, that's the same fence post, but you know, it's almost lost in the re recovery of the Artemisia. Same with grasslands. What I really like about this uh, series on the right is if you look at that top hill where there's extensive erosion, virtually no, no uh, trees or vegetation, it became a 30 to 40 foot tall pine forest. Well, what's happened since then is because we've been continuing the documentation is that due to the stress of drought and rust and a few other pressures on the thing, that forest has started to decline. So we've actually been able to capture the decline, the recovery, and now a subsequent decline. And when you show somebody a picture like this, it's pretty easy to, to just let the pictures do the talking. Lessons learned in addition to, to Kate's people, persistence in, in um, partnerships is preparation, adaptability, and, and particularly passion. You have to have a passion for getting this work done. The opportunities that this program provided were to document the recovery of an ecosystem following the removal of a, a very large threat. It allowed the pig program to move forward in subsequent years. Rare plant introductions, you know, in, when the sheep were there, there was no point in putting out rare plants because they just get eaten. Invasive plant control programs could take place. Fire started to happen. Prescribed burns happened on the island. There are some novel unforeseen restoration projects, such as the control of Argentine ants that's going to be mentioned later, I think. So, the removal of cattle from Santa Cruz Island was a whole different sort of project. In late 1987, after the passing of Dr. Kerry Stanton, who was the landowner on the island, the Nature Conservancy unexpectedly, like overnight, found itself in the cattle management business. And this was a largely you know, managed herd but there was a group of about 50 feral cattle that were down in Laguna Canyon, so it added a little bit of a complication. And the Conservancy didn't really have the skills or the experience and nor the desire to be managing a, a several thousand um, head of cattle. And, but we knew we didn't want it to main, be left unmanaged and get into an area like this where it's overgrazed out to the West End in the late 60s. So in 1988, <laughs> when the offer opportunity came to remove the entire herd in one fell swoop, so to speak, the Conservancy jumped at it. So, in 1989, we removed over 2,000 head of cattle. They were all rounded up, primarily by horseback, you know, although a lot of times it was pushing them by foot too when you went up some of the trails and roads. They all had to go down to Prisoner's Harbor, and they were held in the corrals down there, because it turns out, because we were going from an island to the mainland, we also had to test each and every individual for bovine tuberculosis before the state would allow us to ship them off. So that meant we had to test them, then hold them for a week, get the test results, and then wait for the boat to come. So of course that meant we had to feed them. So we were fortunate because we did, had no resources to really feed them out there. We didn't want to turn them loose. But Dr. Stanton and Henry Duffield, his ranch manager, had stockpiled a, a huge pile of hay in the lower winery building. And so we were able to move all of that hay down to prisoners, feed the cattle for umpteen weeks. They probably didn't think it was the, the finest gourmet hay there was, but they survived. And then we were able to just ship them off. Not all the animals were we able to do on, you know, let them do the walking. Some of the young ones, particularly if it was 10 or 15 miles away, were too small to, to make that trek. So we ended up actually roping them and putting a, a truckload of young heifers in the back and hauling them down that way. And then the feral cattle presented its own challenges. We tried to round them up and move them out on foot several times. They had nothing, wanted nothing to do with that. So we ended up having to uh, rope and tie and bring each animal down individually in the back of a truck. <laughs> so all the animals were shipped off the island <coughs> on the Vaquero 2, which was Santa Rosa Island's cattle boat. Santa Cruz Island had access to it and used it. So they all left that way. One little interesting anecdote was that Fred, who was sort of the pet cattle that was around the ranch area, and he was a Texas Longhorn, remained on the island because his horns were too big, so he couldn't fit down the cattle chute. <laughs> so, so. Uh, we also left a small herd of about 10 or 12 
uh, yearlings just to sort of make the transition from the ranching area to the, to the resource area. We did end up shipping off most of the horses just because we knew that that trip of the Vaquero, that was gonna be his last trip. Conservancy didn't wanna really be in the horse management business either, so a few horses were left for staff to use, but otherwise they were left, they were taken off the island too. But I think one of the, the lessons we really learned from cattle was you gotta really think about the unintended consequences. The release from grazing was something that we thought, oh yeah, there might be some release from grazing, but we didn't expect it to the degree it happened. So when the cattle were gone, and we knew fennel was on the island, we knew where it was located somewhat, but we didn't really think about how widespread it was or what might happen. So after cattle and probably the sheep too came off, fennel exploded. You know, it was acres and acres of it. It was taller than the vehicles, taller than the Jeeps. Um, and it's a continuing problem for Nature Conservancy today. They've you know, been doing a number of trials and a number of programs, but it's not a, a solved program, a solved problem, yeah. But it does really make you think that, you know, that first, before you do something, before you take an action, really try to figure out what might happen. But then that sort of gets back to the thing of, okay, we don't want to be in the cattle business. We don't want to be managing 2,000 head. We have an opportunity to ship them all off. We might not know all the consequences. So how do you balance that, you know, expediency versus some of the unknown things is something that you want to really consider. Jumping down a little bit to Catalina Island, this was a, a program to remove the pigs. It was done in a whole different sort of philosophy. It was done in a phased approach. One thing to remember for Catalina is that we had a population of maybe 4,000 plus permanent residents and over a million visitors per year. So that added to the challenge a bit. The idea was to see what worked and then move on from there. So moving to the uninhabited, most uninhabited area first, there's just a reduction in animals. Then it's like, well, let's try to reduce the animals on the whole island. Let's get rid of them completely on one part of the island and go from there. And then finally, remove all the island. I'm going to remove all the animals from the entire island. And because of the different zones and the different challenges and with the people on the island and the coves and all the leases and all of that, we had to do a number of different techniques. So there was ground hunting that was both sport hunting and staff hunting, trapping, dogs, aerial hunting. So it was a whole wide variety, but each one of those was a valuable technique that we needed to use to be able to make the program work. The result was 12,000 pigs were removed between 1990 and 2004. And I think one little thing to remember here is that's a pretty long period of time, so you're actually looking at a lot of reproduction in there too. So shorter periods of time means a more humane way in terms of, of removing less animals. Goat removal was similar. The program started. Most of the animals were removed, but then the program stopped because funding ran out. <laughs> Program started again, a small area, expanded to the whole island. Then it was halted again because some new options came to light. And so the, the program actually did resume, but it was a combination of some live capture and hunting at that point. And finally, it wasn't until 2001 that the last few animals were removed through live capture. And we also collared some of them. And there's a technique that's you know, nicknamed the Judas goat because the, you leave a sterilized collared goat on the island that you can track and then let the goat do the work of finding all of his compadres and you know, it makes it much easier than you having to track down each individual one. Again, the results here, nine to 10,000 animals removed over a, a decade. So the lessons learned from here were that there are multiple techniques you can use. Sometimes you need to really look at all of them because they're valuable for different challenges. The insurance that the fencing provided, those four zones had a fence in between each one of them. And that really was critical because if you remove the animals from one area, you didn't want it to get repopulated if you got halted either because of lack of funding or for any other reason. So, and then the on again, off again programs don't really meet anybody's objectives. And you know, and in hindsight, if there was an earlier strong commitment of both time and resources to complete the job quickly, it would mean less time for the program, be fewer animals having to be removed because there wouldn't be the reproduction, so more humane in that sense a lower cost, public relations would have been much better because you're dealing with it for a much shorter time. And that's both within internally, like within the Catalina Conservancy and within the general public, particularly the local Avalon community. You know, there was lots of disagreements about what should and shouldn't be done. And so if you can shorten that amount of time, you're in good shape. 
We also, you know, in hindsight, could have probably done better real-time monitoring control methods and results because that would have really shown what was working and, you know, there were some instances where maybe we could have shortened the time that way. One thing we did learn and we were able to pass on was that the work that we did down in Catalina helped when the Santa Cruz Island actually started removing the pigs up here. The opportunities, again, is documenting the recovery of an ecosystem following the removal of a large threat. Oak regeneration, I mean, pigs love acorns. So that you, if you planted out acorns, you weren't gonna get very many back until the pigs and the goats were gone. Same with ground nesting birds, you know, they were impacted by them, so their recovery was improved. <laughs> and then rare plant recovery and reintroductions, again, just because they were able to survive after the animals were removed. So in conclusion, you know, one question would be, what do all these programs have in common? You know, it's four different species, a couple different islands, different challenges, things like that. But I would say, as Kate had mentioned, that you know, it's a group of people that share, share an important collective group of traits that all good teams and all good leaders have that really made this possible. So Dale Hall, who was the director of the US Fish and Wildlife Service for a number of years and CEO of Ducks Unlimited, has outlined a list of these in his recent book that just came out last year, Compelled. And I'd like to just share those with you. You know, if you have a program, you need a vision. You wanna know what you're doing and why you're doing it. You're gonna be, it's tough work. You're gonna be working closely with a group of people. They're gonna become like your family. You may spend more time with them than you do with your real family. So you get to know with them and or figure out how to work together. Everybody comes with their own set of skills and knowledge. And so everybody has something they can teach everybody else. And it's important to be able to share that and be willing to share what you know with others. By the same token, nobody knows everything. So you can always learn from somebody else. So be a good listener and be a good learner. Be open to new ideas. And be honest. I mean, admit that there are times when you might make a mistake <laughs> and say, well, we made a mistake and let's move on from it and learn from it. But just admit what happens. Integrity is another a key component. It's like a lot of times you could take an easy way to do out to get some of these programs done, but if it's not the right way to do it or the you know ethical way to do it, you need to put the time and the effort into that. You need to trust your team members and your partners because you're not going to be able to do everything by yourself. So you know, really work and trust the people you're with. And then of course humility. I mean, particularly when you have a program that spans a decade or 15 years. Things are gonna happen that you don't expect and you have to say, okay, let's you know, learn from this and move on. And then finally, it's the passion that makes these programs work. It's the passion of the people on these programs, it's the passion of the people in this room that's gonna help with future projects. And so when we look at all of the, the, eight, the 16 islands, the eight California islands for Alta California and the eight Baja California islands, it's the passion of everybody that makes the, the future work hopeful. You know, and it's the fact that even though there's been a lot of restoration done out there, there's going to be a lot more to be done. And, and as long as people are willing and able and passionate to do it, you know, I'm really hopeful that we can keep the successes going. So thank you to all the people and organizations and partnerships who made this successful. We couldn't have done it without you. So thanks. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them. We're a little behind schedule, but let's take just one burning question. Anybody? Well, I would like to know how you're going to get rid of the Argentine ants. <laughs> <laughs> later in the program. The question was how we'll, we'll get rid of the Argentine ants, and you'll hear from John Knapp in, uh, a little later in the day. Great. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks. All right, thanks, Peter. Hello. Okay, so you have to get a little a little close. <laughs> All right. So next up, we have Federico Alfonso Mendez Sanchez, uh, who's the director general, and Luciana Luna <laughs> Luna Mendoza, who is the director of ecology at HESI uh, in Ensenada, Mexico. Um, in the production of our honoree video, someone described Luciana and Fede as salt of the earth, and I think that's very fitting. 
They're about the kindest and hardest working people that you'll ever have the pleasure of meeting. They'll share their work toward the comprehensive restoration of Mexico's islands and will tell us about the eradication of goats on Isla Guadalupe and the amazing natural recovery that followed, as well as the extensive rare pine, palm, and cypress recovery efforts that are ongoing. Welcome. Morning, everyone. It's um, amazing to be here. We're really honored and humbled to receive this award from the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, so we're really grateful, and especially the cherry on the cake is sharing this with Kate and, and Peter, so thank you very much. And uh, we really are here, you know, we're, Luciana and I, we're spoke, spokespeople, we say, from, from a, a large group of people that's been working on island restoration in Mexico within our group, but also from the Mexican government agencies, and, and it's, it's, it's a really, really, really large group. So uh, Mexico's islands, uh, we have 4,400 islands, uh, different types of ecosystems, so those little dots, it's just a, to show you that we have lots of islands, uh, like, like the Philippines in numbers, or like Greece, for example, and it's different type of ecosystems, temperate islands, desert islands, but also tropical ones, and Denise did a great job on giving us a tour. I'm just gonna add a little bit to that. This is Cedros Island. Denise already talked about it. This is the fourth biggest island in Mexico of the Pacific coast of the Baja California Peninsula. Uh, then we go to the Gulf of California. This is Espiritu Santo Island, desert island, uh, kind of different type of setting, uh, blue colors in the water like the tropics, but it's in the Gulf of California. Then we go a little bit south, like the central Mexican Pacific, the eastern tropical Pacific. This is Clarion Island, the most remote island in Mexico, a thousand kilometers from the mainland. Uh, this is part of the, the Revilla Gijedo archipelago. And also the truly tropical islands. This is Banco Chinchorro, uh, an atoll in the Gulf of, uh, in, I'm sorry, in the Mexican Caribbean. And all the amazing biodiversity that we have on these islands. The northern elephant seals, they've been highlighted already, but also, uh, endemisms. There's lots of endemisms in, in the Mexican islands. This is a, probably one of the few island endemic deer, the, the Cedros Island mule deer. Other cute mammals like the foxes. Here we have the Espiritu Santo ring-tailed cat, the babisuri we call it in, 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 in Mexico, or the caco mixtle. And there are special things like the Santa Catalina rattlesnake. Note, no rattlesnake. And then also islands are amazing uh, because of their existence things happen, so they, use, they are used by, by fauna as a stepping stones, also by flora. And so, like, for example, the Revilla Gijedo archipelago that I was mentioning, it, it was probably thanks to the existence of that archipelago that green sea turtles migrated from the western to the eastern Pacific, so that's, that's amazing. And also lots of seabirds, so probably most of the work we do is because of uh, protection to seabirds, and seabirds are like, um, an unequivocal relationship with the island. So you have islands that are in well shape and you have lots of seabirds. So lots of seabirds in the Mexican islands as well. Everywhere, like from, from temperate species to tropical species like the boobies. And Mexico is a mica diverse country and it's important for different groups of, of fauna. For, for example, for seabirds it's really, really, really important. We are third in diversity just after the US and Chile and also lots of endemisms in seabirds as well, just after New Zealand. And um, just to give you an example of the importance of islands in Mexico is that at least 8.3% of the whole vascular plants and uh, vertebrates occur on its islands, and many, many are unique species, endemic species. But as has been discussed already, the biggest threat to that is invasive species. So from 24 confirmed extinctions in Mexico, 21 of those have occurred on islands and about 17 of those have because of the invasive mammals, particularly rodents and feral cats. So like 80% of extinctions in Mexico have occurred on islands and because of invasive species. So that's why we do what we do and we started doing a lot of, um, 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 of science. So what, what are the restoration priorities for the Mexican islands and, and, and setting up a group like HESI that really, really uh, moves and push forwards for these important um, restoration actions that are needed. And th so did, we did this like a national prioritization about which islands go first. There's so many of them, uh, but you have to go for the most, probably the most biodiverse, the most important ones in terms of uh, endemisms, or, but also in terms of cost effectiveness of those programs. 
There's also been international recognition that the Mexican islands are important. This is a work by Nick Holmes, who's somewhere there, uh, doing a, like a, a, a global assessment of which islands we have to target on removing gaseous mammals that will be really relevant for, for global biodiversity. So there's 10 Mexican islands there. Some of them we've done already. Some of those are, are in making, in the progress. And this will benefit 17 populations of 14 threatened species. So um, I'm not gonna go into details of what, how we have done it or where we have done it, but it's just a summary about Mexico's island trajectory. And, and this is like a, a big overview for the past 25 years now that he uh, has, has been around and that this work has been you know, going in, in Mexico is about 60 populations of invasive mammals have been removed from the Mexican islands. Uh, we've targeted 39 islands and of those, 30 are already free of invasive mammals, so all invasive mammals have been removed. And if you see on the map, the, the, the um, yellow squares are where we're working now, so we hopefully, by the end of this year, early next year, finish with uh, cats on Guadalupe and Socorro, uh, goats on Espiritu Santo, and also cats and goats on the Marias Archipelago on some of those islands. So it's about four islands to almost be clear from invasives and and to start doing active restoration, as I will tell you about. And of course, this is a long story. This is about 60,000 hectares in way of restoration. So we remove invasive mammals from these 60,000 hectares, and, and things are start, uh, starting to happen. Your recovery is occurring. And but there's been lots of, uh, of investment there as well. So uh, funding is, is, is key to keep these programs going. Island work is remote. It's complicated. It's, it's, it's costly. So that that really needs to be the, one of the main, main, the main key targets to, to keep on going. And then lots of benefits to endemic species. Um, for, from those uh, eradication programs I mentioned, we benefit over 200 endemic species of all the different groups, plants, ber birds, reptiles, mammals as well. But usually, uh, removing basic mammals, it's a big step, but it's not the only step to keep recovery going. So we move into active restoration that Kate mentioned a bit about that. It's that we just keep on going and we have to have this vision about doing a comprehensive restoration of the island ecosystem. So that goes for the birds, for example, in some islands that the eradication of the invasive mammals happened like 10 years ago. The birds were around, but they weren't coming back to the islands. And so, well, we, we say, well, well, why they are not coming back if these islands are safe places now, again, because there's no predators now. And so we, talking about collaborations <coughs> and partnerships, we got funding from uh, the Monroe's and Settlements Restoration Programs to start a cyber program in Mexico. So we started doing social attraction techniques. So we deploy decoys and sound systems on those islands where there's no invasive mammals now. And uh, like recreating a colony to let the birds know that the islands are safe, ha safe havens again. And we did this with, um, you know, over the course of probably 12 years now, uh, we provided extra habitat, nesting habitat using artificial nests. And the story here is that we clear the uh, invasive mammals from the islands and then we started with this active restoration um, work and we already have recovered in the Baja California Pacific Islands, which are the, the, the ones here in the, in, in the proximity, is that from 27 extirpated colonies from those islands of nine different species, we have already recovered 23 of them. So it's 85% recovery. We're aiming to 100%. We'll see. Some of those recoveries were thanks to active restoration. And, and also the great thing is that it not just the recolonizations, but also the appearance of new colonies of different species. So we have recorded 12 new breeding seabirds on those different islands. But then, keeping on going, sometimes active restoration is not enough. So uh, we started attracting uh, black-footed albatrosses to Guadalupe Island using social attraction. For about five years, that didn't work. The birds were around, but they, they trying to, to nest on Guadalupe. Feral cats got them early in the 2000s. And so we started this, uh, again, by national collaboration. Partnerships are really important. Uh, even political um, situations as well. We use the Trilateral Committee for Wildlife and Ecosystem Management that comes from NAFTA, now USMCA or something like that. Uh, so we did this translocation project over the pandemic. In 2021, we uh, transported birds 
uh, and, and X from Midway Atoll all the way to Guadalupe Island. So imagine that trip. And that's the, with the idea to um, repopulate Guadalupe Island with black-footed albatrosses, uh, but also to give them a chance because of their main colonies in the Hawaiian Islands are being targeted because of climate change and especially sea level rise. And then to secure all this investment and these recoveries and these conservation gains, all those dots that you sh I showed you on the map about the islands we have already uh, removed invasive mammals, we need to protect those. So that's why we have been implementing an, a wide nationwide island biosecurity program, which is let's prevent at all costs that those eradicated mammals or other species come into these islands again. And so we've been doing this in, in close collaboration with Mexico's government. You saw my, my, my friend and colleague, uh, Israel Popoca, who manages Guadalupe Island. And so we, we have this partnership with CONAMP, with the Mexican Navy, to, which has, are two key actors for the islands in Mexico to prevent species getting into the islands again. Again, partnerships. We have this amazing bina binational biosecurity working group. We have working groups for almost everything. We, we really, as Peter said, we are family. We really love to get together. So we have the biosecurity working group, the cyber group, the plants group. So um, this is really uh, a work in, in the making of, of a big efforts of a big group. And so to kind of put our feet on the ground and to make this really happen on the ground and keep on going is to work with uh, island communities. And so that's a key part of what we do as well. We do a lot of uh, environmental education outreach with the local communities on the islands or on the islands close or on the mainland close to the islands. We do this. We love to play and, and, and do this with the kids, but also with the adults. It's mostly fishermen on those islands. And um, just as a summary, and, and, and somebody, well, Peter also said that we have to have a clear vision. So we have this clear vision that for 2030, we have to have all the Mexican islands free from invasive mammals and like biosecurity really working. So it's just around the corner, right, 2030. It seemed part of, far away 20 years ago, but hey, you have to have a vision. That's ours, and, and, and this is a commitment, not binding, but a commitment that we did in the Honolulu Challenge from the IUCN. It's the decade of ecosystem restoration, so we, that's, that's our focus, and that's where we're trying to go. And then I'll pass it along to uh, my colleague, Luciana, which is going to talk to you about an example, which is Guadalupe Island, an amazing island. So thank you so much. Thank you. If you hear some snoring. <laughs> so just uh, talking about uh, Guadalupe, Guadalupe is a biosphere reserve. It's the fifth uh, biggest island that we have in Mexico. It's a volcanic origin. It's very far from mainland, so pre-oceanic. Uh, that's why we only have plants. We have a lot, a lot of endemic species, including pan, uh, plants, uh, land birds, seabirds, and invertebrates. Unlike the Channel Islands, I wish we had a, a Island fox, but we, we don't. We don't have native terrestrial mammals or amphibians or reptiles in the island. So this was a great opportunity to start a very comprehensive restoration program since 2002. We haven't been able to do that in all the islands. Some, some islands don't, don't need that intervention for a long period of time. And some, um, you only go and do an intervention and then the island uh, by itself can rebound. It wasn't the case for, for Guadalupe. So we start working there with invasive uh, mammals for, uh, thank you, for species, uh, uh, focus on species and, and, and the restoration of habitat. Uh, so again, um, for the collaboration, so National Park Service and CONAM given the similar, they, they share all the endemic plant share and found that, that uh, they were between the Channel Islands and Guadalupe Island. They named it as sister parks many years ago and this has um, gave us the perfect excuse to have the binational collaboration formalized to address the challenges more eff effectively and efficiently and together achieve better, greater conservation success. So this, as uh, Fede was saying, uh, a big, um, we're very grateful to be involved in this collaboration group. We have learned so much from many people in this, in this um, room. And well, what happened is something similar what, um, about we have been hearing for Peter and, and Kate about the degradation of the islands. So the, problem, the main problem for Guadalupe for the vegetation was the introduction of feral goats and the end of 1800s. And that, uh, well, talking about Pinus radiata, so the Monterey Pine, there's only five native populations in 
in the whole world, three in California and two in Mexico, one in Cedros Island, the other one in Guadalupe. And from a study from 2001, two of uh, Rogers and Vargas, a, uh, a trinational collaboration, they uh, estimated that were only 220 individuals left of the pines, which was quite dramatic. And not all of them producing viable seeds, so it was a big problem of um, very patchy distribution. So um, we needed to to remove the, the first step was to remove the feral goats, so we removed those. Uh, the island was free of, of those animals by uh, 2007. And then the recovery started to bouncing back. So what's great for the um, Pino Radiata, you can see here all the new individuals. And also for the cypress, the cypress is going a little bit slower because the, the, the trees grow slow, slower than pines, but it's still a lot of um, recovery. But Again, um, the forest was decreased to maybe one seventh of the original uh, distribution. So, but those were recovering uh, uh, quite well naturally. But there are other species of the island oak that they're not recovering as well as as the the other the pines and the and the cypress. We only have 15 individuals of, of these ones left. There in Mexico is only on Guadalupe Island where we can find it. So. Uh, so for um, species like this one, you need more active uh, r restoration programs. So this is one stepping and using, as uh, it was mentioned, it has been mentioned before, all the information that was available. We were lucky that in Guadalupe, and compared to other other Mexican islands, we do have a lot of information. And I know that is all the collaboration that we have had for all these many uh, decades, I will say, many, many years. So we use the base as a reference model, the, the work from Tom's, the, the map, and also uh, Moran, all the descriptions of where the plants used to be, how extensive used to be the forests or the vegetation communities, and also some information of, um, for example, going with Steve Junak, and he mentioned in uh, Senecio Palmera used to be so rare in this area, and now is recovering very well, and we should be seeing that one now maybe in this cliff. So all, using all that information, uh, collaboration with colleagues, um, Jesus Vargas and, and Jose Luis Navarro from a uh, Mexican um, institution saying, okay, the pines of this uh, patch, they have very low genetic diversity, so maybe you have to mix this ones with that, uh, the seed from this side to the other side, so it's in all that information. And then uh, all the information that the landscape or the system is, is giving you as species that, who can miss a Cianotus arboreus walking, I mean, they're like big shrub, and it wasn't recorded before just because of the fact of feral goats. So that was, was, was found in 2004 by Steve Junek and John Randall around the pine forest, and now it's just everywhere. It's so obvious that it was part of the, um, the landscape of the pine forest and the cypress forest. And others had the Artostaphilus, which was uh, found like 100 years ago. It was only one specimen collected, went to a uh, collection, it was lost, it wasn't never fully described, and now is, we have only have one individual. We, we have the hope that we are getting more. So that one is being described by Marta Ceseña. And then we're using all that information to know what to produce at the nursery, uh, where to take that, those plants, just to try to connect, for example, and here you see the cypress forest, just to try to connect with our plantings, all that area, the pines, which were recovering uh, very fast, like around the adult trees, but not much in the regional, um, the whole uh, coverage, so trying to planting those. So it's a comparison of uh, trees that were out 2016 in the, in the, at the top of the same ones now in the last year. Other activities such as uh, managing the natural recovery, so very dense and very high risk of fires, so trying to, to do well management of the natural recovery. Uh, a lot of this is at the pines, but a lot of that um, individuals are very, very close, they're not growing, and they're just affecting the, the adult trees, so just removing those. Using that material to do soil restoration actions, and well, yeah, keeping, um, and try to lower the, the risk fire with the fire breaks. And then jumping into protecting seabirds. Uh, well, the study with feral cats, they have been there for more than 100 years. Uh, and so far they have um, ca likely causing the, the extinction of endemic one, the Guadalupe storm petrel, and also some lambers, some endemic subspecies that we used to have there. 
and then heavy, very heavy predation on the seabirds that we still have in the place, including the uh, barrel nesting nocturnal seabirds, which are the most uh, susceptible to predation by feral cats, as the Guadalupe murrelet. So the Guadalupe murrelet is uh, similar to the Scripps murrelet, uh, very um, only relies mostly in Guadalupe for breeding and to another uh, island, San Benito, but most of the population depends on Guadalupe. And it used to be um, with the, the, the cats that were only restricted to some of the islands that are cat-free. And you cannot have a full glimpse of how big was the damage until you see them coming back. So we set up a fence and now we are removing the, the cats from all over the island, but looking just uh, starting with the fence, we, uh, at 2015, we found only two uh, burrows in this area, and now you can see in 2022, there are more than 600 in, in that area. Um, and well, this is a story, the restoration has just begun, only for Guadalupe, but this is an example for, for many islands. We're aiming to recover Original coverage, we, are, we know that it's going to be very, very hard, but at least that's the goal that we have. And not only trees, but all the other species. So active uh, management, well, for the natural recovery and the, all the, the work that we're doing to trying to decrease us also the, the risk of fire. And to keep on going with this uh, collaboration, to get the expertise, as Peter was saying, everyone has something to, to, uh, to add new ideas or even the question, the burning questions that they have us and, and they let us think and just trying to do the things uh, the better way each time. Um, and this uh, also collaboration with the national government and CONAFOR and Flanquilla, which are the, the donors as well for the, this um, vegetation work, the challenges that we, we all share. And well, still to answer many, many questions, we are learning, we, are, um, we have learned a lot, we still are, and well, that's, that's it. Um, uh, that's it. We well, we just want to thank all the collaborators that, that we have, including and thanks to you again for the the word from the colleagues and in Ensenada and in La Paz. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Let's take uh, one or two questions. Morgan. Let me just repeat the question real quick. He was just uh, complimenting them on all the infrastructure that goes in to do this work and asking about rediscoveries. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, for uh, Manzanita, unfortunately, we only have one individual. So we're keeping that, that one, um, yeah, just going once in a while and sing with it, to it and all that. We, we do have some clones on, on the, the nursery just in, in case and waiting for, for another one, hopefully. Uh, this, that one came out after the last fire, so we're hoping that it will be more. With other species, uh, yeah, we're from the, the earth covers, we're trying to produce some, some those at the, at the nursery, just taking those out, but yeah, but the, with the manzanita is just being described. But yeah, there's other as a pseudonafalium that hasn't, well, I think it's, in, in, it's being described right now. And there is an, another one, the cyanotus, that used to be, was um, named cuniatus and then uh, crassifolius, but now we are not really sure. And we think that maybe it could be something similar. We have still some questions to, to answer that maybe the genetic analysis. Thank you. <laughs> we'll, t we'll take just one more if, if y'all can hang with us. Karen? Uh, just wondering what is the retail cat keeps um, paying, and how do you know that they're naked, essentially? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. She was asking about the ring tailed cats and whether they eat eggs and how you know if they're native. Thank you. Uh, Fede, do you have more information? 
Yeah, the, the ringtail hat is present on Spiritu Santo Island, which is off the coast of uh, La Paz. And it's, it's an endemic species, so it, 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 it's, it's a herbivore, so it, it mostly, omnivore, I'm sorry. So it mostly eats, uh, you know, like plants, fruits from, from, from the desert island. Uh, we haven't recorded any predation on like seabirds or, or land birds present on the island, so I think it's, it's, it's mostly kind of a omnivore uh, diet. Rather than, so it's 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 not a problem because it's it's an endemic. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right, now let's. <laughs> thank you both so much, and thanks to all of you for being here and online. Um, we are going to break for lunch, and we're going to reconvene at one o'clock. Um, I want to point out the tables at the back, including a sneak peek of the flora of Catalina Island, which will be coming out hopefully this year. Um, so please take a look, uh, and um, we'll see you again at, at 1 o'clock.
introduce Dr. Catherine McEachern. She's a research plant ecologist with the U.S. Geological Survey at the Channel Islands Field Station. I've really enjoyed working with Catherine over the years. She has this really soothing southern accent um, that goes with just her really steady personality and strong work ethic. And she's done so much to understand the island's rare plants over the past three decades. And she'll tell us about this work to understand and recover rare plants on the Channel Islands National Park, as well as more recent efforts to restore island oaks and ecosystems through the ambitious Cloud Forest Restoration Program. Welcome, Catherine. Yeah, thank you, Denise. It's likewise, it's been great knowing you all these decades as well. <laughs> Um, I have had the great good fortune to have most of my career span the transition on the islands from ranching to conservation, and it's been an extremely exciting time to be involved in restoration, conservation. This is one of the only places in the world where now the disturbances are being taken away, the stressors are being taken off of the ecosystem, and we can actually peel back the layers, as Peter was mentioning, and see what, what exists now that the stresses are gone. Um, so... We, uh, one of my roles as a research scientist in the National Park Service and in the U.S. Geological Survey and in the Department of Interior is to provide information that, that helps managers make decisions, helps them know what they have and what decisions that they, they can make for management, and also to look at the consequences of that, those management actions. And so this all started in 1993 when I was a fresh young graduate student. Um, we convened a workshop with the local botanists, many of whom are here and hopefully watching as well on YouTube. Um, to just find out who, who are these rare plants, what are the rare plants of the islands, based on perception of their rarity and or their um, potential facing demise at the hands of some of the ranching practices. Um, we ended up identifying about 80 plants of concern on the California um, National Park Service islands, the five islands of the National Park Service. 14 of those ended up eventually becoming listed as federally endangered or threatened. So my research approach over the years has been actually, sounds pretty simple. I just framed up four questions that I've pursued all these years that many of you have helped me with. Uh, where are the rare plant taxa? How do they compare to how they were doing in the past? Are there, how are populations doing now? And are there major threats to populations that we can do something about? The way I went about doing this is to look at herbarium archives to find out where they've been in the past conduct field surveys to try and find them in the field and find them in new, new and old habitats, go back and count populations repeatedly, for some of them to do demographic monitoring to see what the weak links in the life cycle might be, and then to do some experiments to see what can we do, if anything, to help these plants out. And one way that I've come to think about this that I've found very useful as a framework for my work is to, to think about the plants as they are now and the plants as we want to have them in the future. So now and in the past, before the animals were moved, most of these rare plants were few, in few populations, small populations, widely isolated from one another and declining. And of course, the future we want for them is for them to be the opposite of that, many, large, connected, and growing. Um, through the years of, of collaboration with many of you and doing these research projects, we've been able to identify some of the things that I think of as constraints. There's something that's that's preventing these species from recovering, from moving from few and small and isolated to many, large and growing. And so I've begun to think of, of the approach to ways we might look at what we can do to recover plants as figuring out what the constraints are and then addressing recovery tools directly to those constraints so that we are focusing our, our few dollars and our limited effort, energy efforts to those, those problems. And in thinking about the recovery tools that we have in our toolbox that we're, all, that we're all beginning to use or have been using for quite a while now, the biggest constraint of all was animal um, trampling, herbivory and trampling. And so before anything else could be done, it was pretty clear to me as a researcher looking at rare plants that the animal eradication was, was paramount to being able to do anything else. And for that, I'm ever, forever grateful to all of you who've worked to do this. So my, my career, my last three decades, and some of this talk is about some of the stories that the plants are telling us about how they're experiencing this transition. Um, there's stories of passive recovery. There's stories that some are saying, we're still small and isolated. Um, there are altered habitats that are changing at different rates. Climate change, kind of the elephant in the room here, is a factor for many of them. And lost ecosystem functions are part of the story as well. 
Um, there are very many plants, like we've been hearing in the last talks, that have just experienced passive recovery. That is, they've expanded, grown in number, expanded their footprint on the landscape enormously just simply because the animals were moving. I say simply, and I'm sure it wasn't a simple thing to do, but <laughs> the Torrey pines are a great example of that. As Denise said, they are a single island endemic pine that uh, were reduced in number to about 100 individuals on Santa Rosa Island in about 1888. Uh, several years ago, we had a CSU Channel Island student group count the pines and measure them, uh, and there were more than 3,000 adult pines. And if you start to count the seedlings and saplings, there are more than, than 12,000 12, of them out there right now. So they are expanding their footprint on the islands enormously without animals eating them and stepping on them. Another group of plants that uh, we've been able to study with some funding from the National Biological Survey, the USGS, in the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden with colleague Dieter Wilkin was a survey we did of about 50 of these 80 identified species that lived in canyons on Santa Rosa Island. Uh, and what we found uh, as a result of an NSF grant that we had that allowed us to do resurvey those canyons in 2010, 2011, was that many of them were just moving out of the refugium habitats where they had been hiding um, back into the canyons. And so we had, um, an enormous increase in numbers of species and a huge increase in abundance. And the footprint of these plants is still expanding on the landscape. A great consequence of taking the animals off the islands. There are a couple of other plants that we have out there that have been recovering as well. And this is such a, a cool thing. Uh, these two plants, the Santa Cruz Island bed straw and the Dudleya uh, Santa Cruz Island live forever, have been proposed for delisting now by the Fish and Wildlife Service because they've been expanding. The, Galium, the, the bed straw, is moving off of the cliff faces where it had survived during the ranching areas back onto the terraces. And the Dudleya is expanding itself uh, out on Santa Cruz Island in the one population that it inhabits. Kate Faulkner mentioned the inventory and monitoring program of the Park Service. We can see through the data that have been collected over the years there that there have been some incredibly good changes in some of the areas on San Miguel Island. Like, for example, um, a giant Coreopsis stand has come to inhabit an area that in 1983 was a, was a grassland. These are what the, the inventory monitoring data are showing us, and this, it just shows us, again, an, a passive recovery that is happening out there. But it's not always the case that that passive recovery, that expansion on its own, is, is happening. And what we're finding through the monitoring that the, the inventory monitoring program is doing, through studies that we are all doing, this remapping and resurveying is that there's some places that are resistant to change, especially where there are um, annual grasslands that are really holding firm onto the ground. Um, Patricia Corey did her PhD thesis looking at the data from San Miguel and Santa Barbara Island and found that um, grasslands on clay soils are much more resistant to invasion or recovery of native shrubs than grasslands, for example, on sandy soils and even on the same island. So what we know is that there are nuanced differences depending on where the plants are, who they are, uh, and what they are experiencing. I think, though, without having kept the pieces, like uh, Peter was saying, we really wouldn't be seeing any of this. We still have some plants that exist in populations that are very small and isolated. And we're beginning to focus a lot on those right now with some recent funding from the state, from Fish and Wildlife Service, from USGS, and, and from the Park Service. Um, some of those are annual plants that live out their entire life cycle in one year. They exist as seeds in the seed bank in favorable years. Hopefully this is going to be one of them. They'll spring up, um, grow, flower, produce seeds, and die back before the summer drought hits. And so they, they have a very quick life cycle. Several of these are listed plants, and they're on our, high on our list of targeted plants to work with these, this, this, um, this coming few years. Um, and we can address quite a few of the issues with these plants. Another group of them are perennials, shrubs, and some of the live forevers. They live a much longer life cycle. They also are, though, in very few and small populations far between. The um, island barberry that you see on the left, we know from about six populations and now from about 11 locations on Santa Cruz Island. It used to be on two other islands as well. The um, plant in the middle, the island bushmallow, is only on Santa Cruz Island. The Trask live forever is only on Santa Barbara Island. 
the two shrubs are very interesting, um, make a very interesting comparison for some of the challenges that we have for recovery. The barberry and the malacothamus, the uh, bush mallow, we've tried to reproduce from cuttings. The bush mallow does great. It's very happy to be grown from cuttings in the, in the nursery and then planted out. The barberry, on the other hand, is a very slow growing plant that, that we are really difficult, is, is difficult to plant from cuttings. And so now uh, TNC is sponsoring a project to grow it from tissue culture. So we try various things that, and they don't work, we try more. The Live Forever is a success story that has been really largely led by our colleagues uh, at CIES, the California Institute of Environmental Studies, out on Santa Barbara Island. They have greatly increased the number of Live Forevers on that island by growing them from seed in an island nursery. Another um, kind of nuanced situation that illustrates some of the challenges that we as researchers and that the plants as uh, native endemic plants have is illustrated by this um, Castilea, the soft-leaved island paintbrush. It's an interesting plant to talk to little kids about because it's sort of parasitic. It's called hemiparasitic. It, it makes root connections with native shrubs and then draws sugars and nutrients and minerals from those, the roots of those shrubs. Kind of a, you know, sort of a sick life cycle. But what it means is that they need to be close to these, these native shrubs. One of the problems that this plant has had is that during the ranching era, there was a lot of space that opened up because of trampling by the animals. Uh, that we call fragmentation of habitats. And so there are vast places meters wide between where these plants germinate and, and where the next nearest shrub is. So they can't find their neighbor that they need to grow. Um, a, another thing that we observe in long-term demographic monitoring plots that I'm doing with my colleague Denise, uh, Diane Thompson uh, at the Claremont McKenna College is we started looking at individual plants in plots in 1995 and tracked plants and stems in those plots annually since then. And what we found was that when the animals were eradicated, when the cattle were removed from Santa Rosa Island, and the, the deer and elk started to be reduced, there was a big increase in population in, in the numbers of stems and in the numbers of plants. Uh, and that persisted for several years, but then started to decline. And at about the point when it started to decline, we lost funding. And it was kind of like, ooh, we still have to do this. So somehow we scraped together the money to keep this going. And what we found was that the decline was related to increasing nighttime temperatures. Um, as temperatures increased, the smaller stems and twigs and plants uh, started to experience mortality. And so we see in our population there's kind of a um, an effect here of changing temperature. We don't know if it's the temperature itself or if it's the, something that's related to the temperature, like perhaps the movement of fog more offshore or more inland. Um, we've continued this until the current year, and this decline, sadly, is continuing. Um, so this kind of points out that we, as managers and as researchers, need to think ahead strategically about how we're going to think about climate change and what it does with plants like this. And I. I think by studying some of these rare plants, we're also able to make some conjections and, and prescriptions for the more common ones. I think what we're left with here is we can't do much about the climate, but we certainly can address habitat situations. We can protect the habitat, keep it from becoming more fragmented, protect it, as it and let it grow back in together. So just a few stories about the rare plants, um, various types of responses across the landscape. One of the... Um, plants that really stands out in many people's minds is the island oak, Quercus tomentella. Um, this, this plant, as, as uh, Luciana was showing, grows in a very foggy ecosystem. And the, the functions of that ecosystem have, have basically been lost. What happens on Santa Rosa Island and in many coastal areas, Guadalupe Island and others, is that the fog rolls in as the sun sets at night drenches the landscape, just blows across the landscape and, and drenches the landscape with water. There used to be plants there that had their twigs and leaves sticking up into the air, collecting that water, the water would condense on it, and then it would drop down and, and percolate into the ground. Now, as you can see from this photograph taken by um, my colleague in USGS, Lorraine Flint, the water condenses on the trees that are remaining, these island oaks that are stranded here on this hillside, but it runs off, runs down, and does not percolate into the ground. And what we see here was a place where there used to be chaparral covering the hills with the island oak and other, with the bishop pines and other plants growing in woodland, uh, kind of like groves coming out of, of, of this 
um, this chaparral. It's hard to kind of wrap your mind about, but if you think about the hills here around Santa Barbara, you see their chaparral covered, and that should be the case here as well. Um, so really, we're talking about an ecosystem function that has been lost to the island. We need to capture water in the uplands so that we can get water that percolates into the ground, feeds the springs and seeps the stream flowing groundwater so that we, again, can have a hydrologic function that works. So this project, the Cloud Forest Restoration Project, is about helping the oaks, but it's also about restoring a function that has been absolutely lost from this system. Um, so I know that many of you here have helped with this project, and we've involved about 400 volunteers now, um, students, retirees, which are, I'm going to be one soon someday, uh, <laughs> teachers, um, much appreciated because you can't do this by yourself. But the, basically our objectives here are to, to slow erosion, to trap organic matter as it blows by on the hills, to harvest fog, um, to increase soil water, grow plants, and figure out what happens. And so one thing that we do is that we hand roll wattles, like the kinds that you can see along the highway when they do uh, roadside construction, place them along the hill slopes to collect um, sediment, to collect seeds, to collect detritus. We also put in what we call zigzag fences that are about nine inch tall fences that we've put under the, the trees to collect all the uh, leaves and sticks and insects, lichens that were blowing by. We have constructed what we call in fog fences. These are one inch galvanized steel mesh fences that we put close to the ground because otherwise they'd blow away out there on Santa Rosa Island where it's very windy. Um, the, the wind pushes through the fence the water condenses, the fog-laden water condenses on the fence, and the water sheets down onto the ground and waters our plants for us. We also um, grow plants in the nursery that we plant out there. Um, here you can see a very happy bunch of bishop pine seeds, and uh, we're growing island oaks in the nursery. We plant them out along these fog fences, supplemented with drip irrigation just the first growing season to get them started. Uh, and then, once the plants get as tall as the fence, we remove the fences and we let the plants take over the business of catching the water for themselves. And we're using a concept here that's kind of common in deserts, and you hear a lot in ecology classes that you, we have nurse plants. And so the idea is to plant several plants close together, one of which can get tall, and then other plants can come in below it into that fog drip zone. And we are starting to see that happening up there, which is such a, a joyful um, recovery uh, recovery thing to see. We also do a lot of research to figure out what's happening. Is Are we actually getting water into the ground? Are we actually trapping sediment? And does it have any effect on, on erosion? Um, and so this is what we've done to task. To, to date, we had a three-year grant from the National Park Service, had a bit of a hiatus, which kind of coincided with, with the pandemic. Uh, but we now have another three years of funding to continue this work. So that's what we're working on now. Like I said, we've had tons of volunteers of all walks of life, and I really appreciate all the help out there. So what my take home message from this is that the animal removal has been essential and has benefited a lot of plants and benefited the ecosystem, but the recovery varies across species and across places on the islands. I think that it's really important for us to collect information on what's going on so that we can target our actions very carefully to, to the problems. Like Peter, I think we should save the pieces because if there are no pieces left, we have nothing to work with. And be patient. It takes quite a long time for these, these projects to work. Thanks to many of the collaborators and major funders that we've had through these years. I really appreciate it and appreciate what's yet to come. I think I ran a bit over. I think I ran a bit over time. Good. Let's take one. One question. One question? All right. One burning question. Burning question. Foggy question. <laughs> we can move on, too. You can think about it. Write them down on your little note card. Oh, awesome. I've got a question about um, the role of erosion and how significant it is. It was one of, one of the factors that you listed in there. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and how much is... So the question was, how much is the control of er erosion related to this success? Yeah, I agree with you that it's a very widespread phenomenon in the kinds of geology that we have around here. And I think it is paramount. If you don't control erosion, 
You can't allow plants to get purchased. You can't grow a seed bed. The litter and detritus that's needed for a seed to fall down and, and uh, be nourished by moisture and nutrients. So you have to start from the ground up, certainly. And, you know, it's kind of funny here. I'm a botanist, but I'm in the U.S. Geological Survey, so it's good to have kind of a geological question. <laughs> Okay, next up is Dr. Heather Schneider. She's the lead rare plant biologist at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, where she works collaboratively to tackle rare plant challenges from the genetic to the ecosystem level. Heather is one of the most capable people that I know, whether it's trekking the backcountry, herding cats on her big collaborative projects, or serving as sommelier when you don't know which wine to pick. She'll be speaking about the conservation gains achieved over the last four years through a major collaborative project to recover 14 island rare plant species on seven of the eight channel islands. Stay close. Hi, thanks. Um, I have the great privilege of getting to know the islands while they were already in their period of recovery and being able to work off of the immense foundation that you've heard about from everyone who came before me today and throughout the many, many decades of work on the islands. So today I'm going to tell you a story about a project that many people in this room um, and outside of it have worked on for the last four years. I want to stress, like everybody else, that this was a huge collaborative effort and we had partners at the federal government agencies, other nonprofits, the military, and all of this work was funded through a clause in the Federal Endangered Species Act, which is pretty neat, um, that says that the federal government will spend funding for the states to help recover their rare listed plants. And the goal of this project sounds simple, but was very complicated. We wanted to assess and assist the recovery of 14 listed plants on the Channel Islands. And we focused on seven of the eight islands, which sounds a little bit silly, but um, we worked on the four northern islands, um, San Nicolas, Santa Barbara, and Santa Catalina. San Clemente has a very well-funded conservation program, and we partner with them in other ways, but in this case, they decided to let us disperse the funding we had across the seven islands, and they kind of did their own thing. And the 14 listed plants that we worked with ranged from diminutive annual wildflowers, many of which only occur on one island, like the slender flowered gilia, the island phacelia, um, and the Santa Cruz Island lace pod. We also worked on herbaceous perennials, like the Hoffman's rockcress, the soft leaf paintbrush that Catherine just spoke about, beach spectacle pod, and two endemic um, Dudley ataxa. And then we had two shrubs, which you've heard a little bit about um, from others as well, the Santa Rosa Island Manzanita and the Island Barberry. And in order to tackle 14 listed plants across seven islands, we had to do things sort of in a systematic stepwise fashion. And that started with surveys, just getting out on the islands, pounding soil, flying in helicopters, which is very fun. Um, and getting to know where these plants are, how many of them are there, and how are they doing. To do this, we used mapping protocols, which are kind of boring for regular people, but super fun for nerds like me, um, because we wanted to do this in a repeatable way. We were laying the foundation for ourselves and whoever comes after us to understand how these plants are changing over time. Our genetics team in the garden did a study of the island rush rose, which occurs on Catalina, Santa Cruz, and Santa Rosa islands to understand how the plants on those different islands are related to each other, which could guide future management decisions. And we did a lot of seed collecting. We brought a lot of seeds into our conservation seed bank at the garden, which as Denise mentioned at the beginning of the program, is our insurance policy against extinction. We also brought some plants into the garden's living collection, which is another way that we can not only share these plants with people who can't get to the islands themselves, but also to preserve those genetics within our garden as living plants. We used a lot of our seeds and some wild cuttings to propagate plants so that we could create 
the resources we needed to do restorations and reintroductions to try to put more plants in more places back on the islands. And then that was the last step, a lot of what Catherine was talking about. But usually with rare plants, it's on a much smaller scale. We didn't roll miles of wattle. We made 30 by 30 centimeter plot frames and put a few seeds in where we could. And to give you an idea of the scale of the groundwork that we did here, this is a map of Santa Cruz Island. And each of these points and triangles is a touch point that someone working on our project encountered rare plants. And on Santa Cruz Island, that meant the Santa Cruz Island Live Forever, the Island Rush Rose, Hoffman's Rock Crest, the Santa Cruz Island Lace Pod, the very, very, very tiny Santa Cruz Island Malacothrix, which is that tiny yellow dot next to the pen, and the Island Barberry. And this was just on one island, by foot and by air. Across all seven of the islands that we worked on, our team made 540 rare plant observations. That's 540 individual touch points for where we saw and collected information about rare plant populations, which created a really powerful data set building on what we knew from before this project to help us understand the status of these plants and what we can and should do next to help them recover. And some of our observations were really exciting. So we found five new populations of Hoffman's rock crest on Santa Cruz Island, which was significant in multiple ways. First of all, because we realized that this plant is doing better than we realized it was, which is always good news when you work on rare plants. But also we learned that it could occur in habitat types that we didn't previously know it lived in. And so this totally changed the way that we look for this plant now and it extended into how we look for it on Santa Rosa Island, and this information helped us to find one new patch there, and we plan to continue these surveys to see if we can find additional populations. The Santa Barbara Island Live Forever has quintupled in numbers that we know about as, as humans um, since 2011, and this is due to the long-standing effort and dedication of the National Park Service and CIES, and the fact that they were able to employ aerial surveys. So we were able to get more accurate counts of Dudleya, which like to live on rugged, craggy cliff faces that people can't easily traverse. And so that was a really big boon for this plant to understand that there was a lot more of it than we realized on the landscape. And as Catherine mentioned, the Santa Cruz Island Live Forever, we found throughout this project, um, had expanded in both numbers and extent and this was building on decades of monitoring work that had been done by lots of folks over the years. And as she mentioned, the exclamation point on this is that now because we were able to get this data and understand how this plant is doing and its trajectory looks positive, now it's proposed for delisting from the Federal Endangered Species Act, which isn't something that happens every day. So for, for people like us in conservation, that's just a huge win that feels really good and shows us that when we take the time to look and watch and manage what we can, that we can really make progress. Again, by getting boots on the ground, we found six new Santa Cruz Island uh, lace pod populations on Santa Cruz. This also was a game changer for us. This was a plant we were all very concerned about. It also grows in really rugged, rocky areas that are hard to get to. And this sort of made us stop in our tracks and say, okay, we thought what we were going to do next is start outplanting new populations because this plant needed it. But now we realize what it really needs is for us to look more and in more places. So that's our next step now. We're also doing seed banking so that if we realize we want to put more plants on the landscape, we can do that. But first, we need to just keep looking. And our partners at CIS grew and installed more than 1,000 Santa Barbara Island Live Forever plants on Santa Barbara Island, which was a huge increase for that population, and they continue to take care of those plants. And something that was really exciting for me and a lot of the partners on the project is that the island Malacothrix, which theoretically occurs on Santa Cruz and Anacapa Island, although no one's seen it on Anacapa for some decades, um, we were able to bring seeds of that plant into our conservation seed bank and grow it in our nursery to make more seeds to use for restoration in the future. Um, John Knapp, our partner at Nature Conservancy, every year would go to the population where this plant grows 
collect seed, and it occurs with that tiny little um, other malacothrix, so it can be really hard to tell who's who when they're just in seed and the stems are all dry. And every year we would put those seeds in the nursery, water them, and pray that island malacothrix would reveal itself. And when it finally did, it was just a magical day. And now we've grown thousands of seeds from this plant, so we're ready to really help it out and start doing um, seeding efforts on the island. And on the topic of that, just in the garden nursery for this um, project, we grew eight different island plants, mostly annual wildflowers, and produced nearly a half a million seeds that can all be used for these restoration seedings, outplantings, and reintroductions if needed. And this was really great because not only are we creating the resources that we need to push conservation and recovery forward, but we're also learning about these plants and about their life cycle and how to grow them and how to germinate them. Because if you've ever tried to grow native plants from seed, um, they don't always do what you want. Uh, I like to say that native seeds are skeptical. They're uh, trained to not believe that it's a good year, so they don't germinate at the drop of, a, of water. And the other thing we had to do is to facilitate pollination. Because we want to be really careful about preserving the genetic integrity of these wild populations, we kept them in insect excluding tents, so each population was isolated from one another so that we didn't have any unintentional gene flow, which meant that me and my team put on our little bee suits, armed ourselves with paintbrushes, and hand pollinated thousands of flowers over many years to produce those many hundreds of thousands of seeds. And in this tent, if you look closely in the kind of mid corner, you'll see a mason jar that has a lot of little black bodies in it, and those are flies. Um, we have embraced flies as friends, and they move around the tents, and they are not pollinators in the way that they're looking for nectar or pollen to eat. They're just busybodies, and so they move pollen around incidentally as they flit from plant to plant, and that helps us because when you have a tent, with so many flowers, and then you have a dozen tents that look like this, um, it can be hard to keep up with the pollination. So there are, there are little sidekicks for this. And then again, thinking about that insurance policy against extinction, throughout the course of this project, we brought 137 collections of seeds from both wild and nursery produced plants into our conservation seed bank at the garden. So this is a long-term genetic backup for all of these wild plant populations so that should anything happen in the wild, we can replace them with the seeds that we have. We also, because we were on the island so frequently, we were afforded the opportunity to seed bank four rare island deadly ataxa that had never been seed banked in the history of people seed banking in California. And even though they weren't all the target of this particular project, just by virtue of being out there, we had access to do something like this. So we had reached beyond just our target species. And we did bring, as I mentioned, some plants into the garden's living collection for long-term conservation that way. And then next steps for this work, as everyone's mentioned, you're never done, you keep doing it. We all have great job security in that way. Um, we recently, as a collaborative group, put together a new proposal looking at two species that we feel like are on the brink of recovery. Catherine just mentioned the Santa Cruz Island bushmallow and the Hoffman's rockcress, which we found so many more plants of on Santa Cruz Island. And then we also have a suite of plants that we worked on from this study and all agreed that they're really in need of emergency help here for their recovery, and that's the island barberry, the island malacothrix, the Santa Cruz island malacothrix, and the island phacelia. So we've put in a new proposal to keep working on these plants and use different strategies to help push them over the finish line. And then, of course, we'll continue to work with our partners across the archipelago. And now, I think I have a moment to give you a bonus 15th plant. Um, this is the Santa Cruz Island Rockcrest, Sabara filifolia. This is a diminutive, depending on the year and how much rain we got, diminutive annual wildflower in the mustard family. This is a federally endangered plant. And for the last year, we're now in year two of this project, we've been working with a slew of partners shown um, on this slide to conduct extensive surveys across Catalina Island for this plant. Um, it was originally described from Santa Cruz Island, but hasn't been seen there in almost 100 years. 
and right now it's known to occur on Catalina and San Clemente Island. So we worked with our partners at Urban Wildlands Group to create a habitat suitability model, and it won't go through the details, but the basic idea is to take what we know about where the plant grows and then use that to extrapolate to where we think it might be able to grow across the island. And if you look at this map, all of those pink squiggles are tracks of where people on our team have done ground surveys for Sabarophilofolia. The green triangles are places where we found Sabara in um, 2020, what year is it, guys? 2022? <laughs> I'm like, when was last year? Um, and those orange circles are historically known locations for Sabara. So you'll see that there are a few places where it had been seen previously where we didn't find it last year. But this year, we've started our surveys again, starting in early 2023, um, early February, and we were looking for this. So lest, lest you think my job is all fun and not hard, uh, we were looking for teeny tiny little Sabara seedlings. But some of them were about an inch tall, so I can't complain too much. Um, but the good news is with the rainfall this year, we're seeing an order of magnitude more plants than we did last year, which is really encouraging. And we also found plants in some of those orange circles where we didn't see them last year. And so this is sort of exemplary of why we need these long-term multi-year projects is because things change from year to year. The precipitation's different and the plants respond accordingly. So this work is ongoing with our partners and a lot of it is in the service of thinking about how and when to try to reintroduce this plant to Santa Cruz Island. Um, and that's all I have for you. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, so the question was, uh, when she talked about doing genetics on the plants, she wanted to find out if it was on multiple islands. Yeah, so the, um, the Island Rush Rose genetic project was done by um, two of my collaborators at the Botanic Garden and the Genetics Lab, and we knew it occurred on all three islands, but what we wanted to know was how they were related to each other, and what their um, study showed is that the plants on Catalina Island are very genetically unique compared to the plants on Santa Cruz and Santa Rosa. And that makes intuitive sense because, especially when you're on the west end of Santa Cruz, you feel like you could swim, somebody can swim, not me, to Santa Rosa Island. Um, but those two islands, the plants are pretty closely related. And the way that we can use that information is that if, for example, something happened to the plants on Santa Rosa Island, we could feel pretty comfortable moving seeds from Santa Cruz to Santa Rosa. But usually, in the spirit of keeping all the pieces, we also try to keep all the unique genetics. Um, so we would be less likely to take seeds from Catalina and bring them up to Santa Rosa, for example. So thank you. I think we have time for one more. Oh, we have time for one more. <laughs> you want to field it? One more question. If they yes, John. <laughs> What would I say is the greatest threat to all these plants? I think that the greatest threat to all these plants is not putting enough resources toward helping them. <laughs> that's, that's my honest answer. <laughs> All right, thanks, Heather. Um, so this next speaker, I have a soft spot for, this is John Knapp. He's the senior island scientist for the Nature Conservancy and the founder of the Catalina Island Conservancy's Catalina Habitat Improvement and Restoration Program, or CHIRP. John's island conservation exploits are legendary, but something less appreciated is just how hard he works to bring the different island conservationists together as an archipelago to amplify our effectiveness. He is great at bringing people together. 
He'll describe his landscape level approach to invasive plant eradication efforts on Catalina and Santa Cruz Island, as well as the Argentine ant eradication and rare plant recovery efforts on Santa Cruz Island. So I just want to make a, a little amendment to Denise's statement. Uh, I co-developed it with Peter Schuyler, uh, Chirp. So Peter was actually the one who coined uh, uh, birds chirp and we're um, trying to restore the island. So that's kind of how that came about. It's so great to be here. I, I'm looking at all these faces and I just don't see great people. I see legacies. Legacies that I've read in scientific journals, um, legacies I've heard about over uh, a cold beverage, um, legacies I've learned from volunteering for some of your projects. So I'm, I'm really honored to be here. And I, and I wanted to share a little anecdote. Uh, part of my education, I was homeschooled, and I lived in rural Riverside County. And my dad uh, made me do a book report on a magazine article about Tiger Woods and his father. And the story was about Tiger Woods' father not letting him play with anyone that was not better than him. And that, that always resonated with me. And so I have my whole life tried to surround myself with people that are better than me. And I look out here and I'm, I, I'm in the right place. And, and the speakers, the honorees, I'm in the right place. There's someone else I want to acknowledge who's no longer with us. And that is Norman McDonald. You might know him from Pro Hunt or our native range. Norm was, uh, I stole what I could from Norm and implemented it in the work that I do. And Norm was this, this unique character. He was a little bit of Buddy Hackett. He was a little bit of Norman Schwarzkopf and a little bit of George Clooney. And so only those people that have seen him in various environments would have seen those different elements of Norm. But, he, he was an amazing man. I wouldn't say I was close with him at all, but I learned a lot. And so I just want to acknowledge he's another great conservation hero. So today I'll be talking to you about mainly Santa Cruz Island. I work for the Nature Conservancy, and we own and manage 76% of the island. Uh, it's the ancestral uh, lands of the Shumash, and they call it Limwu, which means from the ocean or the mountain in the sea. Um, I'll be sharing three projects today. I'm going to be very cursory in, in, um, in describing them, so there might be a lot of questions. I've already heard some questions about ants, so uh, happy you know, we can get into it uh, during the panel discussion. So as, as you have heard from the other speakers, the introduced vertebrates and even one uh, invertebrate has been removed uh, from Santa Cruz Island. So all the mainland introduced vertebrates are now gone. And the dust has begun to settle. And the land has begun to heal from the impacts of those animals. They're trailing, they're, they're turning the soil. And during that time, we were able to uh, avoid a catastrophe. And I know many of you know this story, and it's a story for another day. Today, we are talking about plants. <laughs> and I'm sure you're all aware of uh, or familiar with uh, the nursery rhyme of Humpty Dumpty and how he had a great fall, and all the king's horses and king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Well, Santa Cruz is very much like the story of Humpty Dumpty. Santa Cruz was shattered, but unlike that nursery rhyme, we are putting Santa Cruz back together again. But when I was in Mrs. Schellenberger's third grade class, when this photo was taken of Santa Cruz, this is when the Nature Conservancy got the conservation easement and partial ownership of the island. It's, it's hard for me to, to think that the island looked like this. I mean, it, it looks like a nuclear uh, bomb has gone off. In the next two slides I'll show you, uh, is very similar to some of the other slides that others have shown, that this red line illustrates a fence line on the island where sheep were present on the left, or on the right, and sheep were excluded from the left. So you could see just a little bit of exclusion for a little bit of time of how much change can happen. 
seeing this, seeing the recovery, it, it really gives me hope in the power of nature, in the po of how nature can rebound. I, I think we saw that with COVID, right? As we as humans stayed in our little houses, nature was able to, uh, to get a breath. I wish I would have taken this photograph and uh, turned it black and white, because if I did, it would probably look like the moon. This is a photo of a site that was shown in many photos. Uh, Ralph Hoffman, who died for rare plants on the Channel Islands in the 1930s, collected a rare plant off this cliff. He ended up dying on, on San Miguel Island. But other than those cliff faces, these plants were eliminated off the island, and we had uh, virtually a, a clean slate. So the Nature Conservancy and the National Park Service, who co own and manage Santa Cruz Island, started to see that there was an arms race before us. There was native plants and invasive plants. Who's gonna get to that, that space that the uh, sheep created and the cattle created? This graph here is, is just showing you the trends in uh, what was happening with the vegetation over time. So the sheep and cattle, as Peter talked about, were removed in the, in the 80s, late 80s. And you could see both native and invasive vegetation started to, to really get a foothold and started to occupy the land. The green line being native vegetation, the red line being invasive. And then we had the 91, 92 El Nino. And it was like giving the island a shot of adrenaline. And that seed bank got triggered and more plants started to expand, and we started getting more vegetation recovery, as well as more invasives, as Peter pointed out in his talk with fennel. And then pigs were removed around 2006. So let's look at the interior of the island, some of the recovery. This is uh, Dr. Dirk Van Vuren's uh, repeat photo monitoring. Peter has uh, his own route on the island and coming out again to, to retake those photos. But this is some of Dirk's work just showing how much the vegetation is changing. And that's, everything you see is native and oftentimes endemic. This is uh, another series, uh, a 45 year series from 1972. So it predates the Nature Conservancy uh, above. And then Wildlands Conservation Science retook these photos for us in 2017. And so you could just see how much area was denuded of vegetation and how much has recovered. But again, we have this arms race. And the fennel, this is a map of fennel on the island. To give you some perspective, this is 3.8 Santa Barbara's of fennel on Santa Cruz Island. It's not, it's not all dense, but there is fennel in this entire polygon. So Peter talked about like tinkering with, with some kind of mechanics. And I like to think about it as a puzzle. So, you know, my dad's a little wacky guy. He, you know, pulls me out of school to homeschool me. He also loves going to thrift shops and going to garage sales. And he'd always bring home these, these puzzles for us to, to play with. And oftentimes, the puzzle would have pieces from other puzzles in it. And that's how I see how the island. The island is like a puzzle. Each piece is a different species, and a non-native plant or animal is a puzzle piece from a different puzzle. They just don't belong. You know, sometimes you can force them in there, but they just don't fit quite right. So this is that same graph, but looking further into time. And you can see with pig removal, vegetation again is going upward. Recovery is going upward. But then we implemented uh, a comprehensive uh, invasive plant program. And we are uh, um, reversing that trend in invasive plants to, uh, to become lower. So, sorry. So, um, wanted to give you a little bit of thinking and thought that, go, that went into our invasive plant program. We basically, there's these people that know the islands well. So we assessed, got their information, got expert opinion about what are the worst threats. Then we looked at the scientific literature. Then we took what we knew of the flora 
and from there narrowed it down to which species are invasive. So we didn't, we, uh, not all non-native species are harmful. And so we only focused on those that posed a risk to uh, the ecosystem and, and species survival. So then we surveyed uh, for those 55 species, and we got their distribution and abundance, knowing their invasiveness. And from there, we narrowed that down to 28 that we could target for eradication. So in, in uh, 2008, we began treatment of half of those. And then by 2010, we were treating the, the remaining 14 on that list. So you might have a hard time seeing the, the text in this slide, but this is a time frame of our major projects that were led by the Nature Conservancy. And it doesn't really matter what the projects are, so if you can't read it, don't, don't worry. But what I'd like to bring your attention to is what's going on here. You see that there was major project, long time frame, major project, long time frame, and so on. But then there's all these projects that start, start happening. What changed? Well, you might want to say it's the norm effect, that we took and learned from the feral pig removal project and applied that to plants. And so a helicopter is a tool that's used often in conservation, but it's how we used it. We used it very differently than most people use helicopters. We basically cut out the access time, and that allowed us to do the same work that you would do on the ground. We could do it 12 times faster. So a month equals a year's worth of work, and we could do it for half the cost. Right? You're sending two people out, buddy system safety, and instead of trudging through vegetation like you could see on the, on the right photo. Gear, you don't have to be weighted down with gear. You need a machete, you just call in the helicopter and the hel helicopter brings in a machete. More weed workers have uh, incidences with broken legs, sprained ankles, um, heat exhaustion because they're weighted down with gear that they might need. We're alert, we're fresh, we can see you know, we're, we're, we're still looking for plants instead of trying to catch our breath. Places that you would think would be inaccessible for a helicopter to drop someone off could be dropped off with a helicopter. So here is an applicator who's treating pampas grass, um, and a helicopter put that person there. There's a rock outcrop. It was safe, but it gives you a sense of where you can go. For those places you can't go, we experimented with paintball guns, filled with paintballs that had herbicide in the, in the paintballs. And we could do the same amount of work with that paintball gun uh, in four hours that it took us four days by dropping people off with the helicopter. So we're always looking for efficiencies. And that's because conservation dollars are so limited. We, if, if you're not trying to use those dollars as efficiently as possible, you are, you're hurting the environment because you're wasting money that could go to a really good project. So you always have to be thinking about how to do your project better. So this is one slide that, that really gives me hope. And this is the status of our eradication project as of 2018. It's 2022, we switched methods, so it's a little bit harder to show you in a, in a very kind of um, dashboard framework. But each bar is a species. There's 28 here. If they're black, that means uh, most of the infestations have been uh, controlled to zero density. We still know there's a seed bank possibly there, uh, but over half of these are now gone. So out of the 28, 14 of them are gone. If there's any color, that just is, shows the different age classes of the populations that are left. So out of roughly 1,000 uh, infestations, we only have 100 that are active. So we keep going annually back to these infestations to make sure that nothing has come out of the seed bank. And this is a map that shows you those locations. And obviously you can see where the main ranch is on the island where you know, a lot of unintended uh, introductions have taken place and also at Prisoner's Harbor, uh, the port of entry. So those are the same areas now that we implement biosecurity with our partners at the park to ensure that no new invaders make it to the island. 
So going back to that timeline, taking it another 10 years out, the same projects are ongoing. You'll see the dotted line kind of changes. That's because there's been a change in how we're implementing those projects. Doesn't really matter what they are, but I want to bring your attention to another grouping. We've added more projects. Is that because we added more money to our budget? Maybe a little bit here and there, but it's really because of this. It's because of partnership. This is when we started doing botanical work in partnership with folks like Catherine McKeatron, who held the, the, the baton for rare plants for, for 20 years, and folks at the, that have come through at the park and the legacy of the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. We're now partnering much more fully. We're partnering with our, our, our colleagues and friends down in Mexico. So as we're worried about this arms race with plants, there was a lot of resource managers, scientists that were saying, what are you gonna do about ants? And some people would say, you know, how can ants, well, you know, what's the big deal about ants? How bad can they be? Well, if you take the biomass of all the humans in the world, and you take all the biomass of ants in the world, ants will total 20% of the human biomass in the world. That gives you a sense of how many ants are in the world. Well, Argentine ants, there's a, there's a lot of them. And we have a, a rich ant fauna on the island uh, across all the Channel Islands. And, and Argentine ants displace these native ants that do their ecological service, dispersing seed, caching seed, um, you know, helping churn the soil. But Argentine ants will they'll disrupt the, the, the pollination of many native plants. So you can imagine we see plants in the landscape and you think, oh, that's great. But in each flower is, an Argentine, is, a, is a horde of Argentine ants fighting off pollinators that are coming into that flower. And, and so those plants are setting less seed. And so a study done by uh, Hannah and et al looked at this on the island and, and documented that yes, that basically Argentine ants uh, were inhibiting uh, the pollination and so there was less seed set in, the, in these plants. And this was published in Ecology. The, this is the equivalent of John saying, hey, I'd like to have a chapter in the Bible. So <laughs> having, having you know, a paper in Ecology on something like this is, is big time. So again, we have another one of those puzzle pieces that don't belong, Argentine ants, and we need to remove it. Argentine ants haven't really been effectively eradicated anywhere before this project. There was, I think, one or two very small projects, like under a hectare or something like that. Um, and here, we have this much area. We have four locations on the island where Argentine ants are, are present. If you were to walk in any of these sites and you kicked over a rock, ants would be coming pouring out from a nest. If you walk through fennel, you would be covered in Argentine ants. So as of last year, uh, this is a joint project with the National Park Service, um, with the UC San Diego, David Hallway, um, other folks, and implemented by uh, the California Institute for Environmental Studies, CIS. We had one small nest left, and so we treated that, and as of uh, this past October, we assessed that site and didn't find any ants. That doesn't mean they're not there. Uh, and we have uh, a road to go uh, to monitor these sites. Um, but we don't know of any other ants that are on island, which is, which is pretty amazing. And that, in the, the way that we were able to do that is very similar to how we use the helicopter. We took something that was readily on the shelf at Home Depot and found a different use for it. So my predecessor uh, was a botanist, and she would take these polymers, these small granular polymers, and you put them, you mix them with your soil, and they become imbibed with water, and then they slowly release that water. Well, we needed a delivery system. You can imagine you know, having foxes and birds and ravens. They're going to be getting into whatever you're going to put out on the landscape. But this method, uh, there was an attractant. We used sucrose. And then we used an insecticide that was watered down so the workers could take that 
pesticide um, to the queens in the nest. And then, um, and then by the time they know it and they're starting to feel the, the ills of the insecticide, um, it's too late. So you have to get the queens and you have to treat long enough so that any eggs that are in the nest, when they emerge, that they also have uh, bait that's uh, at the ready. So to, you know, it, it's hard to document. So, uh, you know, you, you have people in the landscape doing uh, surveys of the vegetation. You have, um, you know, putting out attractants to try to attract ants to see if they're there. And one method we tried was a dog that was trained to detect Argentine ants. And this dog uh, suffered from depression because it couldn't find any Argentine ants, right? They, they, get, they get rewarded when they find their target and they couldn't find their target. So they had to bring out Argentine ants in a safe container and hide it so that the, the dog could at least get a couple pets. <laughs> so this is uh, Dr. David Hallway's work where, you know, we're lucky to have a partner like David because he started doing his monitoring before the project was implemented. And then he's been monitoring while the project is going on, and then he's documenting the recovery. So this slide shows you have your control is the blue line, and you see the richness of, of, of uh, native ants. And then the red line is treatment, uh, um, treatment plots. And then you can see that once treatment had stopped, native ant uh, richness had increased again. So even though we're using insecticide that kills ants, typically Argentine ants exclude native ants where they're at, but any ants that were there would be killed uh, by the control method, but shortly thereafter, their richness uh, pops back up. So another project I'd like to talk about, so we have these competing threats, right? We have invasives, we have those puzzle pieces we need to remove out of the puzzle, but now we're missing some puzzle pieces, and so we want to put them back. This is 16 plant taxa that used to be on Santa Cruz. Uh, Peter had that uh, article by, uh, or, or maybe it was Denise, by Dr. Thorne, who, who um, identified the 32 species that have been lost from Catalina. These are species that we just have not seen maybe since the 1880s, maybe as late as the uh, 1930s. And so we know a system that, is, that has native biodiversity is more resilient. We have climate change, snow on the mountains, you know. Things are changing. We need to make our islands climate ready. And so having that diversity, having that redundancy in the landscape, they might be little annuals, but we know annuals can be profusely abundant on the landscape. Annuals are very important. That we need that to have that redundancy, that biodiversity that's gonna make the islands more resilient. So here's one that is gone, we think is extinct. It's a little annual monkey flower, the Santa Cruz Island monkey flower found nowhere else in the world except on herbarium sheets. A project that uh, Heather and Kevin and the audience here and myself have been talking about is sometimes these herbarium sheets have seed on them. Maybe there's an opportunity to harvest seed that could be 100, 150 years old, who knows if it's viable, to potentially reintroduce it back to the islands. And here is the Cybara, named from specimens collected on Santa Cruz that is believed extirpated. We've been looking eight years. There's been other work done by other researchers, but we feel confident that either these species are in such low abundance that they really need a helping hand, or uh, they're gone. And so right now, what we're doing is evaluating. We can't do it all, right? Like, we're the biggest uh, conservation NGO in the world, the Nature Conservancy. We have the U.S. Navy, you know, and, and the Park Service. The three of us cannot do this work alone. And so we have to be very careful. We have to be, uh, you know, that goes back to Peter's talk, being very, have a vision, be very deliberate, but also... You know, uh, we have to be smart about what we, we spend our, our funds on. And so, so right now, we're look, uh, our island team is looking at these species and uh, running them through a, a, a decision process to see which ones 
um, will get the biggest bang for the buck if we were to reintroduce them. So what I'd like you to do is think about this conference 20 years from now. What's it going to look like? What stories would be told? This is uh, San Miguel Island. It's a cliff face, right? The donkeys, the sheep, or, uh, the horses, all the cattle that Denise talked about that Nidever introduced, they couldn't get to these slopes. This is what the islands look like. I mean, it is a botanic garden. So I can imagine when we're here 20 years from now and you, know, you pull me out of the woodwork and Heather out of the woodwork, that we're going to be able to tell you more about how these islands recovered and show you even more prettier images than this. So lastly, I just want to thank all the TNC staff. There's just too many to name that have made these projects possible. And we are lucky that we have such great partners. These folks are intimate on each one of these three projects that I work with. They're, you know, they're just the best. They're, they're those people that are making me rise to the occasion. So I just want to, again, acknowledge David for his contribution to this uh, pr uh, pr presentation and Morgan Ball. As you saw, most of the photos were, were Morgan. So he's a great photographer a great thinker in conservation. So thank you to our partners. We'll take one burning question. We don't have to. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> What was the agent that you used to take out the Argentinian? The, the name is escaping me. Uh, if, so if Laura or David can, uh, yeah, David. Oh, I don't know if I want to repeat that. Thi thiamethoxan? It's a neonicotinoid pesticide. Right on. <laughs> All right. Um, save it and write it on a, a card. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. All right. Thanks, John. Um, so we have a break uh, now until 2.20. So I'll see you in 12 minutes.
Okay, here we're on. Um, here we go. So the next speaker is Kim O'Connor, who became Conservation Program Manager for the U.S. Navy's Pacific Fleet after serving as the Botany Program Manager on San Clemé Island. So I haven't had the opportunity to interact with Kim until, until this, um, but I know several people who have worked for her, and they speak so highly of her. They obviously have a ton of respect and admiration, and now I can see why. Um, so really excited to have her here. She'll tell us about the natural recovery on that island after the removal of feral goats, the extensive rare plant recovery, and habitat restoration efforts that are now leading to the delisting of four endangered plants. Welcome, Kim. All right, um, disclaimer here, I have long COVID, so I'm gonna to try to keep my mask on. Can everyone hear me? Okay, and another one is I um, came here from San Diego yesterday. Um, I was probably exactly one mile behind every hydroplane wrecked vehicle northbound from Los Angeles. So I am not at the top of my game today and I'm probably gonna be relying on my notes more than most of the other speakers have. So bear with me. Okay, so... Um, the San Clemente Island delisting. So four plant species and one um, bird species were delisted, um, removed from the federal endangered species list um, in January of 2023. So this is a, you know, a major, major recovery story. Um, so all of these species are island endemic, San Clemente Island endemics. And um, you'll see on this, these slides that sometimes I abbreviate SCI. I know we're not the only SCI, but in this brief, SCI means San Clemente Island. Um, I'll spell out any other, <laughs> other of the islands um, when, if I ever, you know, I'm referring to them. So um, for the species, I, don't, I won't go through them in great detail, but we have one passerine bird. That's the San Clemente Bell Sparrow. We have four shrub species. Um, we have the um, Castilea grisia, so San Clemente Island paintbrush, which is a hemiparasitic plant. Um, we have the San Clemente Island lotus. Um, it's an early successional um, species, also a shrub. And we have the um, Malacothamnus clementinus or the San Clemente Island bush mallow, which is largely um, clonal. And then we have a perennial um, forb, which is the San Clemente Island larkspur. So um, let's see. Um, so this is the largest group delisting in the history, the 50 year history of the Endangered Species Act um, due to recovery. So it's, it's a really you know, amazing accomplishment. And it was achieved on one of the most heavily used and strategically significant of the DOD training ranges with one of the highest concentrations of listed species. And you know, why is this important? You know, for me, I feel like it's important. It's a success for the Navy. It's a success for the Fish and Wildlife Service. It's definitely a success for the species but it's also a success for the Endangered Species Act because for the Endangered Species Act to serve its goals, we must be able to recover species on, in areas that are heavily used with multiple uses overlay, not just in areas set aside for conservation. So a little bit about the history and geography of San Clemente Island. You'll see the geography, so I've only put up some history photos. So, um, because San Clemente Island is, you know, one of the least visited of the Channel Islands, it's not accessible by the public since it's, you know, um, totally military owned and controlled. Um, it's the southernmost of the San Clemente, of, of the California Channel Islands. It's 68 mile, nautical miles northwest of San Diego, 37,000 acres, 21 miles long by one and a half to four miles wide. Um, has a series of west facing marine terraces. Um, a central plateau that's largely grassland, and then it has a precipitous eastern escarpment that drops from about 2,000 feet down to sea level and you know, sometimes 100% slopes. So the history, um, it's been occupied, human occupation um, goes back to at least 8,000 years, and that's based on radiocarbon dating. Um, habitation was intermittent. Um, there isn't a constant source of water, a year-round source of water on the island, so use was intermittent and it was um, largely abandoned by the native peoples by the 1800s. Um, it was the Gabrielinos who were on the island, that's the tribe that was affiliated with the island. In 1769, um, the Spanish arrived, and then after that, things you know, kind of went downhill from a natural resources perspective with um, introduction of goats, and we don't have an exact date for that. There were some stories that goats were introduced by the early uh, mariners, but we haven't found real evidence of that on the island. So it looks like on the island um, they were brought 
over, and I'll talk about that a little more on the next slide, in the early 1800s. Then we had a period of sheep ranching from 1850 to, 1830, um, to 1934. And uh, you can see the slide there, that's 1933. There were 20,000 sheep on the island at one time. And then in 1934, jurisdiction transferred to Department of Defense. So um, San Clemente Island Natural Resources. So it's a very diverse vegetation types. We have grasslands, scrublands, uh, woodlands, dune. You can see there there's island oak, um, uh, woodland um, in the upper left. And then that central photo, um, that's all Opuntia littoralis, so prickly pear. And that circle is a person. Um, that's someone from our body crew. So um, it, it has a lot of affinities with Baja California, um, with the vegetation. And um, it has the highest level of endemism, of botanical endemism of the Channel Islands. So um, we are in the process of finalizing a species list, a plant species list, um, for the island, we have about 529 species on that list. I just counted that last night. Um, based on previous data, though, we had about 66% of the plants on the island were native. Um, there were at least 20 um, Channel Island endemics, and uh, seven, uh, at least 17 of those are San Clemente Island endemics. And those numbers are fluctuating because of the, the new list, so I have to get that updated. We also have two, um, so we have two federally listed species left. Um, on the island plants um, after this delisting, and we have three state-listed species. We have 23 CNPS um, 1B species, so plants considered rare um, or endangered in California and elsewhere by the California Native Plant Society. Two federally listed avian species. Um, we have um, over 350 um, avian species recorded. Um, we have the state-listed San Clemente Island fox. It was never federally listed on San Clemente Island because we manage it under a candidate conservation agreement with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, we have the island night lizard, which was delisted in 2014. And San Clemente Island supports 90% of the range-wide population for island night lizard. Um, let's see, next slide. So goats, I'll spend time on goats because they are really the biggest destructive factor that was ever unleashed on the island. Um, the origins are uncertain. They were thought to be mission goats that were brought to Catalina with, um, the sh by the sheep ranchers and then brought to San Clemente Island. Um, by the 1970s, the population was about 15,000, and they wrought, wrought havoc on the island. I mean, they destroyed the vegetation, denuded um, the land, and were left down to mineral soils in some areas. Um, and their impacts led to the listing. It was the primary factor behind the listing of seven San Clemente Island species in 1977. So the species that were delisted um, recently, plus um, the island night lizard and um, the San Clemente loggerhead shrike were listed in 1977. And then um, by 1981, there were additional 24 plant and five wildlife species that were considered for listing. And in 1997, there were two additional San Clemente Island species, both plants that were listed. So the goats were the factor behind you know, driving all of those listings. Um, between 1972 and um, 1989, the Navy removed about uh, 29,000 goats. So why did we remove more goats than there were in the 70s? Because anytime there's a delay in the project, the goat population's rebounded. Um, so as was mentioned previously by other speakers, it's really important when you have an eradication program to stick with it, to be able to stick with it. Some of those delays um, were you know, not the fault of the Navy, but just you know, process and, and lawsuits and, um, and things like that. But, um, and they used lethal and non-lethal methods. Um, we did use the Judas goat technique in the end when there are very few goats left. Um, you know, we have to, it, it's a lot more effort to track down those last populations. And so successful eradication, 1991, the last of the feral goats was removed from the island. So military land use, I'll go through that because that, that is you know, a factor that separates us from most of the other islands. Um, so it is part of the Southern California Range Complex and it's the last remaining continental US Navy training range supporting simultaneous ship to shore, air to ground and ground troop training, which is really important um, for the Navy. So who trains there? It's the Navy, the Marine Corps, and then we have joint and international forces. Um, there's fixed wing training, there's helicopter training, amphibious landings, it's um, a lot of Navy SEAL training, we have UAV training, and um, RDT&E. 
Um, so with the island, um, it's not all you know, one big concentrated training area. We have some designated training areas where the training is concentrated. And that's shown in the slide on the, or the picture on the right, um, or some of the training areas. So we have two high explosive impact areas um, down at the southern part of the island. And those are two of the, the blue sort of polygons down at the bottom. They comprise 10% of the island. So when you think about San Clemente Island, it's not, you know, it is a bombardment area, but the areas are relatively small. And even that whole area is not a moonscape. You can walk up to the edge of the impact area and you don't know that you're in it. Um, most of the um, impacts are concentrated in um, some target boxes. Then we have 22 training area ranges. Um, they comprise less than 6% of the land area. Um, and that's where Navy Special Warfare trains. And then we have three assault vehicle maneuver areas and less than 3% of the land area for those. And that's where Marines train um, off-road off with their vehicles. And then we have down the center of the island, that blue area, it's infantry operations area, and it's foot traffic only. So, um, and some of those percentages overlap, those areas overlap. So a lot of the island is, is left without um, you know, much um, military training impact or where the impacts are very dispersed. Okay, so natural resources management. Um, this is sort of how do we you know, get there? I mean, the goat removal was one thing, um, but we have a very robust natural resource management program um, on San Clemente Island. We have a $6 million a year annual budget. So this is why when Heather was talking about you know, where they spent the money, they didn't need to spend it on San Clemente Island. We, we have a very robust budget. And um, the program, so we have a botany program. Um, we do seed collection, propagation. Uh, we also do re um, habitat restoration, so site selection, outplanting, maintenance. Um, we do invasive species control. We have vegetation mapping, soil erosion monitoring and control. We have pollinator and vertebrate studies. Then we have a large wildlife program, um, the San Clemente Island loggerhead shrike. Um, we have a captive breeding and rearing and a monitoring program. For that, we also do annual monitoring for San Clemente uh, bell sparrow, um, the island night lizard, seabirds and shorebirds. Then we have a predator management program. We also do wildland fire management. Fire is a factor on San Clemente Island, um, unlike the other you know, channel islands, because we do have active training on the island, so we, we do need to manage that. Um, we install fuel breaks, and then we have a marine program as well. We um, monitor and manage black abalone, white abalone. We have safety zone monitoring, which is um, um, looking at the subtitle areas, and we have rocky intertidal monitoring as well. And most of those are done on an annual basis, so it's a big program, it's a lot of work. So it takes a team, and I, I'm not gonna go through everybody here, but um, we have a collaborator, collaboration with Navy, um, cooperators, and federal partners. And this has really been critical to the success of the program. And I've listed some of the you know, organizations and entities um, that have worked throughout the years. But this list is so much bigger you know, than this. Um, it's, it really does take a team. I'm standing here today. I'm privileged to be the one bringing this you know, to kind of the finish line here. But um, all of these people contributed, or these organizations contributed significantly to the recovery on the island. So you have to show you some numbers. So what does recovery look like? And you know, we have um, some you know, pretty big increases in numbers. So I tried to get the number closest to the time of listing. And when these species were listed, the standards weren't what they are now. They weren't as rigorous. So we don't have great quantitative data from the time of listing. But um, closest to the time of listing, so we have basically we've gone with lotus from about 1,300 individuals to about 21,000 now, so a 16-fold increase. Then with paintbrush, we have about a 48-fold increase. Then the Larkspur, there, was, there were two locations, and one had only one individual, and now we've got about you know, 19,000 of them today. And Bush Mallow, um, you know, we've gone up by 19-fold. So, so these are pretty big increases, and then I would like to point out that on the island, we have some areas where topography makes you know, it pretty inaccessible to really know exactly how many species we have. We also have certain areas we can't go because of safety, like the impact areas. Um, and so these are really under counts. So the recovery is really much um, greater than this. And then for the San Clemente Bell Sparrow, the population went from 38 birds in 1984 to you know, an average of you know, 5,000 
and something between 2013 and 2018. We use those numbers because that's what was used in the delisting, but um, you know those numbers are are still um, accurate today. And the range expanded from about 10,000 um, acres to 33,000 acres. So they originally had been in box thorn habitat, um, and that was their sort of stronghold. And then as their population increased, they expanded into other habitats, and now they occupy um, most of the habitat types on the island. So the delisting process. So um, basically, in, in 2010, the Pacific Legal Foundation petitioned to delist or downlist um, six San Clemente Island species and the, um, the three of the plant species that have been um, delisted now were part of that. And then in 2013, um, the Fish and Wildlife Service reclassified um, lotus and paintbrush as threatened, so they downlisted them, but they didn't do anything with the other species. And I think the Navy was a little bit disappointed that we didn't get the species delisted at that time. Um, but the main point here in, in red is that recovery alone is not enough to delist species. You really have to have documentation and you really need to demonstrate management of the threats. And, and that's what we, you know, we hadn't quite done. So the Navy then started to focus on um, data compilation and, and threats analyses um, and prepared conservation assessments. So these are internal documents where we did our, we compiled all the known information about the species, summarized it, and then we analyzed the threats. And we actually, um, Publish those. Um, so those are those are Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. I'm mean, sorry, um, Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden occasional publications. Um, and then um, in 2018, the Department of Defense and the Department of Interior came up with a recovery and sustainment partnership, which provided a framework to focus on recovery and and delistings, downlistings where warranted. So that really helped prioritize efforts, um, staff from the Navy and from the Fish and Wildlife Service to work on um, documenting and, and assessing whether these species should be delisted. Um, and then between 2018 and 2020, we partnered on the development of species status assessments for five San Clemente Island species. So those were like our conservation assessments, except they took it a step further. They went um, into future forecasting. So looking at modeling, what happens in the future? What if, th if threats increase? What if populations increase over here or decrease, looking at trends and projecting into the future? So um, based on the results um, in May of 2021, the Fish and Wildlife Service proposed to delist all the species, and then they went ahead and with that delisting in uh, 2023. So threats analysis, what's included? So basically, the primary threats on San Clemente Island that were analyzed were military training, fire, soil erosion, uh, invasive species. Um, so, you know, for example, for fire, and that's the one on the right, we, these were heavily GIS, you know, model exercises. We didn't, you know, this wasn't just, before we had, we had kind of done, you know, qualitative analyses, but these were really quantitative. Where is the fire? What's the fire severity? How frequently are, are the fires occurring? Um, are they within the return interval tolerance of the plants? And um, it was, you know, it was a very robust process. Um, and um, I, th I think it was, it was a very collaborative effort in terms of coming up with what to model, how to model, what to look at, how to consider the threats. So the process, so we had a delisting core team. It was US Fish and Wildlife Service with local, regional, and headquarters level, and then Navy, it was myself, and the installation biologists, and then we had a lot of um, coordination up the chain of command. Um, we had a cooperator who was preparing the documents, Texas A&M, and then we had support from our contractors and cooperators. Keys to success. So what was needed here was um, the strong partnerships was really important. And we'd been working together with the service for many years. In fact, with uh, myself and uh, Brian Munson, Melissa Booker, Sandy Visman, who was with the service, collectively we had 85 years of experience on the island. And, and that's really key you know, to, to success. Um, I think the longevity, overlap, expertise, and passion of the staff and partners is, is really important. Um, it's not just the expertise, it's, it's the vision and the passion and, and the tenacity of people. We had also an unbroken chain. So I, I um, basically 
had overlap with Jennifer Stone, the first San Clemente Island botanist. Um, I was also hired by Jan Larson, and he was my supervisor in the beginning. He's the one who was responsible for the goat removal, and spearhead that. And just being able to pass that baton, have the continuity of, of the, um, the knowledge, but also the vision and the motivation. And, and then I think for all of us, it became not just about um, preserving the resources, but also, you know, I felt entrusted by these people with carrying their vision forward. And, and so I felt responsible to the people who came before me for continuing their good work. And, and I think, you know, that's really important. We also did have support from leadership with the Navy and Fish and Wildlife Service. So having a framework to do this in that prioritized it above all of the mundane, you know, tasks that we're normally dealing with every day was really important here. Um, another thing is that the Navy, I think, has a really rigorous review and um, approval process for our programming. So our budgets go through a process and it makes us to think about the future. So I will be programming this year, three years out in the future for the next five years. So it makes me think not about today, what am I doing today, what am I doing tomorrow, but what am I doing you know, eight years from now? And, and it makes you think ahead and I think that's really important. Of course, sufficient program funding is important too and, and we do have that and we're well supported. And I think also the culture of stewardship and this is a, a term coined by Sandy Visman at the Fish and Wildlife Service she said that you know, the Navy really has developed a culture of stewardship here, and I think you know, all of the things I've been talking about with this um, show that, and also we have um, integrative natural resource management plans where all of our projects are incorporated in that, and, and really I, I do believe that, that that's a deserved term that she, that she uh, used for us. Um, so, you know, and I guess I would like to just encourage people. So, you know, when you're comprising a team, you know, you do have to look at who's on the team. It's not just expertise, but it is the vision, it is the passion, it is the tenacity, it is the spark. And when you're hiring for natural resources professionals, look for the same thing. And I think the next speaker will be an embodiment of that <laughs> as well, <laughs> Bill Hoyer. Um, so next step. So, you know, the species are recovered, but it's not over yet. So the Navy has further commitments. So we have a nine-year post-delisting monitoring um, plan that we are um, implementing um, in coordination with the Fish and Wildlife Service. We, we're in the process of finalizing a Bell Sparrow management plan, which will become part of, um, will be implemented under a conservation agreement that we have with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, the goat removal was key in the recovery of the species. Apart from the goat removal, um, most of our projects that have benefited these species have been island-wide ecosystem level projects. So we are going to continue those as well, um, and that will be covered under the conservation agreement, as well as um, analyzing impacts to species under the National Vi Environmental Policy Act and doing avoidance and minimization measures. Um, the delisting, so you might think, well, we're still going to spend all this money, we're still going to do all this stuff. How does the delisting help us? But it, it helps us by freeing up staff time and, and consultations with the service when you have an impact or potential impact take up a lot of time. It's 135 days from when you start to when you finish for a formal consultation. And we won't have to do that anymore. Um, you know, we're building that into our conservation agreement um, that will have the, some of the same protective measures that would have come out of consultations. And it does allow us to focus on other species that require our attention. So um, others have mentioned the Santa Cruz Island Rock Crest uh, project. We're involved in that. Um, it's a recovery partnership with Fish and Wildlife Service and other land managers. We're very eager to free up some of our time to really focus on that. We also have the San Clemente Island Woodland Star, um, the um, conservation assessment and management plan. So we're going to go through and develop another internal conservation assessment for that. This one is um, going to be more action oriented. We're, you know, we, we are not going to be able to conclude that, oh yes, you know, this is recovered, but it'll help guide our management and we expect to do more outplanting and things like that to secure that species future. And um, we'll also be able to focus more on San Clemente loggerhead shrike, um, which does need some more focused attention. These are species that didn't just automatically start to recover after the goats were removed. They need more help. Oops, I'm sorry, I, that's my long COVID here. I didn't get to that next step slide, so I'll give you a moment to look at that. Um, all right. And so, you know, the recovery isn't done, it's still happening, and this is really exciting. So for example, we um, 
rediscovered on the island, uh, the um, island poppy, um, the island tree poppy in 2021 after, and this was after a fire. So we had a fire that burned the Eastern Escarpment. I was saying fire can be a good thing. It's, it's generally beneficial actually on the island um, with the severity of fire we have and the frequency. And lo and behold, species that we hadn't, hadn't been seen for, you know, probably since the beginning of the 1900s, um, now we have three, um, you know, three island tree poppies um, and we're pollinating them. We're gonna tr try to manage those for recovery. And there's also a brand new discovery, a new species described, and this is the San Clemente Island dune cryptantha. This is by um, Mike Simpson and John Redman. Um, it you know, was found in 2019 and recently published. So, so these things are happening on the island you know, even today, and, and this is really encouraging for all of us. And so I guess you know, in closing, I mean, because we're playing the long game here in conservation biology, um, you know, I think you can see, um, you know, from the other stories. And I'd just like to inspire everyone, you know, natural resources professionals, volunteers, you know, students, donors, who are toiling away on species that facing seemingly insurmountable threats, you know, to the point where maintenance vice recovery may be the only thing that you think you can achieve for the foreseeable future. So the first Navy botanist on San Clemente Island, Jennifer Stone, she probably felt that way when she was protecting the last you know, remaining larkspur plants within fenced goat exclosures. But look at where that got us today. And you know, I really hope that Jennifer is smiling down upon us today, happy at our success. You know, so I'd just like to say, like, you, know, you, you might be, wherever you are in the, in the sort of you know, passing of the baton, the relay race you know, that conservation biology is, you know, if you're, if you're at the beginning and, and you can't really see the finish line, go for it. Someone's going to pick up the baton and carry it the, the next way. If you're lucky enough to be at the end of that relay race, you know, carrying the baton across the finish line, don't forget about the people who came before you because really it's the early efforts that I think were the most pivotal in the success. It's, it's easy to be the last leg. I think it's hard, hard to be the first. Thank you, Kim. Thanks so much. I think to keep on track, we're going to skip questions for now. Um, bookmark them for, for later. Okay. So next up is Bill Hoyer. He's the Natural Resources Manager for the U.S. Navy on San Nicolas Island. Um, Bill is a great all-around naturalist. His enthusiasm is infectious, and I think that Bill could probably sell a bridge in a desert. <laughs> so you're about to see that now. Um, he's going to tell us about um, the multifaceted and highly collaborative feral cat removal efforts on that island and the subsequent recovery and delisting of the rare island night lizard and the extensive habitat restoration efforts that he's leading to curb erosion and regain biodiversity for resilience into the future. Welcome. Thank you, Denise. Before I start, I'd like to say, uh, I, man, was it 2010 when I started in the Navy, I think? I was uh, uh, Kim's, uh, she was my mentor, and uh, so I learned a lot from her. So. Really cool. Okay, so uh, restoring the ecology of San Nicolas Island. Uh, you can see uh, 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 the island's pretty flat. On the north side, we have a, a, a shallow escarpment. On the south side, there's quite a steep one. It goes up to about 900 feet. Uh, the Navy's been here since the 40s. Uh, prior to that, it was ranching, and then prior to that, Native American uh, uh, civilization on the island who are still uh, associated with the island to this day. Um, the island is home to several endemic species. Uh, we have a lot of, a ton of snails, plants, lizard, uh, fox, lichen, and insects. Yep, oh, sorry, there we go. And uh, before I get started, I kind of want to talk about, you know, why we do what we do. Uh, it's nice to go into conservation and say, I want to, you know, grow the plants. Uh, but we do this because there's a lot of federal laws out there, so it's good to remind ourselves, you know, how, how my job is possible in the Navy, right? 
and as you can see here, we have a uh, sea lion, a California sea lion, uh, under a closed beach sign for the Marine Mammal uh, Protection Act. So uh, we, uh, we've talked a lot about the Endangered Species Act, Clean Water Act, Noxious Weeds Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act, uh, Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Uh, and you all might be familiar with those, but the Sykes Act is really one that uh, revolves around DOD, and that allows us uh, to have my job, really, and to have an integrated natural resource management plan, and that allows us to have this long-term vision for restoration and an ecosystem-level effect, whereas a lot of those other laws uh, are taxa-specific. Uh, the Sykes Act is really uh, one that overlooks, you know, looks at the general and supports activities to look at the entire ecology of the land. Uh, and of course, NEPA. Um, so uh, I do stand on the shoulders uh, in a, an unbroken chain for about 50 years of natural resource managers on San Nicolas Island. Before this talk, I had never actually bothered to kind of put it together. This isn't written down anywhere, so I had to kind of call retirees to figure out who was there. Uh, <laughs> And uh, it's very interesting, and you can see Ron Dow started this, and in the 70s, you know, that's when all the environmental laws came in. So we, uh, you know, all of a sudden we had to start complying with things. And uh, I'm lucky enough to have uh, uh, taken the baton from Grace Smith, and also to have three years of overlap with her is pretty unusual in federal government, and that was, I was very, very lucky to have that. Um, and whereas when Ron started in the first, he was by himself, I have an entire team that works with me, so I'm not the only person. You can see everyone in the bottom right there. So the first removal of a non-native uh, animal I'm going to discuss is the removal of sheep. Now, this wasn't done for environmental reasons, but rather because the Navy was taking control over the island from uh, uh, the ranchers that were there at the time. Uh, so the sheep were valuable, and they were taken off as property. Uh, and the, the photo's a little granular. Uh, but uh, uh, this kind of set off Nick as one of the first islands to have a large ungulate removed from it. And as I'll show you later, I really benefited from that uh, because the vegetation's had 80 years uh, when I showed up, 70 years to recover prior. Um, and I, I have a quote here uh, from Blanche Trask. San Nicholas is indeed a dying land. In all its length was found but one shrub seven feet high, and in three or four localities, let those signies grow from four to six feet high. And that was 1900. Imagine another 40 years of overgrazing on that island prior to the Navy getting it. Uh, it's pretty much rock and sand by the time uh, we took over. You can see in the bottom right there, there's a photo that actually shows the same area, uh, and it's covered in leptosiney. Uh, in 2010, uh, uh, cats were removed, feral cats. Uh, there's a lot of cool facts about this. We were one of the largest islands to have it removed without a toxicant. Uh, having island fox on an island is cool, except when you're trying to control an animal of uh, similar size and uh, food interest. Uh, partnership between the Navy, the Humane Society of the United States, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. This was also funded by uh, the legal settlement, settlement uh, due to the DDT uh, pollution that was mentioned earlier. Uh, it took a long time. Planning takes a long time for these activities, uh, and removal was relatively quick. 65 cats were removed uh, and have been rehomed in a cat sanctuary in Ramona uh, near San Diego. And I'd like to call out some key local people, uh, Grace Smith, my predecessor, and Annie Little right there uh, that spearheaded this. So. Uh, we did discuss a little bit about why you would remove feral cats, but I'll just repeat, uh, they eat ground nesting seabirds, uh, such as this uh, western gall uh, chick and its sibling, which is just coming out of the egg there. And you can see on the right, uh, a uh, island fox uh, eating an island night lizard. Uh, so the island foxes do eat the island night lizards, but they're also in competition, uh, they were in competition rather with the cat, and the ca because the cat was also eating the island night lizard. So you see both depredation on ground nesting seabirds and uh, competition with the fox as well as eating night lizards. Uh, Post-cat removal, uh, well, first and foremost, we had uh, the island night lizard delisted, and I'll talk more about that later. But 
As Kim said, it demonstrates that the law works. That's very important for federal agencies, especially when I'm asking for funding because I have a listed species and I'm like, give me all this money so I can recover it. If something never, if nothing ever comes off the list when the population does recover, that would be a problem that would undermine our ability to ask for funding. So uh, it's very important that they do come off when appropriate. Uh, the average lifespan of our cute little endemic deer mouse was increased once the cats were removed. And uh, several ground nesting seabird firsts have happened since then. We do have Plagic cormorant nests, Hearman's gulls nests, uh, Caspian tern nests, and uh, although they might have been there prior to the uh, uh, removal of the feral cats, ashy storm petrel populations. And really this frees up time and money to look at everything else, such as uh, the island night lizard. So here's a little, a little bio for you. Uh, poor little guy was eaten by, you know, feral cats. Uh, they live very long, up 35 years plus. They give birth to live young. They spend most of their time in a small area, and uh, they even go veggie when they get older. Uh, here's our delisting timeline. So as it was mentioned before, delisted, or sorry, listed in 1977, uh, but the threats were cats and habitat for the most part. Uh, in 2010, the cats were removed, and then to make sure that we never got another cat, or at least if we did, we can control it, we did get uh, uh, the San Nicolas Island Biosecurity Plan was implemented prior to my arrival to the island even. So we've had a, a pretty long uh, history of biosecurity uh, on San Nick. Uh, the uh, delisting monitoring plan was drafted, and in 2014 it was delisted, but what not many people have talked about yet is once it's de once these species are delisted, that's not the end of the game. Uh, you have another, at least in this case, 10 or so years of monitoring and making sure that the population doesn't dip after the fact or else they'll, you know, wave the specter of it coming back on the list. So uh, a lot of what you're going to see next is uh, what we did to keep it off the list uh, uh, or from going back and meeting our delisting requirements. So what needs to be restored? There are winners. Uh, in the plant world, such as this beautiful field of leptocyanine, definitely not what uh, Blanche Trask saw, but this is in a sandy area on the northwest side of the island. Uh, a lot of the island looks like this, non-native grassy lands, and as Catherine said, uh, or I realized after she said, uh, this is mostly clay soil, actually, where, uh, where these non-native grasslands are not recovering. And this has been 80 years, and it's not coming back by itself. So active restoration, uh, such as these volunteers here from CIR are uh, putting in uh, uh, habitat for the island night lizard, and that's Santa Barbara Island in the background there. Uh, the island night lizard lights cacti and boxthorn, and here's an example of a small habitat patch on the south side that we try to emulate. Um, the vegetation on San Nick is really island night lizard uh, centric for the last several years. They benefit from restoration sites that are isolated from existing populations. We funded a, with the USGS a uh, population genetics study. There were some news out of it. The island night lizard, although lost a lot of habitat, did not suffer a genetic bottleneck. But all the existing populations uh, were pretty desperate from each other. And the pop gen study basically said it would be best to put isolated populations or isolated habitat in areas where they could migrate to and then mix when pioneer individuals dis disperse from those locations. So the restoration sites that we have are a mix, a lot of cacti and box thorn in order to close a canopy up real tight to make sure that birds and foxes can't eat that island night lizard. Um, here is a time series of one of my favorite plantings. And you can see it uh, in inception in 2014. Uh, a good thing to note is that the plants are placed in, but that's not the end of it. It's not one planting year and then you walk. You plant, you water, you weed. But because it's so harsh on that island, we actually come back several times and plant rarer plants in there or other plants that will grow after they're being protected by the cacti. And this is a Puntia littoralis. And I went out there last week and just decided to grab some, some shots just for this to get the latest. You can see a really cool thatch being built up, uh, or thicket, sorry, not thatch, uh, between the artemisia that was planted uh, years after the cacti. And uh, on the, in the yellow box, you can see uh, a board. You guys see that board uh, at the base right there? That's a cover board that the US Geological Survey put out. 
And that's how we monitor the successful use of our habitat that we're building for the island night lizard. So in that area, there are no island night lizards. We place the habitat in, we put the board down, and then every year they go out and check it once. And uh, just recently, this is the first uh, planting, this and one other, actually got the first pioneer individuals of island night lizards. So we've created island night lizard habitat. It takes seven or eight years for it to happen, but now we could actually look at the genetics of those lizards and then see how uh, they start using that habitat. Um, but even though we did it for lizards, it's not, it doesn't just help lizards. Uh, there's a, a rare to us plant, Kenopodium californicum, common elsewhere, but uh, there's only two locations on island and it is growing very well given that it can grow amongst the cacti. The cacti also stop seeds in the wind such as this baccarus you see on the, on the right. And uh, like any restoration ecologist, you want to see recruitment from the plants you put in the ground. And there is a seedling as well as if you go out there, a bunch of young artemisia plants. Uh, surprisingly enough, we also have some epiphytes growing on the cacti. So you can see uh, the, uh, the lichens growing on the cactus spines, which uh, is very encouraging. So the biodiversity of an area that was previously just a bunch of non-native, non-native uh, non annual European grasses now becomes uh, much more robust. Uh, and you can see the cacti fruit in red there with my finger, and that has a, a cacti seed on it. And that uh, brown photo of seeds uh, are actually seeds that were eaten by the endemic uh, deer mouse on island. So this restoration has pulled in species from all over and went from non-native to having a bunch of, uh, uh, almost a network of, of individuals, which brings me to the next slide, our barcode program led by uh, the garden's very own Dr. Lehman, right over there. <laughs> uh, we have a goal of collecting one of everything in the terrestrial environment, and then uh, sequencing part of it. Uh, what we would like to do is uh, create a library so we can take things such as scat of animals like night lizards or foxes, sequence it, and see what it's eating. That will better give us an idea of what needs to be in those new restoration sites. Some things, just like plants, can grow in and, and migrate into those sites, but other things may not. So we might need to move in uh, uh, things like a snail or other invertebrates maybe that are distribution limited. Uh, we've learned a lot from this program, including uh, we did our first fungi survey. We have over 104 uh, fungi that were not known prior to this. Uh, so our species list is blowing up. Uh, 13 new vascular plants, four of them being native. You can see bryophytes, lichens, and I haven't even touched on the soil algae, which are several new genera to science being named. I don't even remember how many species at the moment. Um, also have a new millipede. Uh, I think the long-term benefits to this uh, are that the data doesn't ever get old. We get to access it online, other, and then also other islands can use it. If they want to see what their organisms are eating and they're having trouble with the species that are not recovering on their own, they can now build a food web and use all the overlapping taxa that Sandnick has. And uh, we do have a lot of overlapping taxa with the other islands. Uh, lastly, I'd like to talk about invasive plant biocontrol. Uh, the islands, unfortunately, have been invaded by crystalline ice plant. That's that red carpet you see behind this. Uh, we've spent years uh, studying it, and uh, Dr. Denise Knapp here uh, did a, a, a several year long study looking at the impacts, especially to uh, the insect uh, uh, fauna in that mat. Um, it, you know, after uh, much studying, and not just from us, but also from uh, groups in Mexico uh, and the Park Service, uh, we were not unable to find a scalable method of control for this species uh, that uh, works. So uh, myself with uh, uh, Naval Base Coronado, um, my colleague Brian Munson, decided that we were going to partner with the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture, Agricultural uh, Research Services, and they have a biocontrol uh, program. So we started to look at uh, and for agents for this uh, very taxonomically um, not related plant to anything on the island. Uh, and in the lower right you can see one of our first agents which is uh, a genus of uh, uh, it's the greater of all weevils as far as I'm concerned, uh, Lixis, uh, in South Africa that is a stem borer. Uh, it's just a candidate but that might be one insect that if it follows the seven years of testing, which would be ahead of it, uh, might be something that we could consider uh, using to control it. 
Uh, but first step in, those, uh, in that process is uh, finding the point of origin. And just a pretty cool little note, uh, uh, all the island managers, uh, both sides of the border, have been very helpful, as well as mainland people. And we've uh, started to analyze uh, the data of where does the plant come from? So where does our crystalline uh, ice plant come from in Southern California? and uh, Baja, and it turns out so far, and this is half the data, that they all come from the Canary Islands. <laughs> Go figure. So there's some historical story going on here that is gonna be really interesting to find, even if we don't find an agent one day. But uh, it looks like they all came from uh, the Canary Islands, and the Canary Islands came from South Africa, so there was some sort of trade route, something going on uh, uh, way back, uh, and, and that's how that got out here. But the impacts to the island are great. Uh, they wipe out whole coastal areas. Uh, there's no native plants. The seed bank's impressive. Uh, thousands in a little spot. They last 100 plus years. It's, it's a problem. So um, at that, I'd like to thank all of our partners. Uh, this covered so many partners. I wrote down uh, uh, as many as I could there. And uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. We're going to skip questions again to keep on track, but save those. Put them on those cards for the panel discussion. So next, I'd like to invite up Scott Morrison, Dr. Scott Morrison, who's the Director of Conservation Programs and Science for the Nature Conservancy's California chapter. Scott is an amazing big picture thinker, and there's no one better to take this last uh, talk of the day. He's kind of like the island Yoda, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> he will describe the importance of island collaborations and the path forward for the archipelago. Thanks. So does that mean I, uh, does that mean I get my nouns and verbs kind of <laughs> mixed up? It was like, so. Um, that's good. So clearly, by virtue of us all being here, there is something about islands that just captures the imagination. And they certainly held the imagination of the early most uh, European explorers as they were working their way up the west coast of North America in the 15 and 1600s. And among the things that they were looking for was the Garden of Eden, where the, the hand of God reached down and created Adam and Eve. And they, were, and they presumed that that paradise on Earth was going to be an island. And they so wanted to find an island, they convinced themselves that's what they found. The idea of California as an island soon became established fact, and it was passed down for generations. In fact, it was passed down for centuries. Only over time, the very different California was finally discovered, the one that all along had been hidden in plain sight. Now that history is instructive when examining the state of knowledge regarding the natural and cultural history of the real islands off the coast of Alta and Baja California. Because even though these islands are now so familiar, or seem so, they actually hold a lot of mystery. And there is a lot yet to be discovered or rediscovered about them. And one of the things I wanna talk about in this talk is how these islands can help us discover how to do conservation better. We're in an era where conservation decision making is just gonna get harder and harder, and the world needs demonstrated solutions. But first, how can it be that these islands, so, uh, so near so many premier research and natural history institutions, have remained so mysterious? Well, that is in part because so much of their history has been erased. Introduced herbivores had a devastating impact on the California islands and pretty much all the biological surveys, all the observational records we have of these places came only after the islands had already been highly altered like this. So what were the islands like before all this? And it's not just for curiosity's sake that we ask and want to know. To manage the islands' eco ecosystems into the future, we need to understand what they were before all this happened, long before. Now, going back to those early uh, European explorers, another of their uh, great failures in observation was their failure to recognize the fellow human beings that were already there. 
For thousands of years, these islands were home to thousands of people with rich and thriving cultures and, and economies, and they, sh they were shaping the ecosystems of which they were part. So, of course, another reason for the gap in our understanding of the deep past of these places is because of the systematic effort to sever that intergenerational continuity of the first stewards of the islands and the islands themselves. Now, despite that effort, fortunately, those connections remain strong, and the descendants, um, I'm sorry, and, uh, and those connections are fortifying. And the reawakening of that history clearly has an importance that transcends just conservation, but it also has a true value for conservation because we do need to understand what these islands were in order to take care of them. Now, to illustrate just how basic the gaps are in our, in our, in our knowledge of this history, here we have the island scrub jay. This is the only place on the planet you will find one. But why is that? The genetics of this species suggest the, the, that it's been out there for a million years. And yet just 10,000 years ago, when sea levels were lower, these islands were all connected as one landmass. So why, in just that short amount of time, did it only end up here and not six miles away? Did it disappear from Santa Rosa Island thousands of years ago or just in the past couple hundred? This expanse of Santa Rosa Island was probably once dense oak chaparral, vegetation that would have been able to support jays. Intensive sheep ranching in the late 1800s devastated everything that you see in this frame. So was that the culprit behind the disappearance of the J? The fact is, we don't know. But this question of why Jays are only on Santa Cruz Island is highly relevant to their conservation. Being isolated on a single island makes the species much more vulnerable to catastrophic events like wildfire and disease. And both of those threats are exacerbated by climate change. Now, if we had jays on multiple islands, they the species overall would have a much um, lower risk of extinction. So should we move the jay back to where we know it once was? How would we decide that one way or the other? Now, conservation these days is filled with questions like that. And islands can be the laboratories for developing smart ways of answering those kinds of questions. Islands are renowned as places of discovery because they are relatively simple, bounded systems. They are places where it's easier to figure out the way the world works. We all know how important islands were in the discovery of, natu of natural selection. Insights from islands also became the theory underpinning the entire field of conservation biology, helping us understand what happens when natural habitat is reduced to being an island surrounded by human land uses. Now, as a, as a conservation practitioner, I find myself drawn to islands for a number of reasons. First and foremost, they are hotspots of endemism and imperilment. So they are ground zero for confronting the global mass extinction crisis. We as conservationists have to be successful on islands, full stop. Islands are also relatively small, discrete management units. So there's often a more kind of straightforward management prerogative that we have on islands to take action. And you can also take actions on islands with a higher degree of confidence of success than you might have on more mainland systems. So for example, the pest eradications that we've seen here. I personally really like how having clear accountability for the fate of a species sharpens the attention. It can make theoretical conservation debates get real, real, real fast. But in my role now, what I, most value about what I most value about working on islands is how they can be model systems for figuring out how to increase the pace, scale, and effectiveness of conservation more generally. Unless that sounds kind of abstract or, or intimidating with, with, um, with uh, Darwin himself staring down on us, the first step in developing a model is simply remembering to step up kind of out of the details of your particular system, out of your particular question, to ask why somebody who doesn't care about your focal study organism or care about the California islands should care about the problem you're trying to solve. And when you figured that out, why what you're doing might be relevant to other scientists or managers out there, 
then you think about how to design and communicate your work so that you can reach and inform those people. And the specific thing you're working on then is, 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 is an application or a test of your potential model. With that mindset, you are now developing a solution to a problem that others also have. Meaning that you're not just delivering an important local impact, you're also increasing the ability of others somewhere else to advance their own conservation efforts. And there is so much work on our islands here that can be done with a model development mindset. Most people underestimate this, but probably the hardest part of conservation in the century ahead that conservationists are facing the world over is making sure that the precious few places in the world that we have protected for nature, whether they're on islands or mainlands, actually function to retain the biodiversity that most need those places. Because anymore, if places are not actively managed, they will degrade, and the things that were special about them will be lost. But invariably, we in conservation don't have enough funds or capacity to do everything that needs to be done everywhere. So we have to figure out which subset of biodiversity will be the priority for management on a given preserve. And we need frameworks for figuring that out. We need models for how to do that. And all of our collective work on the California islands provide no shortage of impetuses and, and opportunities to figure out those frameworks. As an example of a problem that conservationists need to get much more facile dealing with, consider climate change adaptation. We know that rapid climate change is going to give all species three options. Move to track the climate that you need, adapt in place, or go extinct. But if you're an island species with a limited dispersal ability, one option might be off the table. You might not be able to track the climate that you need if it moves away from the island that you're on. You're stuck unless somebody helps you along the way. Like somebody mentioned job security here. If, 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 um, if you want conservation job security for the century ahead, get proficient in the science and practice of conservation translocations. We will need it everywhere. Just think of all the mainland species that will be dispersal limited because their habitat is fragmented. Now, one of the reasons why folks in this island community might be especially well equipped to think through how best to do conservation translocations responsibly is that many of us have just spent decades trying to get things off of islands and places where they very much did not belong. We in the island community know well the mess that can result when things are put in the wrong places. So we know to use real humility about moving things ourselves. But importantly, we are also a courageous and action-oriented bunch, uh, and that's because we know how impatient extinction can be on islands. So, what if a rare plant is having trouble persisting on an island? Should it be moved to a neighboring island where it currently doesn't occur? Would the way we think that through be the same if we were considering a species from elsewhere in the world that might be similarly threatened and the California islands can provide it a safe place to live? Some species of albatross in the Pacific breed mostly on low-lying atolls, highly vulnerable to sea level rise. Conservation planners have identified the California Channel Islands as a place that could provide more climate resilient options for the birds. So should a, should a manager facilitate the colonization of this species onto one of these islands? What if establishing a breeding colony could potentially down the line adversely affect a local endemic plant? What's the framework you use to make those decisions? Would you use the same framework to evaluate these two scenarios? What about species that are already here? What if you have a species that was introduced from the mainland and now it is spreading rapidly? It's not native, but, but having it on the island might actually benefit its regional conservation. 
What about a species that shows up on its own and is spreading? Colonization, after all, is a, is a, is a fundable, fundamental biogeographic process on islands. So what should get to stay? What should we manage? What should we remove? How would we decide? Is there any overarching kind of philosophy that could be applied here? Or are these all just one-off decisions? And then for those species that we decide are just gonna have to adapt in place and deal with climate exacerbated threats, how interventionist should we be in helping them? Is vaccinating a wild population from now until forever the right thing to do? Remember that extinction as well is, is also a fundamental biogeographic process on islands. There are now very active frontiers in synthetic biology focusing on genetic manipulation that can make species more disease resistant or drought or heat tolerant. And there are increasing calls to apply these advances in the service of conservation. Should we consider using these tools on our islands? For example, genetically manipulated organisms might be the only way to eradicate pests like mice from Isla Guadalupe or rats from a place like San Miguel Island. So when these tools become technologically feasible, should they be considered on our islands? Again, why or why not? The point of this smattering of questions is to highlight how the islands are not just hotspots of endemism, they are also hotspots of high stakes decision making. How hands on or hands, or, or hands off should we be? What do we want these islands to, to look like 100 years from now? And how should we make these decisions? Going into the future where everything is going to be resorting, should we be making these decisions species by species, island by island, manager by manager? Or should we have some sort of overarching framework to guide these decisions across the archipelago? We need to figure this out because we're seeing it already, how island managers are becoming increasingly reliant on what happens on other islands in order to preserve the biodiversity across the system. We're also going to be increasingly seeing interchange between islands and the mainland, creating mainland refugia for island plants, for example. Would we also consider creating island refugia for mainland plants? I don't know. The truth behind all of these what ifs and headlines like you see in your newsfeed every day is that we can't save it all. We don't have the resources for it and it wouldn't be possible anyway. So what will we pr prioritize for protection? Knowing that, that what we choose not to prioritize, we could lose. I remember um, back in the heat of the feral pig eradication. Um, on Santa Cruz Island. We were, we were getting a ton of blowback from um, in the media and in the courts, and po people opposed to the project would, um, would accuse us of just playing God out there. And we'd say, no, 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 we're, we're, not, we're not playing God. We're simply taking things off the island that don't belong. Today, though, given what we know about the severity and the urgency of the global biodiversity crisis, I'd probably respond to that accusation a little differently. Today, I would say, you're right. We are playing God. And that's because as conservationists in this human-dominated world, we have to. It's our job. In this era of mass extinction and global change and always scarce resources, we have to pick winners and losers. We have to decide whether to move species that can't move themselves. We have to decide whether to use modern technologies to change them. And we have to accept the consequences if we decide not to decide. Given the ecological mess that we've made in the world with invasive species and climate change, just letting nature take its course doesn't cut it anymore. It won't go back to what it once was and it will take us somewhere altogether novel and we will lose some of the things that we get to share the world with that make it special. So make no mistake, through our actions as well as through our inactions, conservation anymore is the business of playing God. And given that, we all better get really good at it. <laughs> and getting good at it 
means figuring out how to do it responsibly. And that means being clear about the values we use to underpin our decisions. It means using best available science. It means using structured and robust and transparent and documented decision-making processes. It, mean, it means giving proper consideration to risks, to costs, to opportunity costs, and to trade-offs. That's what rising to this awesome responsibility of this global moment means. And these are the landscapes of discovery for us to figure out how to do that. Conservation on these islands cuts to the very core of what conservation requires in today's world. The questions we grapple with on these islands routinely are foundational conservation questions, foundational ecological questions, philosophical questions, legal and policy questions. They're foundational ethical questions. They're even foundational spiritual questions. Why do individual species matter? What lengths should we go to protect them? What are these islands for? Who are these islands for? Which plants and animals do we really want to make sure future generations get to share their world with? There is no better training ground to develop the proficiencies in conservation decision making we will need in the century ahead than these islands of the Californias. And that is because we have the momentum of decades of conservation leadership and accomplishment to build from. You know, there's, there's one more ingredient to navigating this new era of conservation decision making if we want to do it responsibly. And we've heard it in every one of these talks. And that is that we have to do it collaboratively. We can only do this together. The conservation story of the islands thus far is a story of what we can accomplish in partnership with all of us in our different roles and expertises with, with all of our different perspectives being brought to bear. All the conservation and restoration success stories we, we hear about these islands, the, the, the inspiring story of the uh, island fox recovery, yes, these are stories of, of science and of ingenuity and of determination, but more than anything else, they are stories of the essentialness, the power, and the hopefulness of collaboration. Indeed, the, the collaborative enterprise that we have collectively built on these islands is a model in and of itself. So for those of you already working in this system, thank you. Your work is giving nature out there a fighting chance that it's gonna need for what's ahead. For those of you wanting to make a difference in conservation, come on in. The islands need you because we have got to get this next phase right. And by helping us develop approaches to conservation that others elsewhere can also apply, your work will surely have an influence far beyond. There is indeed something about islands that conjures the imagination. Thank you for bringing your creativity, your passion, your smarts, your initiative to them, and for meeting us on one of the most exciting frontiers in conservation, and that's the one just offshore. Thank you very much. I told you he's a good closer. Um, so we're a little behind, so we're not going to take questions. We'll leave them for the panel discussion. We need 15 minutes, so we're going to go to 3:45 or yeah, 3:45 um, instead of 3:40 uh, for the panel discussion. Is that okay, Sven? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Great. 3:45. Uh, see you then.
All right, welcome back everybody uh, who's online and here um, in the auditorium. Thanks for uh, spending the day with us. Um, this part is the panel discussion. Um, what we aim to do with these things is to really just kind of give a full picture of a conservation story and challenge uh, and then, you know, uh, in this time, try to think kind of bigger picture of, you know, what's next? What can we all do? Hopefully you leave inspired thinking about what, what you can each do to help with this, these challenges. Um, and, uh, and definitely just time to take the, the questions you've had burning all, all day that we haven't gotten time to get to. So um, thanks again to garden staff for curating these questions from both online and in person. And, I'll just start with um, one that, that follows well from Scott's last talk, and it's, why does saving rare plants matter? They represent such a small proportion of wild communities, does it matter if we lose them? And I know someone in, who has a, an answer uh, that she's given before. I think her name is Heather. Okay. Um, someone <coughs> next to me was talking, but I think the question... <laughs> I think the question is uh, why do why saving do, rare plants yeah, matter? Yeah, why do rare plants matter? Um, I think there are a lot of approaches you can take to this question. Um, one of my favorites is actually in the language of the Federal Endangered Species Act, which says that endangered plants and animals are of ecological, scientific, aesthetic, and cultural value to the nation and its people. Um, and I think that sums it up really well, but um, more than that, I think everybody here talked about keeping all the pieces. Um, the rare plants are small pieces of the puzzle, but they're often also the ones that we know the least about. And um, a lot of us on the panel today talked about this ecological network and the web of life. That's what Denise has devoted a lot of her career to, is understanding how that web connects. And Although they can be a small proportion of the web of life, sometimes rare plants are the linchpin. And because we don't know exactly what their function is all the time, we also don't know what we lose and what the ripple effect of that loss might be um, if we don't protect them. And so, you know, intelligent tinkering means keeping all the pieces. Um, and that means even the small ones, I think. Thanks, Heather. Anyone want to add on to that? I would just add that, yeah, I totally agree with everything you say, Heather. And one of the things about rare plants, too, that I find uh, insightful for us is that they quite often inhabit small places in large uh, landscapes, kind of like human beings, perhaps, in some ways, and are very sensitive to changes in the environments in some, in some ways. And so we can learn sometimes by their stories, their reactions to change, um, what we are doing and how we can actually help ourselves as well. So you all saw all those photos of the islands just denuded of vegetation. How did all those early botanists find all these rare species that we have herbarium specimens for? I, either they found the needle in the haystack, or they were and really good at finding things, or they were more common. Um, there was talk of the island Berberus. There's only 11. So how did an archaeologist find seed in, in one of the, the mittens? Either she found that, that needle in the haystack, or berberus is more common, and we know that it was used as a, a food source on the, on the mainland for coastal tribes. So the islands are a little bit different, I think, when we talk about rare plants and that they're, we, we know most likely what caused their uh, reduction. Or on the mainland, it's I think a little bit, it's a little bit different. Some things might be rare just because they are rare, and that might be the case for some of them on the islands. But really, I think it's it's all those inter introduced animals that reduce them. I would agree with what John said, and a, an example of that is the lotus that Denise mentioned on Santa Cruz Island. It was very rare when we started work out there in the 1980s, like there was you know, a few individuals known. It was rare, considered rare in the 1880s, and they mentioned it even back then as being found only in a few locations. Once the animals were removed, started coming back, and I started saying, oh, this is a rare plant, I better map it. 
So I started marking individuals, and it's like, okay, we found three here, we found four there. And then it sort of gradually got to, well, I found a, a group of 10 or 15 here. Pretty soon it was hillsides. And now it's common everywhere. So just because it's rare now doesn't mean it wasn't common before and maybe a more important component of the ecosystem before some of these threats came and, and you know, made them smaller. And that photo I showed of... Uh, or the quote of Blanche Trask was saying that she found, you know, all of... Uh, <coughs> oh, mine, mine just went there, didn't it? The quote of Blanche Trask you know, stating that she found maybe four locations on Nick around 1900 of Leptocyne gigantea, and then the next photo is, you know, 20% of the island is covered with it and, and getting bigger. So even if it's rare, it might become not rare and have a very significant uh, contribution to the overall ecosystem. Great, thank you everybody. Um, the next one is, how do you view the balance of recreation and sensitive island habitats or resources given the current climate of opening islands to more access in the backcountry and surrounding waters? <laughs> Since I work for the National Park Service and, <laughs> and as an agency, we, are, we have a mandate to provide for recreational use, but 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 at the Channel Islands, we also had a we had a stronger mandate than many national parks do to protect natural and cultural resources. So it was very clear for the Channel Islands that minimum impact by by users was going to be supposed to be our guiding linchpin, and um, so and sometimes there's a demand for more intensive use or more impactful use than what we were, com some of us were comfortable as managers. So I won't say that we've always gotten it right. Uh, I will say that I probably didn't value um, public use as much when I was working at the park until like the examples I showed where it was people who actually had sort of that, that firsthand knowledge of the islands that were willing to stand up and to say, you know, they saw the impacts that were happening by the non-native animals. So I, th I think uh, th the focus needs to be on minimum, I think n numbers n need to be managed. It has to be minimum impact and that's up to the managers to, to make sure that they define that, define what that is and that they monitor what the impacts of visitors are. I mean, to some extent, Visitor use, we know that displaces wildlife. We know it has impact even when it's, you know, somewhat, um, you know, a, a rather benign, you know, just hiking on the island. So, but I think accepting some of those impacts in, in designated areas, but keeping it minimal and define the experience that you want visitors to have. So it, it is okay to establish maximum numbers and then to enforce those numbers. Yeah, and maybe you have reference areas also where you don't have visitor use, and, and that can also be something that you are then studying to, to better measure what the impacts are of visitors. Thanks, Kate. Scott? We also uh, here have the, um, the luxury of being within an archipelago where we can think about how conservation values can be distributed across a whole suite of islands. And, and our, we talked a little bit today during the talks about the different land managers' mandates for their respective islands, and they're not all the same. And so you can think about how maybe some types of, of human uses might be able to be distributed across different places. So Catalina Island, as an example, has a small city on it with a lot of, a lot of easy access to the major population center in Southern California. And so maybe some types of, of recreation opportunities that the, the broader public might, um, might seek on the islands might be better able to be serviced in a place like that and that allows for other types of, of outdoor experiences to be prioritized in other, other island, um, individual island units. John? I think if you're going to increase recreational and human access, what has to happen in parallel is that your natural resource has to meet that challenge. 
So by putting in that uh, increased recreational use and not supporting it with biosecurity, with invasive plant removal, with monitoring, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's not in balance. And so I think if there, the, the pressure is only going to increase, the human population is increasing, and the islands are going to be more attractive as time goes on. I, I can imagine one day when we don't need to test weapons on offshore islands, will those become part of the national park? Will those become, um, you know, 100 years from now, maybe those might be places that are open for recreation. I, you know, Bill and, and Kim might, uh, uh, might not think that might happen, but I can see a day where that, that could happen. And so I think we just need to make sure that decision makers are keeping the natural resource protections in, in, at, in pace with the, the human demand on these places. Luciana. Thank you. I just want to add, like in Mexican islands, we have less visitation on islands compared to, to this. And I, I think that what you said and it's what um, you have a great sample here in the Channel Islands. In Mexico, we don't uh, use them as tourist places uh, that more, that not much because they're well very difficult to access. Not a lot of people have resources to go there. But the ones that are open to to, to tourism, I mean, in, I know that it touches people and makes a lot of uh, uh, it. It makes a difference. So it's a, a, a way for the average uh, person to be able to approach and to to know the islands through one or two that they, they visit. There is a, a right way to do it or close to um, to doing it in the right way, which is, for example, the most recent case in Mexico is Las Islas Marias. Islas Marias was open as a tourist um, tourist places and, and it's being done in a, a very careful way, Some only some um, areas and with the biosecurity in place, so very well thought. Other places maybe are not there yet. Uh, so, for example, Guadalupe, it's still it, will, it had a, it had an extensive damage, and still uh, maybe it's going to take a while for be able to take uh, heavy visitation on it. So maybe some places can can wait a little bit, and others can be just available for for people. So in Mexico, we have less uh, <coughs> islands open to tourism. Maybe it will be more in the, in the future, but. Careful. Thank you. Okay, this one is shifting gears a bit. Is there a role for fire on the islands, for example, for management of a process to be managed? Okay, well, uh, as a manager of the island that has the most fires of the ones we've uh, <laughs> talked about today, um, I definitely think yes. Um, the fires that we get on San Clemente Island, they are started um, by um, unexploded ordnance. Um, usually we do um, try to contain them, but um, the Dendromecon, the island tree poppy that came up, that came up after a fire, and it was in an area that we've been in many, many times, you know, surveying before, and it was only after 2017 fire, um, I think uh, found, I think we found it in 2021, um, that it came, that we, you know, we had seen it, and it's probably been up for a couple of years. So yes, definitely, um, we have found, and we found that elsewhere on San Clemente Island, where we have species rebounding after fire. So I think it depends on the the frequency of the fire. It also depends on the severity of the fire. Um, you know, managing a fire, or having a prescribed fire. We've we've done a few of those on San Clemente Island, and you just have to be very careful about making sure they're within prescription. But there are benefits, and I definitely think there is a place in the landscape of the management of the use for the use of fire. I, I think it's not just a question if there's a role of fire, because I think fire is going to be on the island. So the question is, is it a role of intentional fire or a role of accidental fire? And with climate change, you know, and vegetation changing, vegetation changing and increasing due to removal of animals, it's going to be more prevalent because of that. Climate changes could obviously, you know, aggravate the abundance of it, and increasing tourism. You know, many of the fires, you know, some of the ones on Catalina and other places were started by people with beach fires and things like that. So I think the the big question is, you know, not whether there's a role for it, but how do we deal with it, and whether it's, you know, done on purpose or not. 
Yeah, I just think that, you know, just broadening beyond fire um, and just thinking <clears throat> about disturbance generally. Um, when you think about the past 10,000 years for some of these islands, they, they've had a lot of people and a lot of activity on them. And the conservation era uh, for some of these islands is really marked by a lack of that kind of, of activity on the islands in those systems. And in, De in Denise's talk, she, she uh, showed a, a field of blue dicks that, uh, that, were very, that we know were cultivated um, uh, by, for example, the Chumash on Santa Cruz Island. Whatever the management practice was that, that, that created that cultural landscape is not in practice right now. And so what, what does that mean? Is that what, what is the trajectory of that area of the island now? Because we, we're not burning it, we're not, we're not selectively you know, managing any of the vegetation around it. And, um, and I think that these are some of the questions that we're gonna have to grapple with if we're thinking about what, nature, what letting nature take its course means for some of these places that are kind of familiar today as natural landscapes or cultural landscapes, absent some of the disturbances that were probably there for thousands of years. So related to this question, there's one specifically asking, what's the fire history on Guadalupe? Well, it has been uh, changing and, well, we have had several historical fires. It's, it's, we don't have the, the full history, but um, we do have more frequent that, that probably the system can stand right now, just uh, at what Peter was saying was very right. I mean, it's not, it's not a, um, a question, are you going to have it, it's when you're going to have it, and, and could be for different uh, reasons. That the last one that we had in 2021 was a lighting that reached uh, a, uh, a pine, an individual pine, and that one, it, it was an interesting case because we thought that it was extinguished. That happened in January uh, for a, a storm. It didn't have any, well, not much um, uh, rain on it, but it, the, the fire stayed underground for several months. So in March, because of the winds, it just came up again and kill something that could have been very, very contained and not killing only one adult tree and, and few of the, of the young ones actually ended up killing five trees and many, many of the, the, new, the new ones. So yeah, we have the story more clear for the cypress forest, less clear for the pines. There's a lot of scars of lightning and the, and the, uh, the cypress and you see a lot of uh, burning charcoal everywhere. So, yeah, I will say probably every 20 years, 15 years. And so, yeah, we, we need to be prepared. So it's why we're doing, uh, committing a lot of resources and all the thing of removing the, the field <coughs> material from the, from the forest and trying to rehabilitate the fire breaks and, and just be prepared to have the, the the, the people knowing the, having the skills to, to be able to fight them if, if something like, like that happens. And also, well, um, uh, we talk about a lot of the recovery of the native ones and the species, but they also, uh, we have, you have the other um, um, side of the coin of the non-native uh, species that you have there. So when, when we remove the goats, the first years you will see all the grasslands, like full of avena everywhere, and that one creates a lot of connectivity, and it's, which is a, a big risk of, of fire. Thank you. Um, this one is specifically for John. It's, has there been any noticeable effect of pollinator, on pollinator populations given the use of neonicotinoids? I don't know if I can answer that question. I don't, I don't know enough. That would be a, a good question for, for maybe me. Raymond Sam. <laughs> hey, David, do you want to take a mic? So the, the areas that were treated on Santa Cruz Island with uh, thiamethoxam were a small fraction of the island, about 2% of the island area. And um, we also use a very dilute concentration of, of thiamethoxam. Um, Neonicotinoid pesticides, of course, are in the news a lot. 
uh, because they are indiscriminately used in agricultural situations and overused in agricultural situations and um, clearly have detrimental effects on a wide variety of insects. They're, they're uh, arthropod specific. Um, we, d we didn't monitor pollinators on Santa Cruz Island in the areas that were treated, um, but what we have seen, and John showed the graph, was that native ants have come back since the treatments um, uh, took place. Uh, and so, so that's very strong evidence that the pesticides have degraded as we would have expected that they would and that the effects are um, uh, no longer evident uh, at this point. Thanks, David. What do you say to people who tell you that the islands reached a new balance with the rats or pigs or sheep or deer, et cetera? Well, okay, I, I was, I've been asked this question actually before, or, or we've heard this from, from a lot of people, and I would say that they are correct. There was a, a new balance with rats and pigs and so on, but it was a balance that heavily favored the, those invasive species, and it was to the detriment of, you know, our native um, and rare seabirds and in plants and animals, so it, it was really a, a value choice that we had. Was, was that the balance that we wanted? Was that the balance that was the best for the, the ecosystem? So um, our goal became that we wanted to, to um, change that balance. We wanted to achieve a balance that favored um, the rare and the native biodiversity of the island and eliminate what was so common worldwide because they've been, you know, animals that have been moved all over the place. And I'd like to say for, um, on San Clemente Island, I, I don't think we ever did uh, achieve a balance um, with, the, with the goats. I mean, the goats, you know, ate the vegetation, the soils became bare, and then we had a lot of soil erosion that was continuing, so it was never, in balance, it was it was all always in a downward you know state um, you know after the goats got there. And I would I would echo what Kim said. I think on Santa Cruz there was never really a balance with the sheep. I mean we were seeing plants and shrubs where you can see the root ball that was two feet up in the air. So you know in the lifetime of that shrub, they've lost one to two feet of soil, and that was continuing. And so I don't think you could say that you, you reached a point where everything was, you know, at a stasis. Thank you all. Um, what is the process of developing strategies and priorities for conservation? I, I can give a, a nice canned Navy answer for that. <laughs> We have an integrated natural resources management plan, and it walks us through what the operations are and what the federal laws require, and we go through that entire thing step by step. These plans are several hundred pages long. Um, as uh, uh, Kim showed, just a tiny, tiny fraction of some of the work that would have been placed in one of those, um, and it covers everything in there from do the sailors go fishing off the side to are we going to, you know, test weapons on this location? And I think, you know, certain laws are, I mean, they're all followed, but certain ones get funded better. Uh, so ESA is typically a very high priority law. Clean Water Act is a very high, high priority law. Um, so for us, it can be, uh, you know, kind of in that order. But a lot of thoughts going into that, and our priorities change. We actually update those reports every three years, and then we re rewrite them typically every five to ten. Uh, and then it also goes through, some of them go through the NEPA process as well. So there are a ton of eyes on these things, and it pretty much goes through all the federal requirements. I'd like to expand on what Bill said um, with regard to um, the Integrated Natural Resource Management Plan. That's a tool that we use in the Navy. Um, San Clemente Island is undergoing its um, update, uh, latest update, and we're using open standards. Um, so it's a, 
a structured decision making process and uh, we're using that to look at um, you know threats, um, look at where our efforts might be placed, and also looking at unintended consequences of of um, some of our actions. So we're using that to help identify the actual projects um, that we'll be doing and to prioritize those. Um, also to see which ones might be most effective, so we can make use of um, you know resources uh, most efficiently. Shortly after I arrived at, arrived at the Channel Islands. Use what's called the Delphi process, and we brought together a group of about 50. Um, okay, so shor shortly after I arrived at the park, we brought together. We used the Delphi process, and we brought together a group of about 50 um, biologists from both marine and terrestrial biologists with many different specialties, mostly people who knew the Channel Islands. Also, cultural resource specialists, physical scientists, <clears throat> and what we what we did was we uh, sort of put together this long list of what did everyone know based on their knowledge of the islands. What were the important things that that we needed to do to um, to preserve um, the ecosystems of of the cha of the park islands? And so we came out with this long laundry list. So then the task was to, uh, to, to whittle this down, what's the highest priorities? And so the Delphi process, what it involves is all the, the individuals on their own rank the projects that they consider the highest priority. And then that information is shared against everyone else's opinions. And then you, then you see, is there a re-ranking? And you go through this sort of iterative process of hearing from each other these different specialties, why certain actions needed to be taken now. And at the end, it was, it was amazing how we came up with, with sort of like a top 10 priorities that almost everybody across the board, so whether you're an archeologist, um, a botanist, a soil scientist, or a, a wildlife biologist, for instance, there was across the board agreement that eliminating feral pigs, for instance, was the highest priority action for the park. And so we, that really helped sort of chart our, our course of priorities as opportunities came up or as we were able to get funding to carry through certain projects. And that was what guided the park for approximately 20 years. I just wanna, I just wanna underscore um, the word funding that showed up in a couple of those remarks. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to plan. Uh, if you don't have money, you don't implement. And, um, and sitting with the NGO hat on, um, the, the fundability of some of these, these projects is, is really important to consider. Um, and, and even when you take that into account, the triage you have to do on your priorities is brutal. Just we, it's it's really easy, to, especially on these islands, to make a long list of of really important things that we should do, and the the subset of that that we can do because we have funding to do it is is really really small. Thank you. All. Uh oh, this isn't working. St oh no, it is. Yay. Okay. <laughs> Um, next one is, what does the role of traditional ecological knowledge play for making conservation decisions? Do we have to play God? Can't we just listen to indigenous people who come from generations of people who have stewarded the land? Well, I, I think what I would, what I would reflect on in, in that question is, is how different this landscape is right now, uh, given all that has happened to it, especially in the last 200 years. Um, we have an onslaught of invasive species that will be novel to that traditional ecological knowledge. We have a climate that will be novel in the context of that traditional ecological knowledge. So I do believe that there is a lot that we can learn together. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, just 
uh, focusing on on that that the the blue dick fields um, on Santa Cruz Island and the lack of of really any management whatsoever on them right now. Um, you know, there's probably a lot that we could we could co-discover there about how best to think about that landscape and take care of that landscape. Um, but I think we're really in uncharted territory here where we are going to be facing things that none of us have ever had to grapple with. And um, and we're going to need we're going to need everybody to bring in their ideas and their uh, their knowledge and um, and their creativity to bear. <laughs> My mic is going in and out, so um, we're going to do a battery replace. But anyone else want to take that one on? Okay. <laughs> okay. Do current federal and state environmental laws suffice to conserve and restore species in a changing climate? If not, what new policy do we need to support biodiversity conservation on the islands and the mainland? I guess I, I've, I've always felt more funding limited than policy limited. So um, cer certainly I think one issue, one area where there has been some difficulties is with marine management because you, there's, there's overlapping jurisdictions and the, um, the boundaries, really, like for the boundaries for the park, for instance, really aren't sufficient to protect uh, the a marine ecosystem, even for the National Marine Sanctuary. So we're, we are very weak in the marine, um, in the realm of protection of marine resources. You pretty quickly get into international waters and just a lot of overlapping jurisdictions. And I'd like to say, um, whoops, is this working? Yeah. Um, that, you know, well, I, I agree that the policy, you know, the laws and, and policy might be sufficient. I, I feel like a framework or some kind of mechanism to um, help us face the challenge of, of working across vast areas and, and different uh, jurisdictions, I think that's going to be important um, in the future if we're thinking about ever... Um, you know, re reintroducing species, places, and things like that. It's going to require cooperation on a scale that we're not currently doing. Um, I would also just make the point that for rare plants, the vast majority of them are not protected under any policy. Um, things that are on the federal and state endangered species lists are things that have had advocates and that have been pushed through the system to get that extra protection and by that mechanism they also get more funding and that's important and as a lot of people discussed here that has played a large role in removing the animals from the islands and working on all this recovery but there are also a whole host of plants you know 30 percent of the plants in california are rare um, and a very small fraction of them have any legal protection under the federal or California State Endangered Species Act. So I think that in that way, we don't have policies protecting enough things. Um, and I don't think that we necessarily even need that for every rare species. But um, as Kate mentioned, the funding difference is real and significant and greatly changes how we're able to do our work. So um, some of the 14 plus one plants that I talked about um, are extraordinarily rare. Others have, you know, co-occurring neighbors on the island that are more rare than them. But the reason we were focused on those 14 is because of their listing status and the funding that comes along with that. So in that way, I think, there's a lot of, of movement that could be done to help bring everybody along and not just those things that have been designated as federally or state listed. Um, not to be contrarian, but I, um, I, would, I don't think we know the answer to this question yet. I don't think we've fully pressure tested policy 
with what is what it, with what is coming. Um, I think we have it, just even over the course of this day a lot of practice at recovery of things that 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 need help in the place that they are, and we've talked a lot about reintroduction, moving things back to where they, we know they once were. But the idea of introducing things, we don't, we have not developed that muscle yet as a conservation community. And, um, and so we don't know what we're gonna run into when we actually need to do this much more efficiently than, than we currently are. And so I, I, I fully expect that when we, when we really get our heads around this and, and, and try to figure out how we're going to stay out ahead of these climate exacerbated threats, that we are gonna run into some, some need for maybe some policy innovation, maybe some new funding streams that will enable the good work to, to happen. But I, I, I don't think we know yet whether or not we have what we need. Nice. Thank you all. Can you hear me? No. You can? Oh. Sorry, it's a little fickle. Um, all right, the next one is, so many rare species require a disturbance regime to continue to thrive. How do we achieve this in the current regulatory environment, habitat fragmentation, and the new reality of invasive species? Well, I think we do have a number of species that thrived, have thrived and do thrive on disturbance. And my take on this question would be that we need to do this in an experimental framework. We don't know, like Scott is saying, some of the consequences of what we might do. And so I think we need to start with experimentation on large and small scales, perhaps, uh, to, to decide what we can do and then look at what happens over the long term afterwards. That said, I don't think we can wait forever to see what the outcomes of the, of the experiments are, but I think we need to definitely keep track of what we're doing uh, and why we're doing it, very clearly why we're doing it. And I think it, it just highlights for me why we have a parent that's a research. In Hawaii, in Hawaii, we had a term, it was research by management. And so just that really highlights the need that when you have a management program, document it and keep track of what's really going on and use that as a way to find out some of the questions that you were asking, because I think we're never going to know enough and just documenting what the disturbance is needed is important and what, how a species reacts to, if you have a fire there, well, go out and see what did that do to that species. You know, use that as a, a, a chance to find out what disturbance some species might need. And, and to follow up on that, I think, you know, some of the islands, like for example, San Clemente <clears throat> Island that does have um, frequent fire, you know, we are documenting what's happening after that and sharing that with um, you know, managers from other islands that might not be exactly, you know, parallel, but, but could be beneficial to them to see what might happen in similar, um, you know, systems on those other islands. Thank you. For, for, for many years, people tried to use fire to control invasive plants, and there's been a lot of studies where the seed, unless it's hanging on the plant and is subjected to a certain duration of fire at a certain temperature, doesn't kill the seed. And seed that's on the soil, typically, like yellow star thistle, will not die because of it. So I think what we can do, we have to look, kind of turn, turn it on its head a little bit. Instead of using fire to, to kill the weed, we can use it to stimulate the seed bank. So using fire in different ways or different disturbance regimes, maybe it's not the, the way we used to use it, but trying to think how can we use it differently. Thank you. On that, oh, sorry. Yeah, go. On Nick, uh, there are so many locations that are down to parent, parent <laughs> <laughs> down to parent material that I don't. We, we don't want more disturbance. We want to build soil. You know, it's eroding, and uh, uh, yeah, and the, the areas I think of that have a lot of disturbance are uh, beach strand areas that have elephant seals, which is another management thing that's occurring right now, is these elephant seals are coming into numbers that are huge and eroding 
feet and feet of topsoil around a lot of the islands, especially San Nick. And I don't see anything surviving in that area. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, you know, and, and those were above historical numbers. So there's a, there's a, a thought. Nice, thanks. Um, in our conservation work, has the legal battle become less challenging? Any lawsuits lately? <laughs> well, in, in Mexico, is that working? Yeah. In Mexico, I, I believe so. I mean, because there's more awareness. I, I, we have seen a change in the last decades of how the awareness of, of the, the, the average Mexican of the value of the islands, and why to, to do the restoration, and why you sometimes you need to have the bigger picture of what you want to rescue, what you want to restore. And there will be some um, effects to other uh, species that um, normally are non native, but still, I mean, there's, um, there's a subject that will be all, will always questions, but I, I do feel that there's um, more like um, uh, has been a change in the last years, at least in, in Mexico, of, of more people understanding in all, all levels. I mean, not only uh, civil, well, the government, but all the many agencies and, and and yeah, the average Mexican understanding that this is this is needed. Mm -hmm. So since you're active, Luciana, um, this one is for you. You work on so many islands along the Mexican coast. How similar are the ecosystems and vegetation of the islands? Oh, they're. I mean. I will say that the islands in front of the Baja California Peninsula, all the, the many of the islands up to Natividad, I will say they're very similar. They do share a lot of, of species, but from there you get the starting getting uh, different uh, ones, different ecosystems. We we try to uh, to manage them or working on them and looking at them as as, as groups, just to have um, just just to facilitate the, the work, but they they are uh, the very different. And not only the biodiversity, but also the challenges or the, the use of the history of the, the site. So yeah, um, I will say very, very, very different. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so this one is for Kim. What were the critical steps or methods to develop a culture of stewardship within the DOD? Oh, goodness. Um, I, I think, um, as Bill was talking about, I think part of it comes from um, the Sykes Act, which um, you know, requires all military installations with significant natural resources to have an integrated natural resources management plan. And that's, that's very prioritized, and it, it is from above. I, I think that helps a lot. Um, I, I do also think that um, understanding that conservation um, is also about sustainable use. Um, so example, for example, like on the um, San Clemente Island, it behooves the Navy to be a good steward of its land so it can continue to train there, so it doesn't have its training areas erode away, um, and so the training areas aren't infested with things like yellow star thistle or, or something that would make it really difficult you know, to train in, and I think the conservation um, has has improved over time in terms of the biologists and um, program managers, natural resources program managers, conveying that information more effectively to um, you know, the the military operators. So so they understand that that we all benefit from this together if we are good stewards of our resources. Can I add to that? Yeah. Uh, there are required trainings for officers that work on bases as well. So it's institutionalized through training. Uh, so they will have heard of like the Endangered Species Act uh, and Clean Water Act. So it's, it's uh, the Navy's pretty good at that actually, making sure that everyone's aware of what the requirements are. And you know, if you know, if you've been warned about it prior to starting a new job, you're not gonna be as shocked when someone comes up to you and says, hey, can't do that over there. We have an endangered bird, you know, or a plant. So, and and I'll I'll add one more thing to that too. Is that um, 
the Navy has been investing more and more um, resources into outreach, and so that's outreach you know, to the public, but it, it's also in reach. Um, so making sure that the military operators on San Clemente Island are, are aware of, of the resources, and we have outreach events. We have like trivia nights and things like that, and we've also had, uh, we had a fox that um, had been injured and wasn't able to be uh, released back into the wild, and so it was captive uh, for many years on the island, and we used that for outreach events. It, it really garnered a lot of public interest and, and sort of love of, of the foxes. So I think I think outreach, a lot of money, you know, put into outreach is is really well spent. Nice. Yeah. I know that question was directed at Kim, but on the on the Channel Islands, we're trying to establish a, a culture of biosecurity, and it, it's hard to to change a culture where you ship stuff out to the island and you have to do a lot more work to ensure that you're not spreading, uh, you know, for example, we're building a nursery on Santa Cruz and I shipped out some pipe. I had to go back down to the harbor and tape up the ends of the pipe so no mice could or rats could go in those pipes before they were shipped off. Real inconvenient, but could you imagine if a rat made it out to the island, how inconvenient that's gonna be? So, uh, so what we've learned from our colleagues in New, in New Zealand is that oftentimes it's the, the carrot that is much more powerful than the stick. So instead of always telling people no, doing fun things like a, a trivia night, rewarding people in some way or acknowledgement for, for how they have been more uh, aware of biosecurity. I think of Bill Hoyer, if you go out to San Nick, you're waiting at the terminal, and he makes you take off your left shoe. And then he digs in there, and he tells you if he finds any plant material, he's going to make you take off your right shoe, and then you have to clean him out. That's just a fun way of doing it. But in doing so, he's really spread biosecurity as part of the culture. That's something they do. You go to Guadalupe, you're getting an inspected by dogs, and you know everything's gone through. So it just takes a while, I think, to, to change that culture, um, be it stewardship or biosecurity. And you don't want to fail Bill's test. <laughs> <laughs> I did, I did, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I watched somebody get, uh, get an F on that and I, I was really nervous. <laughs> it's true. Botanists should, botanists should know better. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> um, related to that, are there any recent or potential future non-native animal introductions that island managers are worried about? Um, I'm always worried about stuff coming out to the island. That, that's just a, an ever-present worry, especially when you've inherited an island that doesn't have cats and no rats um, and no house mice. And that's why we participate in the biosecurity working group and we have biosecurity uh, technicians look at all the cargo that goes out and they find stuff sometimes before it goes out to the island. And in a bad situation, you might find something after it gets to the island, but uh, uh, we're, we're monitoring, we're watching. And uh, yeah, it's, it's an uh, ever-present work. I would agree with that also, particularly on Catalina, where there's a public ferry that goes back and forth multiple times a day and there's really no biosecurity there. It's a, a constant concern and, and uh, you need to really think about what might come out. Raccoons have come out on the boat, things like that. Um, another example is you never quite know what people have for pets. I've been on the beach on Santa Cruz Island and found somebody walking their iguana on the beach, on a leash, because it needed to get off the boat. <laughs> and it's like, you just never know. So. So it's a constant threat, as, as Bill said. You never know that as long as there's going to be access in and out, there's going to be that threat. Yeah, Thanks. and we at the at the Channel Islands National Park, we have boats and visitors, you know, going in and out. And there are some attempts, um, you know, at biosecurity, but it, it really it, it should be more because the consequences are so great. And, and we know that we had um, a cat on Santa Rosa Island. Um, it was apparently brought in by contractors that were doing some work on um, re rehabbing a historic building. 
And amazingly, that cat was at the entry point to the island where a lot of people were coming and going. And it was apparently there for at least six months before someone detected that it was there. So um, these, um, it's, it's, it's very hard to find these animals once they're on the island. By the, by the time something gets there, you probably are not going to catch it until the population has multiplied and spread. So it really is critical that the, the, the biosecurity actions, like, like what Bill's doing, is taking place when you're on the mainland before anything gets on the boat and heads out to the island. And the other thing that happens is shipwrecks and, or, or boat groundings. And um, what we need to do in those cases is, is have as rapid a response as possible so that we can get on those ships and, and set traps and do inspections and um, determine whether anything might have been on that boat. And then if, if that happens, then you actually have to then start to work on the, the nearby beaches and start you know, look, actually actively searching and probably putting out um, like infrared cameras to try and detect something new. Yeah, for us it's the, for us it's the, the same. Same species. I mean, uh, for Guadalupe, we're very afraid of rats. That's why have, we have this cat, uh, this dog that detects rodents. And it, it, it happens. I mean, we uh, saw the, uh, well, uh, documented the arrival of a rat to a Natividad Island a few, few years ago, which took months to, to capture it, even though we were watching it, eating the, the bait and the camera traps. It just took forever to to capture it, so it, it happens. And to Guadalupe goes a Navy ship once a, once a month, and they're very careful. But still, you can never have enough enough precautions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, so we only uh, we're, we're pretty much out of time. Um, the last question I wanted to to pose, and I'll just answer it myself really quickly, is what can nature enthusiasts who aren't professionals do to help protect and restore the Channel Islands? Um, you can volunteer, you can get involved, help with restoration. You can visit and spread the love in the word but not the weeds or the other critters. Um, you can vote. Uh, you know, I think we saw today that um, you know, these environmental laws are working. Uh, it's what's kept this work going. Um, so let's make sure that they aren't voted down. Um, you can advocate for other people to vote, tell a friend, share a story. Anyone want to add anything? Uh, donate funding. Donate. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. How could I not have said donate money? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Take photo vouchers. Use iNaturalist. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, help us understand the biodiversity better. It works. Thank you all so much for being here today. It's been a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Drive safe, uh, check out our website. There's gonna be some field trips upcoming to the garden, uh, to, I'm sorry, to the islands. Um, I'm starting a class, a 10-week course next week. Uh